Chapter 66 through 70 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 66 through 70. Chapter 66. It happened one day, close on the hours of Vespers, that I had to go at an unusual time for me, from my house to my workshop, for I ought to say that the latter was in the Banqui, while I lived behind the Banqui, and went rarely to the shop. All my business there I left in the hands of my partner, Felice. Having stayed a short while in the workshop, I remembered that I had to say something to Alessandro del Bene. So I arose, and when I reached the Banqui, I met a man called Ser Benedetto, who was a great friend of mine. He was a notary, born in Florence, son of a blind man who said prayers about the streets for alms, and a Sienese by race. This Ser Benedetto had been very many years at Naples. Afterwards he had settled in Rome, where he transacted business for some Sienese merchants of the Kigi. My partner had over and over again asked him for some monies, which were due for certain little rings confided to Ser Benedetto. That very day, meeting him in the Banqui, he demanded his money, rather roughly as his want was. Benedetto was walking with his masters, and they, annoyed by the interruption, scolded him sharply, saying they would be served by somebody else in order not to have to listen to such barking. Ser Benedetto did the best he could to excuse himself, swore that he had paid the goldsmith, and said he had no power to curb the rage of madmen. The Sienese took his words ill and dismissed him on the spot. Leaving them, he ran like an arrow to my shop, probably to take revenge upon Felice. It chanced that just in the middle of the street we met. I, who had heard nothing of the matter, greeted him most kindly, according to my custom, to which courtesy he replied with insults. Then what the sorcerer had said flashed all at once upon my mind, and bridling myself as well as I was able in the way he bade me, I answered, Good brother Benedetto, don't fly into a rage with me, for I have done you no harm, nor do I know anything about these affairs of yours. Please go and finish what you have to do with Felice. He is quite capable of giving you a proper answer, but inasmuch as I know nothing about it, you are wrong to abuse me in this way, especially as you are well aware that I am not the man to put up with insults. He retorted that I knew everything, and that he was the man to make me bear a heavier load than that, and that Felice and I were two great rascals. By this time a crowd had gathered round to hear the quarrel. Provoked by his ugly words, I stooped and took up a lump of mud, for it had rained, and hurled it with a quick and unpremeditated movement at his face. He ducked his head so that the mud hit him in the middle of the skull. There was a stone in it with several sharp angles, one of which striking him he fell stunned like a dead man, whereupon all the bystanders, seeing the great quantity of blood, judged that he was really dead. Chapter 67 While he was lying on the ground and people were preparing to carry him away, Pompeo, the jeweler, passed by. The Pope had sent for him to give orders about some jewels. Seeing the fellow in such a miserable plight, he asked who had struck him, on which they told him Benvenuto did it, but the stupid creature brought it down upon himself. No sooner had Pompeo reached the Pope than he began to speak. Most blessed father, Benvenuto has this very moment murdered Tobia. I saw it with my own eyes. On this the Pope in a fury ordered the governor, who was in the presence, to take and hang me at once in the place where the homicide had been committed, adding that he must do all he could to catch me, 
and not appear again before him until he had hanged me. When I saw the unfortunate Benedetto stretched upon the ground, I thought at once of the peril I was in, considering the power of my enemies, and what might ensue from this disaster. Making off, I took refuge in the house of Messer Giovanni Gabi, clerk of the Camera, with the intention of preparing as soon as possible to escape from Rome. He, however, advised me not to be in such a hurry, for it might turn out, perhaps, that the evil was not so great as I imagined, and, calling Monsieur Anibal Caro, who lived with him, bade him go for information. While these arrangements were being made, a Roman gentleman appeared, who belonged to the household of Cardinal de' Medici, and had been sent by him. Taking Monsieur Giovanni and me apart, he told us that the cardinal had reported to him what the pope said, and that there was no way of helping me out of the scrape. It would be best for me to shun the first fury of the storm by flight, and not to risk myself in any house in Rome. Upon this gentleman's departure, Messer Giovanni looked me in the face as though he were about to cry, and said, Ah, me! Ah, woe is me! There is nothing I can do to aid you. I replied, By God's means I shall aid myself alone, only I request you put one of your horses at my disposition. They had already saddled a black Turkish horse, the finest and the best in Rome. I mounted with an arquebus upon the saddle-bow, wound up in readiness to fire, if need were. When I reached Ponte Sisto, I found the whole of the Bargello's guard there, both horse and foot. So making a virtue of necessity, I put my horse boldly to a sharp trot, and, with God's grace, being somehow unperceived by them, passed freely through. Then, with all the speed I could, I took the road to Palombara, a fief of my lord Giovan Battista Savello, whence I sent the horse back to Monsieur Giovanni, without, however, thinking it well to inform him where I was. Lord Giovan Battista, after very kindly entertaining me two days, advised me to remove and go toward Naples till the storm blew over. So, providing me with company, he set me on the way to Naples. While traveling, I met a sculptor of my acquaintance who was going to San Germano to finish the tomb of Piero de' Medici at Monte Cassino. His name was Solos Meo, and he gave me the news that on the very evening of the fray, Pope Clement sent one of his chamberlains to inquire how Tobia was getting on. Finding him at work unharmed and without even knowing anything about the matter, the messenger went back and told the Pope, who turned round to Pompeo and said, You are a good-for-nothing rascal, but I promise you well that you have stirred a snake up which will sting you and serve you right. Then he addressed himself to Cardinal de' Medici and commissioned him to look after me adding that he should be very sorry to let me slip through his fingers. And so Salosmeo and I went on our way, singing towards Monte Cassino, intending to pursue our journey thence in company towards Naples. Chapter 68 When Salosmeo had inspected his affairs at Monte Cassino, we resumed our journey, and having come within a mile of Naples, we were met by an innkeeper who invited us to his house and said he had been at Florence many years with Carlo Genori, adding that if we put up at his inn he would treat us most kindly, for the reason that we both were Florentines. We told him frequently that we did not want to go to him. However, he kept passing, sometimes in front and sometimes behind, perpetually repeating that he would have a stop at his hostelry. When this began to bore me, I asked if he could tell me anything about a certain Sicilian woman called Beatrice, who had a beautiful daughter named Angelica, and both were courtesans. Taking it into his head that I was jeering him, he cried out, God send mischief to all courtesans, and such as favor them. Then he set spurs to his horse, and made off as though he was resolved to leave us. I felt some pleasure at having rid myself in so fair a manner of that ass of an innkeeper, and yet I was rather the loser than the gainer, for the great love I bore Angelica had come back to my mind, and while I was conversing, not without some lover's sighs upon this subject with Salos Meo, we saw the man returning to us at a gallop. When he drew up, he said, 
two or perhaps three days ago a woman and a girl came back to a house in my neighborhood. They had the names you mentioned, but whether they are Sicilians I cannot say. I answered, such power over me has that name of Angelica that I am now determined to put up at your inn. We rode on all together with mine host into the town of Naples and descended at his house. Minutes seemed years to me till I had put my things in order, which I did in the twinkling of an eye. Then I went to the house which was not far from our inn and found there my Angelica, who greeted me with infinite demonstrations of the most unbounded passion. I stayed with her from evenfall until the following morning, and enjoyed such pleasure as I never had before or since. But while drinking deep of this delight, it occurred to my mind how exactly on that day the month expired, which had been prophesied within the necromantic circle by the devils. So then, let every man who enters into relation with those spirits weigh well the inestimable perils I have passed through. Chapter 69 I happened to have in my purse a diamond, which I showed about among the goldsmiths, and though I was but young, my reputation as an able artist was so well known, even at Naples, that they welcomed me most warmly. Among others I made acquaintance with a most excellent companion, a jeweler, Messer Domenico Fontana by name. This worthy man left his shop for the three days that I spent in Naples, nor even quitted my company, but showed me many admirable monuments of antiquity in the city and its neighborhood. Moreover, he took me to pay my respects to the viceroy of Naples, who had let him know that he should like to see me. When I presented myself to His Excellency, he received me with much honor, and while we were exchanging compliments, the diamond, which I have mentioned, caught his eye. He made me show it him, and prayed me, if I parted with it, to give him the refusal. Having taken back the stone, I offered it again to His Excellency adding that the diamond and I were at his service. Then he said that the diamond pleased him well, but that he should be much better pleased if I were to stay with him. He would make such terms with me as would cause me to feel satisfied. We spoke many words of courtesy on both sides, and then, coming to the merits of the diamond, His Excellency bade me without hesitation name the price at which I valued it. Accordingly, I said that it was worth exactly two hundred crowns. He rejoined that in his opinion I had not overvalued it, but that since I had said it, and he knew me for the first artist in the world, it would not make the same effect when mounted by another hand. To this I said that I had not set the stone, and that it was not well set. Its brilliancy was due to its own excellence and that if I were to mount it afresh, I could make it show far better than it did. Then I put my thumbnail to the angles of its facets, took it from the ring, cleaned it up a little, and handed it to the viceroy. Delighted and astonished, he wrote me out a check for the two hundred crowns I had demanded. When I returned to my lodging, I found letters from the Cardinal de' Medici, in which he told me to come back post-haste to Rome, and to dismount without delay at the palace of his most reverend lordship. I read the letter to my Angelica, who begged me, with tears of affection, either to remain in Naples or to take her with me. I replied that if she was disposed to come with me, I would give up to her keeping the two hundred ducats I had received from the viceroy. Her mother, perceiving us in this close conversation, drew nigh and said, Benvenuto, if you want to take my daughter to Rome, leave me a sum of fifteen ducats to pay for my lying in, and then I will travel after you. I told the old harridan that I would very gladly leave her thirty if she would give me my Angelica. We made the bargain, and Angelica entreated me to buy her a gown of black velvet, because the stuff was cheap at Naples. I consented to everything, sent for the velvet, settled its price and paid for it. Then the old woman, who thought me over head and ears in love, begged for a gown of fine cloth for herself, as well as other outlays for her sons, and a good bit more money than I had offered. I turned to her with a pleasant air and said, 
"'My dear Beatrice, are you satisfied with what I offered?' She answered that she was not. Thereupon I said that what was not enough for her would be quite enough for me, and having kissed Angelica we parted, she with tears and I with laughter, and off at once I set for Rome. CHAPTER SEVENTY I left Naples by night with my money in my pocket, and this I did to prevent being set upon or murdered, as is the way there. But when I came to Celciata, I had to defend myself with great address and bodily prowess from several horsemen who came out to assassinate me. During the following days, after leaving Solos Meo at his work at Monte Cassino, I came one morning to breakfast at the inn of Adagnani, and when I was near the house I shot some birds with my arquebus. An iron spike which was in the lock of my musket tore my right hand. Though the wound was not of any consequence, it seemed to be so, because it bled abundantly. Going into the inn I put my horse up and ascended to a large gallery, where I found a party of Neapolitan gentlemen just upon the point of sitting down to table. They had with them a young woman of quality, the loveliest I ever saw. At the moment when I entered the room I was followed by a very brave young serving man of mine holding a big partisan in his hand. The sight of us, our arms and the blood, inspired those poor gentlemen with such terror, particularly as the place was known to be a nest of murderers, that they rose from table and called on God in a panic to protect them. I began to laugh and said that God had protected them already, for that I was a man to defend them against whoever tried to do them harm. Then I asked them for something to bind up my wounded hand, and the charming lady took out a handkerchief richly embroidered with gold, wishing to make a bandage with it. I refused, but she tore the piece in half and in the gentlest manner wrapped my hand up with her fingers. The company, thus having regained confidence, we dined together very gaily, and when the meal was over we all mounted and went off together. The gentlemen, however, were not as yet quite at their ease, so they left me in their cunning to entertain the lady, while they kept at a short distance behind. I rode at her side upon a pretty little horse of mine, making signs to my servant that he should keep somewhat apart, which gave us the opportunity of discussing things that are not sold by the apothecary. In this way I journeyed to Rome with the greatest enjoyment I have ever had. When I got to Rome I dismounted at the palace of Cardinal de' Medici, and having obtained an audience of his most reverend lordship, paid my respects and thanked him warmly for my recall. I then entreated him to secure me from imprisonment, and even from a fine if that were possible. The cardinal was very glad to see me, told me to stand in no fear, then turned to one of his gentlemen, called Monsieur Pier Antonio Pecci of Siena, ordering him to tell the Bargello not to touch me. He then asked him how the man was going on whose head I had broken with a stone. Monsieur Pier Antonio replied that he was very ill, and that he would probably be even worse for when he heard that I was coming back to Rome, he swore he would die to serve me an ill turn. When the cardinal heard that, he burst into a fit of laughter and cried, The fellow could not have taken a better way than this to make us know that he was born a Sienese. After that he turned to me and said, For our reputation and your own, refrain these four or five days from going about in the banchi. After that, go where you like, and let fools die at their own pleasure. I went home and set myself to finishing the medal which I had begun, with the head of Pope Clement and a figure of peace on the reverse. The figure was a slender woman dressed in very thin drapery, gathered at the waist, with a little torch in her hand, which was burning a heap of arms bound together like a trophy. In the background I had shown part of a temple, where was discord chained with a load of fetters. Round about it ran a legend in these words, Claudentur Belli Portae. During the time I was finishing this medal, the man whom I had wounded recovered, and the Pope kept incessantly asking for me. I, however, avoided visiting Cardinal de' Medici, 
for whenever I showed my face before him, his lordship gave me some commission of importance which hindered me from working at my medal to the end. Consequently, Monsieur Pierre Carnesecchi, who was a great favorite of the Pope's, undertook to keep me in sight, and let me adroitly understand how much the Pope desired my services. I told him that in a few days I would prove to His Holiness that his service had never been neglected by me. End of chapters 66 through 70「Chapters seventy one through seventy five of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume One. Translated by John Addington Simons. Chapters seventy one through seventy five. Seventy one. Not many days had passed before, my medal being finished, I stamped it in gold, silver, and copper. After I had shown it to Messer Pietro, he immediately introduced me to the Pope. It was on a day in April, after dinner, and the weather very fine. The Pope was in the Belvedere. After entering the presence, I put my medals together with the dies of steel into his hand. He took them, and recognizing at once their mastery of art, looked at Messer Pietro in the face and said, the ancients never had such medals made for them as these. While he and the others were inspecting them, taking up now the dies and now the medals in their hands, I began to speak as submissively as I was able. If a greater power had not controlled the working of my inauspicious stars, and hindered that with which they violently menaced me, your holiness, without your fault or mine, would have lost a faithful and loving servant." It must, most blessed Father, be allowed that in those cases where men are risking all upon one throw, it is not wrong to do as certain poor and simple men are wont to say, who tell us we must mark seven times and cut once. Your Holiness will remember how the malicious and lying tongue of my bitter enemy so easily aroused your anger, that you ordered the governor to have me taken on the spot and hanged, but I have no doubt that when you had become aware of the irreparable act by which you would have wronged yourself, in cutting off from your servant, such as even now your holiness hath saith he is, I am sure, I repeat, that before God and the world you would have felt no trifling twinges of remorse. Excellent and virtuous fathers, and masters of like quality, ought not to let their arm in wrath descend upon their sons and servants with such inconsiderate haste, seeing that subsequent repentance will avail them nothing. But now that God has overruled the malign influences of the stars and saved me from your holiness, I humbly beg you another time not to let yourself so easily be stirred to rage against me. The Pope had stopped from looking at the medals, and was now listening attentively to what I said. There were many noblemen of the greatest consequence present, which made him blush a little, as it were for shame, and not knowing how else to extricate himself from this entanglement, he said he could not remember having given such an order. I changed the conversation in order to cover his embarrassment. His Holiness then began to speak again about the medals, and asked what method I had used to stamp them so marvellously, large as they were, for he had never met with ancient pieces of that size. We talked a little on this subject, but being not quite easy that I might not begin another lecture sharper than the last, he praised my medals, and said that they gave him the greatest satisfaction, but that he should like another reverse made according to a fancy of his own, if it were possible to stamp them with two different patterns. I said that it was possible to do so. Then His Holiness commissioned me to design the history of Moses when he strikes the rock and water issues from it, with this motto, Ut bibat populus. At last he added, Go, Benvenuto, you will not have finished it before I have provided for your fortune. After I had taken leave, the Pope proclaimed before the whole company that he would give me enough to live on wealthily, without the need of laboring for any one but him so I devoted myself entirely to working out this reverse with the Moses on it. 72. In the meantime the Pope was taken ill, and his physicians thought the case was dangerous. Accordingly my enemy began to be afraid of me, and engaged some Neapolitan soldiers to do to me what he was dreading I might do to him. I had therefore much trouble to defend my poor life. In course of time, however, I completed the reverse, and when I took it to the Pope, I found him in bed in a most deplorable condition. Nevertheless, he received me with the greatest kindness, and wished to inspect the medals and the dies. He sent for spectacles and lights, but was unable to see anything clearly. 
Then he began to fumble with his fingers at them, and having felt them a short while, he fetched a deep sigh, and said to his attendants that he was much concerned about me, but that if God gave him back his health he would make it all right. Three days afterwards the Pope died, and I was left with all my labor lost. Yet I plucked up courage, and told myself that these medals had won me so much celebrity that any Pope who was elected would give me work to do, and peradventure bring me better fortune. Thus I encouraged to put heart into myself, and buried in oblivion all the injuries which Pompeo had done me. Then, putting on my arms and girding my sword, I went to San Piero, and kissed the foot of the dead Pope, not without shedding tears. Afterwards I returned to the Banchi to look at the great commotion which always happens on such occasions. While I was sitting on the street with several of my friends, Pompeo went by, attended by ten men very well armed, and when he came just opposite he stopped, as though about to pick a quarrel with myself. My companions, brave and adventurous young men, made signs to me to draw my sword, but it flashed through my mind that if I drew, some terrible mischief might result for persons who were wholly innocent. Therefore I considered that it would be better if I put my life to risk alone. When Pompeo had stood there time enough to say two Ave Marias, he laughed derisively in my direction, and going off, his fellows also laughed and wagged their heads, with many other insolent gestures. My companions wanted to begin the fray at once, but I told them hotly that I was quite able to conduct my quarrels to an end by myself, and that I had no need of stouter fighters than I was, so that each of them might mind his business. My friends were angry and went off muttering. Now there was among them my dearest comrade, named Albertaccio del Bene, own brother to Alessandro and Albizo, who is now a very rich man in Lyon. He was the most redoubtable young man I ever knew, and the most high-spirited, and loved me like himself, and insomuch as he was well aware that my forbearance had not been inspired by want of courage, but by the most daring bravery, for he knew me down to the bottom of my nature, he took my words up and begged me to favor him, so far as to associate him with myself in all I meant to do. I replied, Dear Abotaccio, dearest to me above all men that live, the time will very likely come when you shall give me aid. But in this case, if you love me, do not attend to me, but look to your own business and go at once, like our other friends, for now there is no time to lose. These words were spoken in one breath. 73. In the meanwhile my enemies had proceeded slowly down towards Chiavica, as the place was called, and had arrived at the crossing of several roads, going in different directions, but the street in which Pompeo's house stood was the one which leads straight to the Campo del Fiore. Some business or other made him enter the apothecary's shop which stood at the corner of Chiavica, and there he stayed a while transacting it. I had just been told that he had boasted of the insult which he fancied he had put upon me, but be that as it may, it was to his misfortune, for precisely when I came up to the corner he was leaving the shop, and his bravi had opened their ranks and received him in their midst. I drew a little dagger with a sharpened edge, and breaking the line of his defenders, laid my hands upon his breast so quickly and coolly that none of them were able to prevent me. Then I aimed to strike him in the face, but fright made him turn his head round. I stabbed him just beneath the ear. I gave only two blows, for he fell stone dead at the second. I had not meant to kill him, but as the saying goes, knocks are not dealt by measure. With my left hand I plucked back the dagger, and with my right hand drew my sword to defend my life. However, all those bravi ran up to the corpse and took no action against me, so I went back alone through Stata Julia, considering how best to put myself in safety. I had walked about three hundred paces, when Piloto the goldsmith, my very good friend, came up and said, Brother, now that the mischief's done, we must see to saving you. I replied, Let us go to Albertaccio del Bene's house. It is only a few minutes since I told him I should soon have need of him. When we arrived there, Albertaccio and I embraced with measureless affection, and soon the whole flower of the young men of the Banchi, of all nations except the Milanese, came crowding in, and each and all made proffer of their own life to save mine. Messer Luigi Raccole also sent with marvellous promptitude and courtesy to put his services at my disposal, as did many other great folk of his station for they all agreed in blessing my hands, judging that Pompeo had done me too great and unforgivable an injury, and marvelling that I had put up with him so long. 74. Cardinal Cornaro, on hearing of the affair, dispatched thirty soldiers with as many partisans, spikes, and arquebuses, to bring me with all due respect to his quarters. This he did unasked, whereupon I accepted the invitation, and went off with them, while more than as many of the young men bore me company. 
Meanwhile, Messer Triano, Pompeo's relative and first chamberlain to the Pope, sent a Milanese of high rank to Cardinal de' Medici, giving him news of the great crime I had committed, and calling on his most reverend lordship to chastise me. The cardinal retorted on the spot, His crime would indeed have been great if he had not committed this lesser one. Thank Messer Triano for me for giving me this information of a fact which I had not heard before. Then he turned and in presence of the nobleman said to the bishop of Frulli, his gentleman and intimate acquaintance, Search diligently after my friend Benvenuto. I want to help and defend him, and whoso acts against thyself acts against myself. The Milanese nobleman went back, much disconcerted, while the bishop of Frulli came to visit me at Cardinal Cornaro's place. Presenting himself to the cardinal, he related how Cardinal de' Medici had sent for Benvenuto, and wanted to be his protector. Now Cardinal Cornaro, who had the touchy temper of a bear, flew into a rage, and told the bishop he was quite as well able to defend me as Cardinal de' Medici. The bishop, in reply, entreated to be allowed to speak with me on some matters of his patron which had nothing to do with the affair. Cornaro bade him, for that day, to make as though he had already talked to me. Cardinal de' Medici was very angry. However, I went the following night, without Cornaro's knowledge, and under a good escort, to pay him my respects. Then I begged him to grant me the favour of leaving me where I was, and told him of the great courtesy which Cornaro had shown me, adding that if his most reverend lordship suffered me to stay, I should gain one friend the more in my hour of need, otherwise his lordship might dispose of me exactly as he thought best. He told me to do as I liked, so I returned to Cornaro's palace, and a few days afterwards the Cardinal Fernese was elected Pope. After he had put affairs of greater consequence in order, the new Pope sent for me, saying that he did not wish any one else to strike his coins. To these words of His Holiness a gentleman very privately acquainted with him, named Messer Latino Juvenal, made answer that I was in hiding for a murder committed on the person of one Pompeo of Milan, and set forth what could be argued for my justification in the most favourable terms. The Pope replied, I knew nothing of Pompeo's death, but plenty of Benvenuto's provocation, so let a safe conduct be at once made out for him, in order that he may be placed in perfect security. A great friend of Pompeo's, who was also intimate with the Pope, happened to be there. He was a Milanese, called Messer Ambroglio. This man said, In the first days of your papacy it were not well to grant pardons of this kind. The Pope turned to him and answered, You know less about such matters than I do. Know, then, that men like Benvenuto, unique in their profession, stand above the law, and how far more he, then, who received the provocation I have heard of. When my safe conduct had been drawn out, I began at once to serve him, and was treated with the utmost favor. 75. Messer Latino Juvenal came to call on me, and gave me orders to strike the coins of the Pope. This roused up all my enemies, who began to look about how they should hinder me. But the Pope, perceiving their drift, scolded them, and insisted that I should go on working. I took the dies in hand, designing a S. Paul, surrounded with this inscription, Vas Elecciones. This piece of money gave far more satisfaction than the models of my competitors, so that the Pope forbade any one else to speak to him of coins, since he wished me only to have to do with them. This encouraged me to apply myself with untroubled spirit to the task, and Messer Latino Juvenal, who had received such orders from the Pope, used to introduce me to His Holiness. I had it much at heart to recover the post of stamper to the mint, but on this point the Pope took advice, and then told me I must first obtain a pardon for the homicide, and this I should get at the Holy Mary's Day in August, through the Caporioni of Rome. I must say that it is usual every year on this solemn festival to grant the freedom of twelve outlaws to these officers. Meanwhile he promised to give me another safe conduct, which should keep me in security until that time. When my enemies perceived that they were quite unable to devise the means of keeping me out of the mint, they resorted to another expedient. The deceased Pompeo had left three thousand ducats as dowry to an illegitimate daughter of his, and they contrived that a certain favourite of Signor Pierre Luigi, the Pope's son, should ask her hand in marriage through the medium of his master. Accordingly the match came off, but this fellow was an insignificant country lad, who had been brought up by his lordship, and as folks said, he got but little of the money, since his lordship laid his hands on it, and had the mind to use it. Now the husband of the girl, to please his wife, begged the prince to have me taken up, and he promised to do so when the first flush of my favour with the Pope had passed away. Things stood so about two months, the servant always suing for his wife's dower, the master putting him off with pretexts, but assuring the woman that he would certainly revenge her father's murder. 
I obtained an inkling of these designs, yet I did not omit to present myself pretty frequently to his lordship, who made show of treating me with great distinction. He had, however, decided to do one or other of two things, to have me assassinated, or to have me taken up by the Bargello. Accordingly he commissioned a certain little devil of a Corsican soldier in his service to do the trick as cleverly as he could, and my other enemies, with Messer Traiano at the head of them, promised the fellow a reward of one hundred crowns. He assured them that the job would be as easy as sucking a fresh egg. Seeing into their plot, I went about with my eyes open, and with good attendance, wearing an undercoat and armlets of mail, for which I had obtained permission. The Corsican, influenced by avarice, hoped to gain a whole sum of money without risk, and imagined himself capable of carrying the matter through alone. Consequently, one day after dinner, he had me sent for in the name of Signor Pierre Luigi. I went off at once, because his lordship had spoken of wanting to order several big silver vases. Leaving my home in a hurry, armed, however, as usual, I walked rapidly through Strada Giulia toward the Palazzo Farnese, not expecting to meet anybody at that hour of the day. I had reached the end of the street and was making toward the palace, when, my habit being always to turn the corners wide, I observed the Corsican get up and take his station in the middle of the road. Being prepared, I was not in the least disconcerted, but kept upon my guard, and, slackening pace a little, drew nearer toward the wall, in order to give the fellow a wide berth. He, on his side, came closer to the wall, and when we were now within a short distance of each other, I perceived by his gestures that he had it in his mind to do me mischief, and, seeing me alone thus, thought he should succeed. Accordingly, I began to speak, and said, Brave soldier, if it had been night, you might have said you had mistaken me but since it is full day you know well enough who I am. I never had anything to do with you, and never injured you, but should be well disposed to do you service. He replied in a high-spirited way, without, however, making room for me to pass, that he did not know what I was saying. Then I answered, I know very well indeed what you want and what you are saying, but the job which you have taken in hand is more dangerous and difficult than you imagine, and may peradventure turn out the wrong way for you. Remember that you have to do with a man who would defend himself against a hundred, and the adventure you are on is not esteemed by men of courage like yourself. Meanwhile, I also was looking black as thunder, and each of us had changed color. Folk, too, gathered round us, for it had become clear that our words meant swords and daggers. He then, not having the spirit to lay hands on me, cried out, We shall meet another time. I answered, I am always glad to meet honest men, and those who show themselves as such. When we parted, I went to his lordship's palace, and found that he had not sent for me. When I returned to my shop, the Corsican informed me, through an intimate friend of his and mine, that I need not be on my guard against him, since he wished to be my good brother, but that I ought to be much on my guard against others, seeing I was in the greatest peril, for folk of much consequence had sworn to have my life. I sent to thank him, and kept the best lookout I could. Not many days after, a friend of mine informed me that Signor Pierre Luigi had given strict orders that I should be taken that very evening. They told me this at twenty, whereupon I spoke with some of my friends, who advised me to be off at once. The order had been given for one hour after sunset. Accordingly, at twenty-three I left the post for Florence. It seems that when the Corsican showed that he had not pluck enough to do the business as he promised, Signor Pierre Luigi on his own authority gave orders to have me taken, merely to stop the mouth of Pompeo's daughter who was always clamoring to know where her dower had gone to. When he was unable to gratify her in this matter of revenge on either of the two plans he had formed, he bethought him of another, which shall be related in its proper place. End of chapter 71 through 75all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simons, Chapters 76 through 80. 76. I reached Florence in due course, and paid my respects to the Duke Alessandro, who greeted me with extraordinary kindness and pressed me to remain in his service. There was then at Florence a sculptor called Il Triblino, and we were gossips, for I had stood godfather to his son. In course of conversation he told me that a certain Giacopo del San Sovino, his first master, had sent for him, and whereas he had never seen Venice, and because of the gains he expected, he was very glad to go there. On his asking me if I had ever been at Venice, I said no, 
This made him invite me to accompany him, and I agreed. So then I told Duke Alessandro that I wanted first to go to Venice, and that afterwards I would return to serve him. He exacted a formal promise to this effect, and bade me present myself before I left the city. Next day, having made my preparations, I went to take leave of the Duke, whom I found in the palace of the Pazzi, at that time inhabited by the wife and daughters of Signor Lorenzo Cibo. Having sent word to His Excellency that I wished to set off for Venice with his good leave, Signor Casomino de' Medici, now Duke of Florence, returned with the answer that I must go to Niccolo de Montaguto, who would give me fifty golden crowns, which His Excellency bestowed on me in sign of his good will, and afterwards I must return to serve him. I got the money from Niccolo, and then went to fetch Tribolo, whom I found ready to start, and he asked me whether I had bound my sword. I answered that a man on horseback about to take a journey ought not to bind his sword. He said that the custom was so in Florence, since a certain Sir Maurizio then held office, who was capable of putting St. John the Baptist to the rack for any trifling peccadillo. Accordingly, one had to carry one's sword bound till the gates were passed. I laughed at this, and so we set off, joining the courier to Venice, who was nicknamed Il Lamentone. In his company we travelled through Bologna, and arrived one evening at Ferrara. There we halted at the inn of the piazza, which Lamentoni went in search of some Florentine exiles, to take them letters and messages from their wives. The duke had given orders that only the courier might talk to them, and no one else, under penalty of incurring the same banishment as they had. Meanwhile, since it was a little past the hour of twenty-two, Tribolo and I went to see the Duke of Ferrara come back from Belfiore, where he had been at a jousting match. There we met a number of exiles, who stared at us as though they wished to make us speak with them. Tribolo, who was the most timorous man that I have ever known, kept on saying, Do not look at them, or talk to them, if you care to go back to Florence. So we stayed, and saw the Duke return. Afterwards, when we regained our inn, we found Lamentone there. After nightfall there appeared Niccolo Benintendi, and his brother Piero, and another old man, whom I believed to have been Jacopo Nardi, together with some young fellows, who began immediately to ask the courier news, each man of his own family in Florence. Tribolo and I kept at a distance, in order to avoid speaking with them. After they had talked a while with Lamentone, Niccolo Benintendi said, I know those two men there very well. What's the reason they give themselves such beastly airs, and will not talk to us? Tribolo kept begging me to hold my tongue, while Lamentone told them that we had not the same permission as he had. Benintendi retorted that it was idiotic nonsense, adding, Pox take them, and other pretty flowers of speech. Then I raised my head as gently as I could, and said, Dear gentlemen, you are able to do us serious injury, while we cannot render you any assistance, and though you have flung words at us, which we are far from deserving, we do not mean on that account to get into a rage with you. Thereupon old Nardi said that I had spoken like a worthy young man, as I was. But Niccolo Benintendi shouted, I would snap my fingers at them and the duke. I replied that he was in the wrong toward us, since we had nothing to do with him or his affairs. Old Nardi took our part, telling Benintendi, plainly, that he was in the wrong, which made him go on muttering insults. On this I bade him know that I could say and do things to him which he would not like, and therefore he had better mind his business and let us alone. Once more he cried out that he snapped his fingers at the duke and us, and that we are all of us a heap of donkeys. I replied by giving him the lie direct and drawing my sword. The old man, wanting to be first upon the staircase, tumbled down some steps, and all the rest of them came huddling after him. I rushed onward, brandishing my sword along the walls with fury, shouting, I will kill you all! But I took good care not to do them any harm, as I might too easily have done. In the midst of this tumult the innkeeper screamed out. Lamentoni cried, For God's sake, hold! Some of them exclaimed, Oh, me, my head! Others, let me get out from here. In short, it was an indescribable confusion. They looked like a herd of swine. Then the host came in with a light, while I withdrew upstairs to put my sword back in its scabbard. Lamentoni told Niccolo Benintendi that he had behaved very ill. The host said to him, It is as much as one's life is worth to draw swords here, and if the duke were to know of your brawling, he would have you hanged. I will not do to you what you deserve, but take care you never show yourself again at my inn, or it will be the worse for you. Our host then came up to me, and when I began to make him my excuses, he would not suffer me to say a word, but told me that he knew I was entirely in the right, and bade me to be upon my guard against those men upon my journey. 77. 
After we had supped, a bargeman appeared, and offered to take us to Venice. I asked if he would let us have the boat to ourselves. He was willing, and so we made our bargain. In the morning we rose early and mounted our horses for the port, which is a few miles distant from Ferrara. On arriving there we found Niccolo Benintendi's brother, with three comrades waiting for me. They had among them two lances, and I had bought a stout pike in Ferrara. Being very well armed to boot, I was not at all frightened, as Tribolo was, who cried, God help us! Those fellows are waiting here to murder us. Lamentoni turned to me and said, The best that you can do is to go back to Ferrara, for I see that the affair is likely to be ugly. For heaven's sake, Benvenuto, do not risk the fury of these mad beasts. To which I replied, Let us go forward, for God helps those who have the right on their side, and you shall see how I will help myself. Is not this boat engaged for us? Yes, said Lamentone. Then we will stay in it without them, unless my manhood has deserted me. I put spurs to my horse, and when I was within fifty paces, dismounted and marched boldly forward with my pike. Tribolo stopped behind, all huddled up upon his horse, looking the very image of frost. Lamentone, the courier, meanwhile, was swelling and snorting like the wind. That was his usual habit, but now he did so more than he was wont, being in doubt how this devilish affair would terminate. When I reached the boat, the master presented himself, and said that those Florentine gentlemen wanted to embark in it with us, if I was willing. I answered, The boat is engaged for us and no one else, and it grieves me to the heart that I am not able to have their company. At these words a brave young man of the Magalotti family spoke out, Benvenuto, we will make you able to have it. To which I answered, If God and my good cause, together with my own strength of body and mind, possess the will and the power, you shall not make me able to have what you say. So saying, I leapt into the boat, and turning my pike's point against them, added, I'll show you with this weapon that I am not able. Wishing to prove he was in earnest, Magalotti then seized his own and came toward me. I sprang upon the gunwale, and hit him such a blow that, if he had not tumbled backward, I must have pierced his body. His comrades, in lieu of helping him, turned to fly, and when I saw that I could kill him, instead of striking, I said, Get up, brother, take your arms and go away. I have shown you that I cannot do what I do not want, and what I had the power to do I have not chosen to do. Then I called for Tribolo, the boatman, and Lamentoni to embark, and so we got under way for Venice. When we had gone ten miles on the Po, we sighted those young men, who had got into a skiff and caught us up, and when they were alongside, that idiot Piero Benintendi sang out to me, Go thy ways this time, Benvenuto, we shall meet in Venice. Set out betimes, then, I shouted, for I am coming, and any man can meet me where he lists. In due course we arrived at Venice, when I applied to a brother of Cardinal Cornaro, begging him to procure for me the favor of being allowed to carry arms. He advised me to do so without hesitation, saying that the worst risk I ran was that I might lose my sword. 78. Accordingly I girded on my sword, and went to visit Jacopo del Sansovino, the sculptor, who had sent for Tribolo. He received me most kindly and invited us to dinner, and we stayed with him. In course of conversation with Tribolo, he told him that he had no work to give him at the moment, but that he might call again. Hearing this, I burst out laughing, and said pleasantly to Sansovino, Your house is too far off from his, if he must call again. Poor Tribolo, all in dismay, exclaimed, I've got your letter here, which you wrote to bid me come. Sansovino rejoined that men of his sort, men of worth and genius, were free to do that, and greater things besides. Tribolo shrugged up his shoulders and muttered, Patience, patience, several times. Thereupon, without regarding the copious dinner which Sansovino had given me, I took the part of my comrade Tribolo, for he was in the right. All the while at table, Sansovino never stopped chattering about his great achievements, abusing Michelangelo and the rest of his fellow sculptors, while he bragged and vaunted himself to the skies. This had so annoyed me that not a single mouthful which I ate had tasted well, but I refrained from saying more than these two words. Messer Jacopo, men of worth act like men of worth, and men of genius, who produce things beautiful and excellent, shine forth far better when other people praise them than when they boast so confidently of their own achievements. Upon this he and I rose from the table, blowing off the steam of our color. The same day, happening to pass near the Rialto, I met Piero Benintendi in the company of some men, and perceiving that they were going to pick a quarrel with me, I turned into an apothecary's shop till the storm blew over. Afterwards I learned that the young Magalotti, to whom I showed that courtesy, had scolded them roundly, and thus the affair ended. 
79. A few days afterwards we set out on our return to Florence. We lay one night at a place on this side of Chiagia, on the left hand as you go towards Ferrara. Here the host insisted upon being paid before we went to bed, and in his own way, and when I observed that it was the custom everywhere else to pay in the morning, he answered, I insist on being paid overnight and in my own way. I retorted that men who wanted everything their own way ought to make a world after their own fashion, since things were differently managed here. Our host told me not to go on bothering his brains, because he was determined to do as he had said. Trebolo stood trembling with fear, and nudged me to keep quiet, lest they should do something worse to us, so we paid them in the way they wanted, and afterwards we retired to rest. We had, I must admit, the most capital beds, new in every particular, and as clean as they could be. Nevertheless I did not get one wink of sleep, because I kept on thinking how I could revenge myself. At one time it came into my head to set fire to his house, at another to cut the throats of four fine horses which he had in the stable. I saw well enough that it was easy for me to do all this, but I could not see how easy it was to secure myself and my companion. At last I resolved to put my things and my comrades on board the boat, and so I did. When the towing horses had been harnessed to the cable, I ordered the people not to stir before I returned, for I had left a pair of slippers in my bedroom. Accordingly I went back to the inn and called our host, who told me he had nothing to do with us, and that we might go to Jericho. There was a ragged stable-boy about, half asleep, who cried out to me, The master would not move to please the Pope, because he has got a wench in bed with him, whom he has been wanting this long while. Then he asked for a tip, and I gave him a few Venetian coppers, and told him to make the barge-man wait till I had found my slippers and returned. I went upstairs, took out a little knife as sharp as a razor, and cut the four beds that I found there into ribbons. I had the satisfaction of knowing I had done a damage of more than fifty crowns. Then I ran down to the boat with some pieces of the bed-covers in my pouch, and bade the bargee start at once without delay. We had not gone far before my gossip Trebolo said that he had left behind some little straps belonging to his carpet-bag, and that he must be allowed to go back for them. I answered that he need not take thought for a pair of little straps, since I could make him as many big ones as he liked. He told me I was always joking, but that he must really go back for his straps. Then he began ordering the bargee to stop, while I kept ordering him to go on. Meanwhile I informed my friend what kind of trick I had played our host, and showed him specimens of the bed-covers and other things, which threw him into such a quaking fright that he roared out to the bargee, "'On with you! On with you! As quick as you can!' and never thought himself quite safe until we reached the gates of Florence. When we arrived there, Trebolo said, "'Let us bind our swords up, for the love of God, and play me no more of your games, I beg, for all this while I felt as though my guts were in the saucepan.' I made answer, "'Gossip, Trebolo, you need not tie your sword up, for you have never loosed it. And this I said at random, because I never once had seen him act the man upon that journey. When he heard the remark, he looked at his sword and cried out, "'In God's name you speak true. Here it is tied, just as I arranged it before I left my house. My gossip deemed that I had been a bad travelling companion to him, because I resented affronts and defended myself against folk who would have done us injury.' but I deemed that he had acted a far worse part with regard to me by never coming to my assistance at such pinches. Let him judge between us who stands by and has no personal interest in our adventures. 80. No sooner had I dismounted than I went to visit Duke Alessandro, and thanked him greatly for his present of fifty crowns, telling His Excellency that I was always ready to serve him according to my abilities. He gave me orders at once to strike dies for his coinage, and the first I made was a piece of forty soldi, with the duke's head on one side and San Cosimo and San Damiano on the other. This was in silver, and it gave so much satisfaction that the duke did not hesitate to say they were the best pieces of money in Christendom. The same said all Florence and every one who saw them. Consequently I asked His Excellency to make me appointments, and to grant me lodgings of the mint. He bade me remain in his service, and promised he would give me more than I demanded. Meanwhile he said he had commissioned the master of the mint, a certain Carlo Acciarioli, that I might go to him for all the money that I wanted. This I found to be true, but I drew my money so discreetly that I always had something to my credit, according to my account. Then I made dies for a Julio. It had San Giovanni in profile, seated with a book in his hand, finer in my judgment than anything which I had done, and on the other side were the armorial bearings of Duke Alessandro. Next I made dies for half Julios, on which I struck the full face of San Giovanni in small. This was the first coin with a head in full face on so thin a piece of silver that had yet been seen. 
the difficulty of executing it is apparent only to the eyes of such as are past masters in these crafts. Afterwards I made dies for the golden crowns. This crown had a cross upon one side, with some little cherubim, and on the other side His Excellency's arms. When I had struck these four sorts, I begged the Duke to make out my appointments and to assign me the lodgings, I have mentioned, if he was contented with my service. He told me very graciously that he was quite satisfied, and that he would grant me my request. While we were thus talking, His Excellency was in his wardrobe, looking at a remarkable little gun that had been sent him out of Germany. When he noticed that I too paid particular attention to this pretty instrument, he put it in my hands, saying that he knew how much pleasure I took in such things, and adding that I might choose for earnest of his promises an arquebus to my own liking from the armory, excepting only this one piece. He was well aware that I should find things of greater beauty, and not less excellent there. Upon this invitation I accepted with thanks, and when he saw me looking round, he ordered his master of the wardrobe, a certain Pretino of Luca, to let me take whatever I liked. Then he went away with the most pleasant words at parting, while I remained, and chose the finest and best arquebus I ever saw, or ever had, and took it back with me to home. Two days afterward I brought some drawings which His Excellency had commissioned for gold work he wanted to give his wife, who was at that time still in Naples. I again asked him to settle my affairs. Then His Excellency told me that he should like me first to execute the die of his portrait in fine style, as I had done for Pope Clement. I began it in wax, and the Duke gave orders, while I was at work upon it, that whenever I went to take his portrait I should be admitted. Perceiving that I had a lengthy piece of business on my hands, I sent for a certain Pietro Pagolo from Monte Ritondo, in the Roman district, who had been with me from his boyhood in Rome. I found him with one Bernardonaccio, a goldsmith, who did not treat him well, so I brought him away from there, and taught him minutely how to strike coins from these dies. Meanwhile I went on making the Duke's portrait, and oftentimes I found him napping after dinner with that Lorenzino of his, who afterwards murdered him, and no other company, and much I marveled that a Duke of that sort showed such confidence about his safety. End of chapter 76 through 80「十一」through「84」「The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini」Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini» Volume 1 Translated by John Addington Simons Chapters 81-84 through 84. 81. It happened at this time, Ottaviano de' Medici, who to all appearances had got the government of everything in his own hands, favoured the old master of the mint against the duke's will. This man was called Bastiano Sanini, an artist of the antiquated school, and of little skill in his craft. Ottaviano mixed his stupid dyes with mine in the coinage of the crown pieces. I complained of this to the duke, who when he saw how the matter stood took it very ill, and said to me, Go, tell this Ottaviano de' Medici, and show him how it is. I lost no time, and when I had pointed out the injury that had been done to my fine coins, he answered, like the donkey that he was, We choose to have it so. I replied that it ought not to be so, and that I did not choose to have it so. He said, And if the Duke likes to have it so? I answered, It would not suit me, for the thing is neither just nor reasonable. He told me to take myself off, and that I should have no swallow in it this way, even if I burst. Then I returned to the Duke, and related the whole unpleasant conversation between Ottaviano de' Medici and me, entreating His Excellency not to allow the fine coins which I had made for him to be spoiled, and begging for permission to leave Florence. He replied, Ottaviano is too presuming. You shall have what you want, for this is an injury offered to myself. That very day, which was a Thursday, I received from Rome a full safe conduct from the Pope, with advice to go there at once and get the pardon of Our Lady's Feast in mid-August, in order that I might clear myself from the penalties attaching to my homicide. I went to the Duke, whom I found in bed, for they told me he was suffering the consequence of a debauch. In little more than two hours I finished what was wanted for his waxen metal, and when I showed it to him it pleased him extremely. Then I exhibited the safe conduct sent to me at the order of the Pope, and told him how His Holiness had recalled me to execute certain pieces of work. On this account I should like to regain my footing in the fair city of Rome, which would not prevent my attending to his medal. The duke made answer half in anger, Benvenuto, do as I desire. Stay here. I will provide for your appointments, and will give you the lodgings in the mint, with much more than you asked for, 
because your requests are only just and reasonable. And who do you think will be able to strike the beautiful dies which you have made for me? Then I said, My lord, I have thought of everything, for I have here a pupil of mine, a young Roman whom I have taught the art. He will serve your excellency very well till I return with your medal finished, to remain for ever in your service. I have in Rome a shop open, with journeymen and a pretty business. As soon as I have got my pardon, I will leave all the devotion of Rome to a pupil of mine there, and will come back, with your excellency's good permission, to you. During this conversation, the Lorenzino de' Medici, whom I have mentioned above, was present, and no one else. The duke frequently signed to him that he should join in pressing me to stay, but Lorenzino never said anything except, Benvenuto, you would do better to remain where you are. I answered that I wanted by all means to regain my hold on Rome. He made no reply, but continued eyeing the duke with very evil glances. When I had finished the medal to my liking, and shut it in its little box, I said to the duke, my lord, pray let me have your good will, for I will make you a much finer medal than the one I made for Pope Clement. It is only reasonable that I should, since that was the first I ever made. Messer Lorenzo here will give me some exquisite reverse, as he is a person learned of the greatest genius. To these words Lorenzo suddenly made answer, I have been thinking of nothing else but how to give you a reverse worthy of his excellency. The duke laughed a little, and looking at Lorenzo said, Lorenzo, you shall give him the reverse, and he shall do it here, and shall not go away. Lorenzo took him up at once, saying, I will do it as quickly as I can, and I hope to do something that shall make the whole world wonder. The duke, who held him sometimes for a fool and sometimes for a coward, turned about in bed, and laughed at his bragging words. I took my leave without further ceremony, and left them alone together. The duke, who did not believe that I was really going, said nothing further. Afterwards, when he knew that I was gone, he sent one of his servants, who caught me up at Siena, and gave me fifty golden ducats with a message from the duke, that I should take and use them for his sake, and should return as soon as possible, and for Messer Lorenzo I have to tell you that he is preparing an admirable reverse for that medal which you want to make. I had left full directions to Petro Pagolo, the Roman above mentioned, how he had to use the dies, but as it was a very delicate affair, he never quite succeeded in employing them. I remained creditor to the mint in a matter of more than seventy crowns on account of dies supplied by me. Note 1. This Ottaviano was not descended from either Cosimo or Lorenzo de' Medici, but from an elder, though less illustrious, branch of the great family. He married Francesca Salviati, the aunt of Duke Cosimo. Though a great patron of the arts and an intimate friend of M. A. Buonarroti, he was not popular, owing to his pride of place. 82. On the journey to Rome I carried with me that handsome arquebus which the Duke gave me, and very much to my own pleasure I used it several times by the way, performing incredible feats by means of it. The little house I had in Strada Julia was not ready, so I dismounted at the house of Messer Giovanni Gatti, clerk of the Camera, to whose keeping I had committed, on leaving Rome, many of my arms and other things I cared for. So I did not choose to alight at my shop, but sent for Felice, my partner, and got him to put my little dwelling forthwith into excellent order. The day following I went to sleep there, after well providing myself with clothes and all things requisite, since I intended to go and thank the Pope next morning. I had two young serving lads, and beneath my lodgings lived a laundress who cooked extremely nice for me. That evening I entertained several friends at supper, and having passed the time with great enjoyment, betook myself to bed. The night had hardly ended, indeed it was more than an hour before daybreak, when I heard a furious knocking at the house-door, stroke succeeding stroke without a moment's pause. Accordingly I called my elder servant, Senzio, he was the man I took into the necromantic circle, and bade him to go and see who the madman was that knocked so brutally at that hour of the night. While Senzio was on this errand, I lighted another lamp, for I always keep one by me at night. Then I made haste to pass an excellent coat of mail over my shirt, and above that some clothes which I caught up at random. Sencio returned, exclaiming, "'Heavens, master, it is the Bargello and all his guard. He says that if you do not open at once, he will knock the door down. They have torches and a thousand things besides with them.' I answered, "'Tell them that I am huddling my clothes on, and will come out to them in my shirt. Supposing it was a trap laid to murder me, as had been before done by Signor Pierre Luigi, I seized an excellent dagger with my right hand, and with my left I took the safe conduct.' Then I ran to the back window, which looked out on gardens, and there I saw more than thirty constables, wherefore I knew that I could not escape upon that side. 
I made the two lads go in front, and told them to open the door exactly when I gave the word to do so. Then, taking up an attitude of defense, with the dagger in my right hand and the safe conduct in my left, I cried to the lads, Have no fear, but open. The Bargello, Vittorio, and the officers sprang inside at once, thinking they could easily lay hands upon me. But when they saw me prepared in that way to receive them, they fell back, exclaiming, We have a serious job on hand here. Then I threw the safe conduct to them, and said, Read that and since you cannot seize me, I do not mean that you shall touch me. The Bargello, upon this, ordered some of his men to arrest me, saying he would look into the safe conduct later. Thereat I presented my arms boldly, calling aloud, Let God defend the right. Either I shall escape your hands alive, or be taken a dead corpse. The room was crammed with men. They made as though they would resort to violence. I stood upon my guard against them, so that the Bargello saw he would not be able to have me except in the way I said. Accordingly he called his clerk, and while the safe conduct was being read, he showed by signs two or three times that he meant to have me secured by his officers, but this had no effect of shaking my determination. At last they gave up the attempt, threw my safe conduct on the ground, and went away without their prize. 83. When I returned to bed, I felt so agitated that I could not get to sleep again. My mind was made up to let blood as soon as day broke. However, I asked advice of Messer Gatti, and he referred to a wretched doctor-fellow he employed, who asked me if I had been frightened. Now just consider what a judicious doctor this was, after I had narrated an occurrence of that gravity, to ask me such a question. He was an empty fribbler, who kept perpetually laughing about nothing at all. Simpering and sniggering, then, he bade me drink a good cup of Greek wine, keep my spirits up, and not be frightened. Messer Giovanni, however, said, Master, a man of bronze or marble might be frightened in such circumstances. How much more one of flesh and blood? The quack responded, Monsignor, we are not all made after the same pattern. This fellow is no man of bronze or marble, but of pure iron. Then he gave one of his meaningless laughs, and putting his fingers on my wrist, said, Feel here. This is not a man's pulse, but a lion's or a dragon's. At this, I, whose blood was thumping in my veins, probably far beyond anything which that fool of a doctor had learned from his Hippocrates or Galen, know at once how serious was my situation. Yet, wishing not to add to my uneasiness and to the harm I had already taken, I made show of being in good spirits. While this was happening, Messer Giovanni had ordered dinner, and we all of us sat down to eat in company. I remembered that Messer Lodovico de Fano, Messer Antonio Allegretti, Messer Giovanni Greco, all of them men of the finest scholarship, and Messer Annabel Caro, who was then quite young, were present. At table the conversation turned entirely upon my act of daring. They insisted on hearing the whole story over and over again for my apprentice Sencio, who was a youth of superlative talent, bravery, and extreme personal beauty. Each time that he described my truculent behavior, throwing himself into the attitudes I had assumed, and repeating the words which I had used, he called up some fresh detail to my memory. They kept asking him if he had been afraid, to which he answered that they ought to ask me if I had been afraid, because he felt precisely the same as I had. All this chattering grew irksome to me, and since I still felt strongly agitated, I rose at last from the table, saying that I wanted to go and get new clothes of blue silk and stuff for him and me, adding that I meant to walk in procession after four days at the Feast of Our Lady, and meant Sencio to carry a white lighted torch on the occasion. Accordingly I took my leave, and had the blue cloth cut, together with a handsome jacket of blue sarcenet, and a little doublet of the same, and I had a similar jacket and waistcoat made for Sencio. When these things had been cut out, I went to see the Pope, who told me to speak with Messer Ambru Oggio, for he had given orders that I should execute a large piece of golden plate. So I went to find Messer Ambru Oggio, who had heard the whole of the affair of the Bargello, and had been in concert with my enemies to bring me back to Rome and had scolded the Bargello for not laying hands on me. The man excused himself by saying that he could not do so in the face of the safe conduct which I held. Messer Ambrogio now began to talk about the Pope's commission, and bade me make drawings for it, saying that the business should be put at once in train. Meanwhile the feast of Our Lady came round. Now it is the custom for those who get a pardon upon this occasion to give themselves up to prison, in order to avoid doing which I return to the Pope, and told His Holiness that I was very unwilling to go to prison, and that I begged him to grant me the favor of a dispensation. The Pope answered that such was the custom, and that I must follow it. 
Thereupon I fell again upon my knees, and thanked him for the safe conduct he had given me, saying at the same time that I should go back with it to serve my duke in Florence, who was waiting for me so impatiently. On hearing this the Pope turned to one of his confidential servants and said, Let Benvenuto get his grace without the prison, and see that his motto proprio is made out in due form. As soon as the document had been drawn up, His Holiness signed it. It was then registered at the capital. Afterwards, upon the day appointed, I walked in procession very honorably between two gentlemen, and so got clear at last. 84. Four days had passed when I was attacked with violent fever attended by extreme cold, and taking to my bed, I made up my mind that I was sure to die. I had the first doctors of Rome called in, among whom was Francesco de Norcia, a physician of great age, and of the best repute in Rome. I told them what I believed to be the cause of my illness, and said that I had wished to let blood, but that I had been advised against it, and if it was not too late, I begged them to bleed me now. Maestro Francesco answered that it would not be well for me to let blood then, but that if I had done so before, I should have escaped without mischief. At present they would have to treat the case with other remedies. So they began to doctor me as energetically as they were able, while I grew daily worse and worse so rapidly that after eight days the physicians despaired of my life, and said that I might be indulged in any whim I had to make me comfortable. Maestro Francesco added, As long as there is breath in him, call me at all hours, for no one can divine what nature is able to work in a young man of this kind. Moreover, if he should lose consciousness, administer these five remedies one after the other, and send for me, for I will come at any hour of the night. I would rather save him than any of the cardinals in Rome. Every day Messer Giovanni Gatti came to see me two or three times, and each time he took up one or another of my handsome fowling pieces, coats of mail or swords, using words like these, That is a handsome thing, that other is still handsomer, and likewise with my models and other trifles, so that at last he drove me wild with annoyance. In his company came a certain Matteo Franzesi, and this man also appeared to be waiting impatiently for my death, not indeed because he would inherit anything from me, because he wished for what his master seemed to have so much at heart. Felice, my partner, was always at my side, rendering the greatest services which it is possible for one man to give another. Nature in me was utterly debilitated and undone. I had not strength enough to fetch my breath back if it left me, and yet my brain remained as clear and strong as it had been before my illness. Nevertheless, although I kept my consciousness, a terrible old man used to come to my bedside, and make as though he would drag me by force into a huge boat he had with him. This made me call out to my Felice to draw near and chase that malignant old man away. Felice, who loved me most affectionately, ran weeping and crying, Away with you, old traitor, you are robbing me of all the good I have in this world. Messer Giovanni Gatti, who was present, then began to say, The poor fellow is delirious, and has only a few hours to live. His fellow, Matteo Franzesi, remarked, He has read Dante, and in the prostration of his sickness this apparition has appeared to him. Then he added, laughingly, Away with you, old rascal, and don't bother our friend Benvenuto. When I saw that they were making fun of me, I turned to Messer Gatti and said, My dear master, know that I am not raving, and that it is true that this old man is really giving me annoyance. But the best that you can do for me would be to drive that miserable Matteo from my side, who is laughing at my affliction. Afterwards, if your lordship deigns to visit me again, let me beg you to come with Messer Antonio Allegretti, or Messer Annabel Caro, or with some other of your accomplished friends, who are persons of quite different intelligence and discretion from that beast. Thereupon Messer Giovanni told Matteo in jest to take himself out of his sight for ever, but because Matteo went on laughing, the joke turned to earnest, for Messer Giovanni would not look upon him again, but sent for Messer Antonio Allegretti, Messer Ludovico, and Messer Annabel Caro. On the arrival of these worthy men I was greatly comforted, and talked reasonably with them a while, however, not without frequently urging Felice to drive the old man away. Messer Ludovico asked me what it was I seemed to see, and how the man was shaped. While I portrayed him accurately in words, the old man took me by the arm and dragged me violently toward him. This made me cry out for aid, because he was going to fling me under hatches in his hideous boat. On saying that last word I fell into a terrible swoon, and seemed to be sinking down into the boat. They say that during that fainting fit I flung myself about and cast bad words at Messer Giovanni Gatti, to wit, that he came to rob me, and not from any motive of charity, and other insults of the kind, which caused him to be much ashamed. Later on, they say that I still lay like one dead, and after waiting by me more than an hour, 
thinking I was growing cold, they left me for dead. When they returned home, Matteo Franzesi was informed, who wrote to Florence to Messer Benedetto Varchi, my very dear friend, that they had seen me die at such and such an hour of the night. When he heard the news, the most accomplished man and my dear friend composed an admirable sonnet upon my supposed, but not real, death, which shall be reported in its proper place. More than three long hours passed, and yet I did not regain consciousness. Felice, having used all the remedies prescribed by Maestro Francesco, and seeing that I did not come to, ran post-haste to the physician's door, and knocked so loudly that he woke him up, and made him rise, and begged him with tears to come to the house, for he thought that I was dead. Whereto Maestro Francesco, who was a very choleric man, replied, "'My son, of what use do you think I should be if I came? If he is dead, I am more sorry than you are.' Do you imagine that if I were to come with my medicine I could breathe up through his guts and bring him back to life for you? But when he saw that the poor young fellow was going away weeping, he called him back and gave him an oil with which to anoint my pulses and my heart, telling him to pinch my little fingers and toes very tightly, and to send at once to call if I should revive. Felice took his way, and did as Maestro Francesco had ordered. It was almost bright day when, thinking they would have to abandon hope, they gave orders to have my shroud made and to wash me. Suddenly I regained consciousness, and called out to Felice to drive away the old man on the moment who kept tormenting me. He wanted to send for Maestro Francesco, but I told him not to do so, but to come close up to me, because that old man was afraid of him and went away at once. So Felice drew near to the bed. I touched him, and it seemed to me that the infuriated old man withdrew, so I prayed him not to leave me for a second. When Maestro Francesco appeared, he said that it was his dearest wish to save my life, and that he had never in all his days seen greater force in a young man than I had. Then he sat down to write, and prescribed for me perfumes, lotions, unctions, plasters, and a heap of other precious things. Meanwhile I came to life again by the means of more than twenty leeches applied to my buttocks, but with my body bore through, bound, and ground to powder. Many of my friends crowded in to behold the miracle of the resuscitated dead man, and among them people of the first importance. In their presence I declared that the small amount of gold and money I possessed, perhaps some eight hundred crowns, with what gold, silver, jewels, and cash, should be given by my will to my poor sister in Florence, called Mona Liparata. All the remainder of my property, armor and everything besides, I left to my dearest Felice, together with fifty golden ducats, in order that he might buy mourning. At these words Felice flung his arms around my neck, protesting that he wanted nothing but to have me, as he wished, alive with him. Then I said, If you want me alive, touch me as you did before, and threaten the old man, for he is afraid of you. At these words some of the folk were terrified, knowing that I was not raving, but talking to the purpose and with all my wits. Thus my wretched malady went dragging on, and I got but little better. Maestro Francesco, that most excellent man, came four or five times a day. Messer Giovanni Gatti, who felt ashamed, did not visit me again. My brother-in-law, the husband of my sister, arrived. He came from Florence for the inheritance. But as he was a very worthy man, he rejoiced exceedingly to have found me alive. The sight of him did me a world of good, and he began to caress me at once, saying he had only come to take care of me in person, and this he did for several days. Afterwards I sent him away, having almost certain hope of my recovery. On this occasion he left the sonnet of Messer Benedetto Varchi, which runs as follows. Who shall, Matteo, yield our pain relief? Who shall forbid the sad expense of tears? Alas, tis true that in his youthful years our friend hath flown and left us here to grieve. He hath gone up to heaven, who was the chief of men renowned in art's immortal spheres. Among the mighty dead he had no peers, nor shall earth see his like in my belief. O gentle sprite, if love still sway the blessed, Look down on him, thou here didst love, and view these tears that mourn my loss, not thy great good. There dost thou gaze on his beatitude, who made our universe, and findest true, the form of him thy skill for men expressed. End of chapters 81 through 84《ラプス85-88 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini》。Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. Pats. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume One. 
Translated by John Eddington Simons Chapters 85 through 88 My sickness had been of such a very serious nature that it seemed impossible for me to fling it off. That worthy man, Maestro Francesco da Norcia, redoubled his efforts and brought me every day fresh remedies trying to restore strength to my miserable unstrung frame. Yet all these endeavours were apparently insufficient to overcome the obstinacy of my malady, so that the physicians were in despair and at their wit's end. What to do? I was tormented by thirst, but had abstained from drinking for many days according to the doctor's orders. Felice, who thought he had done wonders in restoring me, never left my side. That old man ceased to give so much annoyance, yet sometimes he appeared to me in dreams. One day, Felice had gone out of doors, leaving me under the care of a young apprentice and a servant maid called Beatrice. I asked the apprentice what had become of my lad, Cencio and what was the reason why I had never seen him in attendance on me. The boy replied that Chencho had been far more ill than I was, and that he was even at death's door. Felice had given them orders not to speak to me of this. On hearing the news, I was exceedingly distressed. Then I called the maid Beatrice, a Pistoian girl, and asked her to bring me a great crystal water cooler which stood near, full of clear and fresh water. She ran at once and brought it to me full. I told her to put it to my lips, adding that if she let me take a draught according to my heart's content, I would give her a new gown. This maid had stolen from me certain little things of some importance, and in her fear of being detected, she would have been very glad if I had died. Accordingly, she allowed me twice to take as much as I could of the water, so that in good earnest, I swallowed more than a flask full. I then covered myself and began to sweat and fell into a deep sleep. After I had slept about an hour, Felice came home and asked the boy how I was getting on. He answered, I do not know. Beatrice brought him that cooler full of water and he has drunk almost the whole of it. I don't know now whether he is alive or dead. They say that my poor friend was on the point of falling to the ground. So grieved was he to hear this. Afterwards he took an ugly state and began to beat the serving girl with all his might, shouting out, Ah, traitress, you have killed him for me then. While Felice was cudgeling and she screaming, I was in a dream. I thought the old man held ropes in his hand, and while he was preparing to bind me, Felice had arrived and struck him with an axe, so that the old man fled exclaiming, Let me go, and I promise not to return for a long while. Beatrice in the meantime had run into my bedroom, shrieking loudly. This woke me up, and I called out, Leave her alone! Perhaps when she meant to do me harm, she did me more good than you were able to do with all your efforts. She may indeed have saved my life, so lend me a helping hand, for I have sweated, and be quick about it. Felice recovered his spirits, dried and made me comfortable, and I, being conscious of a great improvement in my state, began to reckon on recovery. When Maestro Francesco appeared and saw my great improvement and the servant girl in tears and the apprentice running to and fro and Felice laughing, all this disturbance made him think that something extraordinary must have happened, which had been the cause of my amendment. Just then, the other doctor, Bernardino, put in his appearance, who at the beginning of my illness had refused to bleed me. Maestro Francesco, that most able man, exclaimed, Oh, power of nature! She knows what she requires, and the physicians know nothing. That simpleton, Maestro Bernardino, made answer saying, 
If he had drunk another bottle, he would have been cured upon the spot. Maestro Francesco da Norcia, a man of age and great authority, said, That would have been a terrible misfortune, and would to God that it may fall on you. Afterwards he turned to me, and asked if I could have drunk more water. I answered, No, because I had entirely quenched my thirst. Then he turned to Maestro Bernardino, and said, Look you how nature has taken precisely what she wanted, neither more nor less. In like manner, she was asking for what she wanted, when the poor young man begged you to bleed him. If you knew that his recovery depended upon his drinking two flasks of water, why did you not say so before? You might then have boasted of his cure. At these words, the wretched quack sulkily departed and never showed his face again. Maestro Francesco then gave orders that I should be removed from my room and carried to one of the hills there are in Rome. Cardinal Cornaro, when he heard of my improvement, had me transported to a place of his on Monte Cavallo. The very evening, I was taken with great precautions in a chair, well wrapped up and protected from the cold. No sooner had I reached the place than I began to vomit, during which there came from my stomach a hairy worm, about a quarter of a cubit in length. The hairs were long, and the worm was very ugly, speckled of diverse colors, green, black, and red. They kept and showed it to the doctor, who said he had never seen anything of the sort before, and afterwards remarked to Felice, Now take care of your benvenuto, for he is cured. Do not permit him any irregularities, for though he has escaped this time, another disorder now would be the death of him. You see his malady has been so grave, that if we had brought him the extreme unction, we might not have been in time. Now I know that with a little patience and time, he will leave to execute more of his fine works. Then he turned to me and said, My benvenuto, be prudent, commit no excesses, and when you are quite recovered, I beg you to make me a Madonna with your own hand and I will always pay my devotions to it for your sake. This I promised to do, and then asked him whether it would be safe for me to travel so far as to Florence. He advised me to wait till I was stronger, until we could observe how nature worked in me. Chapter 86 When eight days had come and gone, my amendment was so slight that life itself became almost a burden to me. Indeed, I had been more than fifty days in that great suffering. So I made my mind up and prepared to travel. My dear Felice and I went toward Florence in a pair of baskets. And as I had not written, when I reached my sister's house, she wept and laughed over me all in one breath. That day, many friends came to see me. Among others, Pierre Landi, who was the best and dearest friend I ever had. Next day, there came a certain Niccolo da Monte Aguto, who was also a very great friend of mine. Now he had heard the Duke say, Benvenuto would have done much better to die, because he is come to put his head into a noose, and I will never pardon him. Accordingly, when Niccolo arrived, he said to me in desperation, Alas, my dear Benvenuto, what have you come to do here? Did you not know what you have done to displease the Duke? I have heard him swear that you were thrusting your head into a halter. Then I replied, Niccolò, remind His Excellency that Pope Clement wanted to do as much to me before, and quite as unjustly. Tell him to keep his eye on me, and give me time to recover. Then I will show His Excellency 
that I have been the most faithful servant he will ever have in all his life. And for as much as some enemy must have served me, this bad turn through envy, let him wait till I get well, for I shall then be able to give such an account of myself as will make him marvel. This bad turn had been done me by Giorgetto Vassellario of Arezzo, the painter, perchance in recompense for many benefits conferred on him. I had harboured him in Rome and provided for his costs while he had turned my whole house upside down, for the man was subject to a species of dry scab, which he was always in the habit of scratching with his hands. It happened then that sleeping in the same bed as an excellent workman named Manno, who was in my service, when he meant to scratch himself, he tore the skin from one of Manno's legs with his filthy claws, the nails of which he never used to cut. The said Manno left my service and was resolutely bent on killing him. I made the quarrel up and afterwards got Giorgio into Cardinal de' Medici's household, and continually helped him. For this desert then, he told Duke Alessandro that I had abused His Excellency, and had bragged I meant to be the first to leap upon the walls of Florence, with his foes the exiles. These words, as I afterwards learned, had been put into Vasari's lips by the excellent fellow Ottaviano de' Medici, who wanted to revenge himself for the Duke's irritation against him, on account of the coinage and my departure from Florence. I, being innocent of the crime falsely ascribed to me, felt no fear whatever. Meanwhile that able physician Francesco da Montevarchi attended to my cure with great skill. He had been brought by my very dear friend Luca Martini, who passed the larger portion of the day with me. Chapter 87 During this, while I had sent my devoted comrade Felice back to Rome to look after our business there, when I could raise my head a little from the bolster, which was at the end of fifteen days, although I was unable to walk upon my feet, I had myself carried to the place of the Medici and placed upon the little upper terrace. There they seated me to wait until the Duke went by. Many of my friends at court came up to greet me and expressed surprise that I had undergone the inconvenience of being carried in that way. While so shattered by illness, they said that I ought to have waited till I was well and then to have visited the Duke. A crowd of them collected, all looking at me as a sort of miracle, not merely because they had heard that I was dead, but far more because I had the look of a dead man. Then publicly before them all, I said how some wicked scoundrel had told my lord the Duke that I had bragged I meant to be the first to scale his excellency's walls and also that I had abused him personally, wherefore I had not the heart to leave or die till I had purged myself of that infamy, and found out who the audacious rascal was who had uttered such calumnies against me. At these words, a large number of those gentlemen came round, expressing great compassion for me. One said one thing, one another and I told them I would never go thence before I knew who had accused me. At these words, Maestro Agostino, the Duke's tailor, made his way through all those gentlemen and said, If that's all you want to know, you shall know it at this very moment. Giorgio the painter, whom I have mentioned, happened just then to pass, and Maestro Agostino exclaimed, there is the man who accused you. Now you know yourself if it be true or not. As fiercely as I could, not being able to leave my seat, I asked Giorgio if it was true that he had accused me. 
he denied that it was so, and that he had ever said anything of the sort. Maestro Agostino retorted, You gallows bird, don't you know that I know it for most certain? Giorgio made off as quickly as he could, repeating that he had not accused me. Then after a short while, the duke came by, whereupon I had myself raised up before his excellency, and he halted. I told him that I had come therein that way solely in order to clear my character. The duke gazed at me and marvelled I was still alive. Afterwards, he bade me take heed to be an honest man and regain my health. When I reached home, Niccolò da Monte Aguto came to visit me and told me that I had escaped one of the most dreadful perils in the world. Quite contrary to all his expectations, for he had seen my ruin written with indelible ink. Now I must make haste to get well, and afterwards take French leave, because my jeopardy came from a quarter and a man who was able to destroy me. He then said, Beware, and added, What displeasure have you given to that rascal Ottaviano de Medici? I answered that I had done nothing to displease him, but that he had injured me and told him all the affair about the mint. He repeated, Get hence as quickly as you can, and be of good courage, for you will see your vengeance executed sooner than you expect. I, the best attention to my health, gave Pietro Pagolo advice about stamping the coins and then went off upon my way to Rome, without saying a word to the Duke or anybody else. Chapter 88 When I reached Rome, and had enjoyed the company of my friends a while, I began the Duke's medal. I finished the head in steel, and it was the finest work of the kind which I had ever produced. At least once every day there came to visit me a sort of blockhead named Messer Francesco Soderini. When he saw what I was doing, he used frequently to exclaim, Barbarous wretch! You want them to immortalize that ferocious tyrant? You have never made anything so exquisite, which proves you our inveterate foe and their devoted friend. And yet the Pope and he have had it twice in mind to hang you without any fault of yours. That was the Father and the Son. Now beware of the Holy Ghost. It was firmly believed that Duke Alessandro was the son of Pope Clement. Messer Francesco used also to say and swear by all his saints that if he could, he would have robbed me of the dies for that medal. I responded that he had done well to tell me so, and that I would take such care of them that he should never see them more. I now sent to Florence to request Lorenzino that he would send me the reverse of the medal. Niccolò da Monte Aguto, to whom I had written, wrote back, saying that he had spoken to that mad melancholy philosopher Lorenzino for it. He had replied that he was thinking night and day of nothing else, and that he would finish it as soon as he was able. Nevertheless, I was not to set my hopes upon his reverse, but I had better invent one out of my own head, and when I had finished it, I might bring it without hesitation to the Duke, for this would be to my advantage. I composed the design of a reverse which seemed to me appropriate and pressed the work forward to my best ability. Not being, however, yet recovered from that terrible illness, I gave myself frequent relaxation by going out on fowling expeditions with my friend Felice. This man had no skill in my art, but since we were perpetually day and night together, Everybody thought he was a first-rate craftsman. This being so, 
as he was a fellow of much humour, we used often to laugh together about the great credit he had gained. His name was Felice Guadagni Gain, which made him say in jest, I should be called Felice Gain, little. If you had not enabled me to acquire such credit, then I can call myself Gain much. I replied that there are two ways of gaining. The first is that by which one gains for oneself. The second that by which one gains for others. So I praised him much more for the second than the first, since he had gained for me my life. We often held such conversations, but I remember one in particular on the day of Epiphany, when we were together near La Maliana. It was close upon nightfall, and during the day I had shot a good number of ducks and geese. Then, as I had almost made my mind up, to shoot no more that time, we were returning briskly toward Rome, calling to my dog by his name, Barucco, and not seeing him in front of me, I turned round and noticed that the well-trained animal was pointing at some geese which had settled in a ditch. I therefore dismounted at once, got my fowling piece ready, and at a very long range, brought two of them down with a single ball. I never used to shoot with more than one ball and was usually able to hit my mark at 200 cubits, which cannot be done by other ways of loading. Of the two geese, one was almost dead and the other, though badly wounded, was flying lamely. My dog retrieved the one and brought it to me. But noticing that the other was diving down into the ditch, I sprang forward to catch it. Trusting to my boots which came high up the lake, I put one foot forward. It sank in the oozy ground, and so, although I got the goose, the boot of my right leg was full of water. I lifted my foot and let the water run out. Then, when I had mounted, we made haste for Rome. The cold, however, was very great, and I felt my leg freeze, so that I said to Felice, We must do something to help this leg, for I don't know how to bear it longer. The good Felice, without a word, leapt from his horse, and gathering some thistles and bits of stick, began to build a fire. I, meanwhile, was waiting and put my hands among the breast feathers of the geese and felt them very warm. So I told him not to make the fire, but filled my boot with the feathers of the goose and was immediately so much comforted that I regained vitality. End of chapters 85 through 88 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1 Recording by P. Pat The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. Pats. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Eddington Simons. Chapters 89 through 92. Chapter 89 We mounted and rode rapidly toward Rome, and when we had reached a certain gently rising ground, night had already fallen, looking in the direction of Florence, both with one breath exclaimed in the utmost astonishment, O oh God of heaven, what is that great thing one sees there, over Florence? It resembled a huge beam of fire which sparkled and gave out extraordinary luster. I said to Felice, Assuredly we shall hear tomorrow that something of vast importance has happened in Florence. As we rode into Rome, the darkness was extreme, and when we came near the Banchi and our own house, my little horse was going in an amble at a furious speed. Now that day, 
They had thrown a heap of plaster and broken tiles in the middle of the road, which neither my horse nor myself perceived. In his fiery pace, the beast ran up it, but on coming down upon the other side, he turned a complete somersault. He had his head between his legs, and it was only through the power of God Himself that I escaped unhurt. The noise we made brought the neighbors out with lights, but I had already jumped to my feet, and so without remounting, I ran home laughing to have come unhurt out of an accident enough to break my neck. On entering the house, I found some friends of mine there. To whom, while we were supping together, I related the adventures of the day's chase and the diabolical apparition of the fiery beam which we had seen. They exclaimed, "Why shall we hear tomorrow, which this portent has announced?" I answered, "Some revolution must certainly have occurred in Florence." So we supped agreeably, and late the next day there came the news to Rome. Of Duke Alessandro's death. Upon this, many of my acquaintances came to me and said, "You were right in conjecturing that something of great importance had happened at Florence." Just then, Francesco Soderini appeared jogging along upon a wretched mule he had, and laughing all the way like a madman, he said to me, "This is the reverse of that vile tyrant's medal." Which your Lorenzino de Medici promised you, then he added, "You wanted to immortalize the dukes for us, but we mean to have no more dukes." And thereupon he jeered me, as though I had been the captain of the factions which make dukes. Meanwhile, a certain Baccio Bettini, who had an ugly big head like a bushel. Came up and began to banter me in the same way about dukes, calling out, "We have disduked them and won't have any more of them, and you were for making them immortal for us," with many other tiresome quips of the same kind. I lost my patience at this nonsense and said to them, "You blockheads! I am a poor goldsmith, who serve whoever pays me." And you are jeering me as though I were a party leader. However, this shall not make me cast in your teeth the insatiable greediness, idiocy, and good for nothingness of your predecessors. But this one answer I will make to all your silly railleries that before two or three days at the longest have passed by, you will have another duke much worse, perhaps than he who now has left you. The following day. Bettini came to my shop and said, "There is no need to spend money in couriers, for you know things before they happen. What spirit tells them to you?" Then he informed me that Cosimo de Medici, the son of Signor Giovanni, was made duke, but that certain conditions had been imposed at his election, which would hold him back from kicking up his heels at his own pleasure. I now had my opportunity for laughing at them and saying, "Those men of Florence have set a young man upon a meddlesome horse. Next, they have buckled spurs upon his heels, and put the bridle freely in his hands, and turned him out upon a magnificent field, full of flowers and fruits and all delightful things. Next, they have bidden him not to cross certain indicated limits." Now tell me, you, who there is that can hold him back whenever he has but the mind to cross them? Laws cannot be imposed on him who is the master of the law. So they left me alone and gave me no further annoyance. Chapter Ninety. I now began to attend to my shop and did some business, not, however, of much moment, because I had still to think about my health, which was not yet established. After that grave illness I had undergone, about this time the emperor returned victorious from his expedition against Tunis, and the pope sent for me to take my advice concerning the present of honor it was fit to give him. I answered that it seemed to me most appropriate to present his imperial majesty with a golden crucifix 
for which I had almost finished an ornament quite to the purpose, and which would confer the highest honour upon His Holiness and me. I had already made three little figures of gold in the round, about a palm high. They were those which I had begun for the chalice of Pope Clement, representing faith, hope, and charity. To this I added in wax what was wanting for the basement of the cross. I carried the whole to the Pope, with the Christ in wax, and many other exquisite decorations which gave him complete satisfaction. Before I took leave of His Holiness, we had agreed on every detail and calculated the price of the work. This was one evening four hours after nightfall, and the Pope had ordered Messer Latino Juvenale to see that I had money paid to me next morning. This Messer Latino, who had a pretty big dash of the fool in his composition, bethought him of furnishing the Pope with a new idea which was, however, wholly of his own invention. So he altered everything which had been arranged, and next morning, when I went for the money, he said with his usual brutal arrogance, It is our part to invent and yours to execute. Before I left the Pope last night, we thought of something far superior. To these first words I answered without allowing him to proceed further. Neither you nor the Pope can think of anything better than a piece of which Christ plays a part. So you may go on with your courtier's nonsense, till you have no more to say. Without uttering one word, he left me in a rage, and tried to get the work given to another goldsmith. The Pope, however, refused, and sent for me at once, and told me I had spoken well, but that they wanted to make use of a book of ours of Our Lady, which was marvellously illuminated, and had cost the Cardinal de' Medici more than two thousand crowns. They thought that this would be an appropriate present to the Empress, and that for the Emperor they would afterwards make what I had suggested, which was indeed a present worthy of him. But now there was no time to lose, since the Emperor was expected in Rome in about a month and a half. He wanted the book to be enclosed in a case of massive gold, richly worked and adorned with jewels valued at about six thousand crowns. Accordingly, when the jewels and the gold were given me, I began the work, and driving it briskly forward in a few days, brought it to such beauty that the Pope was astonished, and showed me the most distinguished signs of favour conceding at the same time that that beast juvenile should have nothing more to do with me i had nearly brought my work to its completion when the emperor arrived and numerous triumphal arches of great magnificence were erected in his honour he entered rome with extraordinary pomp the description of which i leave to others since i mean to treat of those things only which concern myself Immediately after his arrival, he gave the Pope a diamond which he had bought for twelve thousand crowns. This diamond the Pope committed to my care, ordering me to make a ring to the measure of his holiness finger. But first he wished me to bring the book in the state to which I had advanced it. I took it accordingly, and he was highly pleased with it. Then he asked my advice concerning the apology which could be reasonably made to the emperor for the unfinished condition of my work. I said that my indisposition would furnish a sound excuse, since his majesty, seeing how thin and pale I was, would very readily believe and accept it. To this the Pope replied that he approved of the suggestion, but that I should add on the part of his holiness. When I presented the book to the emperor, that I made him the present of myself. Then he told me in detail how I had to behave and the words I had to say. These words I repeated to the pope, asking him if he wished me to deliver them in that way. He replied, You would acquit yourself to admiration if you had the courage to address the emperor as you are addressing me. Then I said that I had the courage to speak with far greater ease 
and freedom to the emperor, seeing that the emperor was clothed as I was, and that I should seem to be speaking to a man formed like myself. This was not the case when I addressed his holiness, in whom I beheld a far superior deity, both by reason of his ecclesiastical adornments, which shed a certain aureole about him, and at the same time, because of his holiness, dignity of venerable age. All these things inspired in me more awe than the imperial majesty. To these words the Pope responded, Go, my benvenuto, you are a man of ability. Do us honor, and it will be well for you. Chapter 91 The Pope ordered out two Turkish horses, which had belonged to Pope Clement, and were the most beautiful that ever came to Christendom. Messer Durante, his chamberlain, was bidden to bring them through the lower galleries of the palace, and there to give them to the emperor, repeating certain words which his holiness dictated to him. We both went down together, and when we reached the presence of the emperor, the horses made their entrance through those halls with so much spirit and such a noble carriage that the emperor and every one were struck with wonder. Thereupon, Messer Durante advanced him so graceless a manner and delivered his speech with so much of Brescian lingo, mumbling his words over in his mouth, that one never saw or heard anything worse. Indeed, the emperor could not refrain from smiling at him. I meanwhile had already uncovered my piece, and observing that the emperor had turned his eyes towards me with a very gracious look. I advanced at once and said, Sacred Majesty, our most holy father, Pope Paolo, sends this book of the Virgin as a present to your majesty, the which he is written in a fair clerk's hand, and illuminated by the greatest master, whoever professed that art, and this rich cover of gold and jewels is unfinished, as you here behold it. By reason of my illness, wherefore his holiness, together with the book, presents me also, and attaches me to your majesty, in order that I may complete the work. Nor this alone, but everything which you may have it in your mind to execute, so long as life is left me. Will I perform at your service? Thereto the emperor responded, The book is acceptable to me, and so are you, but I desire you to complete it for me in Rome. When it is finished and you are restored to health, bring it me and come to see me. Afterwards, in course of conversation, he called me by my name, which made me wonder, because no words had been dropped in which my name occurred and he said that he had seen that fastening of Pope Clement's cope, on which I had brought so many wonderful figures. We continued talking in this way a whole half hour, touching on diverse topics artistic and agreeable. Then, since it seemed to me that I had acquitted myself with more honour than I had expected, I took the occasion of a slight lull in the conversation to make my bow and to retire. The emperor was heard to say, Let five hundred golden crowns be given at once to Benvenuto. The person who brought them up asked who the Pope's man was, who had spoken to the emperor. Messer Durante came forward and robbed me of my five hundred crowns. I complained to the Pope, who told me not to be uneasy, for he knew how everything had happened and how well I had conducted myself in addressing the emperor and of the money I should certainly obtain my share. Chapter 92 When I returned to my shop, I set my hand with diligence to finishing the diamond ring, concerning which the four first jewelers of Rome were sent to consult with me. This was because the Pope had been informed that the diamond had been set by the first jeweler of the world in Venice. He was called Maestro Miliano Targhetta and the diamond being somewhat thin, the job of setting it was too difficult to be attempted without great deliberation. I was well pleased to receive these four jewellers, among whom was a man of Milan called Gaio. 
He was the most presumptuous donkey in the world, the one who knew least and who thought he knew most. The others were very modest and able craftsmen. In the presence of us all, this Gallo began to talk and said, "Miliano's foil should be preserved, and to do that, Benvenuto, you shall doff your cap." For just as giving diamonds a tint is the most delicate and difficult thing in the jeweller's art, so is Miliano the greatest jeweller that ever lived, and this is the most difficult diamond to tint. I replied that it was all the greater glory for me to compete with so able a master in such an excellent profession. Afterwards, I turned to the other jewellers and said, "Look here, I am keeping Miliano's foil." And I will see whether I can improve on it with some of my own manufacture. If not, we will tint it with the same you see here. That as Gallo exclaimed that if I made a foil like that, he would gladly doff his cap to it. To which I replied, "Supposing then I make it better, it will deserve two bows." Certainly so," said he. And I began to compose my foils. I took the very greatest pains in mixing the tints, the method of doing which I will explain in the proper place. It is certain that the diamond in question offered more difficulties than any others which before or afterwards have come into my hands, and Miliano's foil was made with true artistic skill. However, that did not dismay me, but having sharpened my wits up. I succeeded not only in making something quite as good, but in exceeding it by far. Then, when I saw that I had surpassed him, I went about to surpass myself, and produced a foil by new processes, which was a long way better than what I had previously made. Thereupon, I sent for the jewellers, and first I tinted the diamond with Miliano's foil. Then I cleaned it well and tinted it. A fresh with my own. When I showed it to the jewellers, one of the best among them, who was called Raphael del Moro, took the diamond in his hand and said to Gallo, "Benvenuto has outdone the foil of Miliano." Gallo, unwilling to believe it, took the diamond and said, "Benvenuto, this diamond is worth two thousand ducats more than with the foil of Miliano." I rejoined. Now that I have surpassed Miliano, let us see if I can surpass myself. Then I begged them to wait for me a while, went up into a little cabinet, and having tinted the diamond anew, unseen by them, returned and showed it to the jewellers. Gallo broke out at once. This is the most marvelous thing that I have ever seen in the course of my whole lifetime. The stone is worth upwards of eighteen thousand crowns. Whereas we valued it at barely twelve thousand, the other jewellers turned to him and said, "Benvenuto is the glory of our art, and it is only due that we should doff our caps to him and to his foils." Then Gallo said, "I shall go and tell the Pope, and I mean to procure for him one thousand golden crowns for the setting of this diamond." Accordingly, he hurried to the Pope and told him the whole story. Whereupon his holiness sent three times on that day to see if the ring was finished. At twenty-three o'clock, I took the ring to the palace, and since the doors were always open to me, I lifted the curtain gently and saw the Pope in private audience with the Marchese del Guasto. The Marquis must have been pressing something on the Pope, which he was unwilling to perform, for I heard him say, "I tell you, no." It is my business to remain neutral, and nothing else. I was retiring as quickly as I could when the Pope himself called me back. So I entered the room and presented the diamond ring, upon which he drew me aside, and the Marquis retired to a distance. While looking at the diamond, the Pope whispered to me, "Benvenuto, begin some conversation with me on a subject which shall seem important." And do not stop talking so long as the marquis remains in this room. Then he took to walking up and down, and the occasion making for my advantage. I was very glad to discourse with him upon the methods I had used to tint the stone, 
the Marquis remained standing apart, leaning against a piece of tapestry, and now he balanced himself about on one foot, now on the other. The subject I had chosen to discourse upon was of such importance, if fully treated, that I could have talked about it at least three hours. The Pope was entertained to such a degree that he forgot the annoyance of the Marquis standing there. I seasoned what I had to say with that part of natural philosophy which belongs to our profession, and so having spoken for near upon an hour, the Marquis grew tired of waiting and went off fuming. Then the Pope bestowed on me the most familiar caresses which can be imagined, and exclaimed, Have patience, my dear Benvenuto, for I will give you a better reward for your virtues than the thousand crowns which Gaio tells me your work is worth. On this I took my leave, and the Pope praised me in the presence of his household, among whom was the fellow Latino Juvenale, whom I have previously mentioned. This man, having become my enemy, assiduously strove to do me hurt, and noticing that the Pope talked of me with so much affection and warmth, he put in his word, there is no doubt at all that Benvenuto is a person of very remarkable genius, but while every one is naturally bound to feel more goodwill for his own countrymen than for others, still one ought to consider maturely what language it is right and proper to use when speaking of a pope. He has had the audacity to say that Pope Clement indeed was the handsomest sovereign that ever reigned, and no less gifted only that luck was always against him, and he says that your holiness is quite the opposite, that the tiara seems to weep for rage upon your head, that you look like a truss of straw with clothes on, and that there is nothing in you except good luck. These words reported by a man who knew most excellently how to say them had such force that they gained credit with the Pope. Far from having uttered them, such things had never come into my head. If the Pope could have done so without losing credit, he would certainly have taken fierce revenge upon me. But being a man of great tact and talent, he made a show of turning it off with a laugh. Nevertheless, he harbored in his heart a deep vindictive feeling against me, of which I was not slow to be aware, since I had no longer the same easy access to his apartments as formerly but found the greatest difficulty in procuring audience. As I had now for many years been familiar with the manners of the Roman court, I conceived that someone had done me a bad turn, and on making dexterous inquiries, I was told the whole, but not the name of my calumniator. I could not imagine who the man was. Had I but found him out, my vengeance would not have been measured by Troy weight. End of chapters 89 through 92 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Recording by P. Pats. This recording is in the public domain. Chapters 93 through 95 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simons, chapters 93 through 95. 93. I went on working at my book, and when I had finished it I took it to the Pope, who was in good truth unable to refrain from commending it greatly. I begged him to send me with it to the Emperor, as he had promised. He replied that he would do what he thought fit, and that I had performed my part of the business. So he gave orders that I should be well paid. These two pieces of work, on which I had spent upwards of two months, brought me in five hundred crowns. For the diamond I was paid one hundred and fifty crowns and no more. The rest was given me for the cover of the book, which, however, was worth more than a thousand, being enriched with multitudes of figures, arabesques, enamelings, and jewels. I took what I could get, and made my mind up to leave Rome without permission. The Pope, meanwhile, sent my book to the Emperor by the hand of his grandson, Signor Sforza. 
Upon accepting it, the emperor expressed great satisfaction, and immediately asked for me. Young Signor Sforza, who had received his instructions, said that I had been prevented by illness from coming. All this was reported to me. My preparations for the journey into France were made, and I wished to go alone, but was unable on account of a lad in my service called Ascanio. He was of very tender age, and the most admirable servant in the world. When I took him he had left a former master, named Francesco, a Spaniard and a goldsmith. I did not much like to take him, lest I should get into a quarrel with the Spaniard, and said to Ascanio, I do not want to have you, for fear of offending your master. He contrived that his master should write me a note informing me that I was free to take him. So he had been with me some months, and since he came to us both thin and pale of face, we called him the little old man. Indeed, I almost thought he was one, partly because he was so good a servant, and partly because he was so clever, that it seemed unlikely he should have such talent at thirteen years, which he affirmed his age to be. Now, to get back to the point from which I started, he improved in person during those few months, and, gaining in flesh, became the handsomest youth in Rome. Being the excellent servant which I have described, and showing marvellous aptitude for our art, I felt a warm and fatherly affection for him, and kept him clothed as if he had been my own son. When the boy perceived the improvement he had made, he esteemed it a good piece of luck that he had come into my hands, and he used frequently to go and thank his former master, who had been the cause of his prosperity. Now this man had a handsome young woman to wife, who said to him, Sir Jetto, that was what they called him when he lived with them, what have you been doing to become so handsome? Ascanio answered, Madonna Francesca, it is my master who has made me so handsome, and far more good to boot. In her petty, spiteful way, she took it very ill that Ascanio should speak so, and having no reputation for chastity, she contrived to caress the lad more, perhaps, than was quite seemly, which made me notice that he began to visit her more frequently than his wont had been. One day Ascanio took to beating one of our little shop-boys, who, when I came home from out of doors, complained to me with tears that Ascanio had knocked him about without any cause. Hearing this, I said to Ascanio, with cause or without cause, See, you never strike any one of my family, or else I'll make you feel how I can strike myself. He bandied words with me, which made me jump on him, and give him the severest drubbing, with both fists and feet, that he ever felt. As soon as he had escaped my clutches, he ran away without cape or cap, and for two days I did not know where he was, and took no care to find him. After that time a Spanish gentleman, called Don Diego, came to speak to me. He was the most generous man in the world. I had made, and was making, some things for him, which had brought us well acquainted. He told me that Ascanio had gone back to his old master, and asked me if I thought it proper to send him the cape and cap which I had given him. Thereupon I said that Francesco had behaved badly, and like a low-bred fellow, for if he had told me, when Ascanio first came back to him, that he was in his house, I should very willingly have given him leave. But now that he had kept him two days without informing me, I was resolved he should not have him and let him take care that I do not set eyes upon the lad in his house. This message was reported by Don Diego, but it only made Francesco laugh. The next morning I saw Ascanio working at some trifles in wire at his master's side. As I was passing he bowed to me, and his master almost laughed me in the face. He sent again to ask, through Don Diego, whether I would not give Ascanio back the clothes he had received from me, but if not, he did not mind, and Ascanio should not want for clothes. When I heard this, I turned to Don Diego and said, Don Diego, sir, in all your dealings you are the most liberal and worthy man I ever knew, but that Francesco is quite the opposite of you. He is nothing better than a worthless and dishonored renegade. Tell him from me that if he does not bring Ascanio here himself to my shop before the bell for vespers, I will assuredly kill him, and tell Ascanio that if he does not quit that house at the hour appointed for his master, I will treat him much in the same way. Don Diego made no answer, but went and inspired such terror in Francesco that he knew not what to do with himself. Ascanio, meanwhile, had gone to find his father, who had come to Rome from Tagliacozzo, his birthplace, and this man also, when he heard about the row, advised Francesco to bring Ascanio back to me. Francesco said to Ascanio, Go on your own account, and your father shall go with you. Don Diego put in, Francesco, I foresee that something very serious will happen, you know better than I do what a man Benvenuto is. Take the lad back courageously, and I will come with you. 
I had prepared myself and was pacing up and down the shop waiting for the bell to Vespers. My mind was made up to do one of the bloodiest deeds which I had ever attempted in my life. Just then arrived Don Diego, Francesco, Ascanio, and his father, whom I did not know. When Ascanio entered, I gazed at the whole company with eyes of rage, and Francesco, pale as death, began as follows. See here, I have brought back Ascanio, whom I kept with me, not thinking that I should offend you. Ascanio added humbly, Master, pardon me, I am at your disposal here, to do whatever you shall order. Then I said, Have you come to work out the time you promised me? He answered yes, and that he meant never to leave me. Then I turned and told the shop-boy he had beaten to hand him the bundle of clothes, and said to him, Here are all the clothes I gave you. Take with them your discharge, and go where you like. Don Diego stood astonished at this, which was quite the contrary of what he had expected, while Ascanio with his father besought me to pardon and take him back. On my asking who it was who spoke for him, he said it was his father, to whom, after many entreaties, I replied, Because you are his father, for your sake I will take him back. 94. I had formed the resolution, as I said a short while back, to go toward France, partly because I saw that the Pope did not hold me in the same esteem as formerly, my faithful service having been besmirched by lying tongues, and also because I feared lest those who had the power might play me some worse trick. So I was determined to seek better fortune in a foreign land, and wished to leave Rome without company or license. On the eve of my projected departure, I told my faithful friend Felice to make free use of all my effects during my absence, and in the case of my not returning, I left him everything I possessed. Now there was a Perugian workman in my employ, who had helped me on those commissions from the Pope, and after paying his wages, I told him he must leave my service. He begged me in reply to let him go with me, and said that he would come at his own charges. If I stopped to work for the King of France, it would certainly be better for me to have Italians by me, and in particular such persons as I knew to be capable of giving me assistance. His entreaties and arguments persuaded me to take him on the journey, in the manner he proposed. Ascanio, who was present at this debate, said, half in tears, When you took me back, I said I wished to remain with you my lifetime, and so I have it in my mind to do. I told him that nothing in the world would make me consent, but when I saw that the poor lad was preparing to follow on foot, I engaged a horse for him, too, put a small valise upon the crupper, and loaded myself with far more useless baggage than I should otherwise have taken. From home I travelled to Florence, from Florence to Bologna, from Bologna to Venice, and from Venice to Padua. There my dear friend Albertaccio del Bene made me leave the inn for his house, and next day I went to kiss the hand of Messer Pietro Bembo, who was not yet a cardinal. He received me with marks of the warmest affection which could be bestowed on any man. Then, turning to Albertaccio, he said, I want Benvenuto to stay here, with all his followers, even though they be a hundred men. Make then your mind up, if you want Benvenuto also, to stay here with me, for I do not mean elsewise to let you have him. Accordingly, I spent a very pleasant visit at the house of that most accomplished gentleman. He had a room prepared for me which would have been too grand for a cardinal, and always insisted upon my taking my meals beside him. Later on, he began to hint in very modest terms that he should greatly like me to take his portrait. I, who desired nothing in the world more, prepared some snow-white plaster in a little box, and set to work at once. The first day I spent two hours on end at my modelling, and blocked out the fine head of that eminent man with so much grace of manner that his lordship was fairly astounded. Now, though he was a man of profound erudition and without a rival in poetry, he understood nothing at all about my art. This made him think that I had finished when I had hardly begun, so that I could not make him comprehend that a long time it took to execute a thing of that sort thoroughly. At last I resolved to do it as well as I was able, and to spend the requisite time upon it, but since he wore his beard short after the Venetian fashion, I had great trouble in modelling ahead to my own satisfaction. However, I finished it, and judged it about the finest specimen I had produced in all the points pertaining to my art. Great was the astonishment of Messer Pietro, who conceived that I should have completed the wax and model in two hours and the steel in ten, when he found that I employed two hundred on the wax, and then was begging for leave to pursue my journey toward France. This threw him into much concern, and he implored me at least to design the reverse for his medal, which was to be a pegasus encircled with a wreath of myrtle. 
I performed my task in the space of some three hours, and gave it a fine air of elegance. He was exceedingly delighted, and said, "'This horse seems to me ten times more difficult to do than the little portrait on which you have bestowed so much pains. I cannot understand what made it such a labor. All the same, he kept entreating me to execute the piece in steel, exclaiming, "'For heaven's sake, do it! I know that, if you choose, you will get it finished quickly.' I told him that I was not willing to make it there, but promised without fail to take it in hand, wherever I might stop to work. While this debate was being carried on, I went to bargain for three horses, which I wanted on my travels, and he took care that a secret watch should be kept over my proceedings, for he had vast authority in Padua. Wherefore, when I proposed to pay for the horses, which were to cost five hundred ducats, their owner answered, "'Illustrious artist, I make you a present of the three horses.' I replied, It is not you who give them me, and from the generous donor I cannot accept them, seeing I have been unable to present him with any specimen of my craft. The good fellow said that, if I did not take them, I should get no other horses in Padua, and should have to make my journey on foot. Upon that I returned to the magnificent Messer Pietro, who affected to be ignorant of the affair, and only begged me with marks of kindness to remain in Padua. This was contrary to my intention, for I had quite resolved to set out. Therefore I had to accept the three horses, and with them we began our journey. 95. I chose the route through the Grissons, all other passes being unsafe on account of war. We crossed the mountains of the Alba and Berlina. It was the 8th of May, and the snow upon them lay in masses. At the utmost hazard of our lives we succeeded in surmounting those two alpine ridges, and when they had been traversed, we stopped at a place which, if I remember rightly, is called Valdista. There we took up quarters, and at nightfall there arrived a Florentine courier named Busbacca. I had heard him mentioned as a man of character and able in his profession, but I did not know that he had forfeited that reputation by his rogueries. When he saw me in the hostelry, he addressed me by my name, said he was going on business of importance to Lyon, and entreated me to lend him money for the journey. I said I had no money to lend, but that if he liked to join me, I would pay his expenses as far as Lyon. The rascal wept, and wheedled me with a long story, saying, If a poor courier employed on affairs of national consequence has fallen short of money, it is the duty of a man like you to assist him. Then he added that he was carrying things of the utmost importance from Messer Filippo Strozzi, and showing me a leather case for a cup he had with him, whispered in my ear that it held a goblet of silver which contained jewels to the value of many thousands of ducats, together with letters of vast consequence sent by Messer Filippo Strozzi. I told him that he ought to let me conceal the jewels about his own person, which would be much less dangerous than carrying them in the goblet. He might give that up to me, and its value being probably about ten crowns, I could supply him with twenty-five on the security. To these words the courier replied that he would go with me, since he could not do otherwise, for to give up the goblet would not be to his honour. Accordingly we struck the bargain so, and taking horse next morning, came to a lake between Valdista and Vesa. It is fifteen miles long when one reaches Vesa. On beholding the boats upon the lake, I took fright, because they are of pine, of no great size and no great thickness, loosely put together, and not even pitched. If I had not seen four German gentlemen, with their four horses, embarking in one of the same sort as ours, I should never have set my foot in it. Indeed, I should far more likely have turned tail, but when I saw their hair-brained recklessness, I took it into my head that those German waters would not drown folk, as ours do in Italy. However, my two young men kept saying to me, Benvenuto, it is surely dangerous to embark in this craft with four horses. I replied, You cowards! Do you not observe how those four gentlemen have taken boat before us, and are going on their way with laughter? If this were wine, indeed tis water, I should say that they were going gladly to drown themselves in it. But as it is water, I know well that they have no more pleasure than we have in drowning there. The lake was fifteen miles long and about three broad. On one side rose a mountain very tall and cavernous, on the other some flat land and grassy. When we had gone about four miles, it began to storm upon the lake, and our oarsmen asked us to help in rowing. This we did a while. I made gestures and directed them to land us on the farther shore. They said it was not possible, because there was not depth of water for the boat and there were shoals there, which would make it go to pieces and drown us all. And still they kept on urging us to help them. The boatmen shouted one to the other, calling for assistance. 
When I saw them thus dismayed, my horse being an intelligent animal, I arranged the bridle on his neck and took the end of the halter with my left hand. The horse, like most of his kind, being not devoid of reason, seemed to have an instinct of my intention, for, having turned his face towards the fresh grass, I meant that he should swim and draw me after him. Just at that moment a great wave broke over the boat. Ascanio shrieked out, "'Mercy! My father! Save me!' and wanted to throw himself upon my neck. Accordingly, I laid hand to my little dagger, and told them to do as I had shown them, seeing that the horses would save their lives as well, as I too hoped to escape with mine by the same means, but that if he tried to jump on me I should kill him. So we went forward several miles, in this great peril of our lives. End of chapters 93 through 95《Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simons, Chapters 96-99. 96. When we had reached the middle of the lake, we found a little bit of level ground where we could land, and I saw that those four German gentlemen had already come to shore there, but on our wishing to disembark, the boatmen would hear nothing of it. Then I said to my young men, Now is the time to show what stuff we are made of, so draw your swords and force these fellows to put us ashore. This we did, not, however, without difficulty, for they offered stubborn resistance. When at last we got to land, we had to climb that mountain for two miles, and it was more troublesome than getting up a ladder. I was completely clothed in mail, with big boots, and a gun in my hand, and it was raining as though the fountains of heavens were opened. Those devils, the German gentlemen, leading their little horses by the bridle, accomplished miracles of agility, but our animals were not up to the business, and we burst with the fatigue of making them ascend that hill of difficulty. We had climbed a little way, when Ascanio's horse, an excellent beast of Hungarian race, made a false step. He was going a few paces before the coursier Busbaca, to whom Ascanio had given his lance to carry for him. Well, the path was so bad that the horse stumbled, and went on scrambling backwards, without being able to regain his footing, till he stuck upon the point of the lance, which that rogue of a courier had not the wit to keep out of his way. The weapon passed right through his throat, and when my other workmen went to help him, his horse also, a black-coloured animal, slipped towards the lake, and held on by some shrub which offered but slight support. This horse was carrying a pair of saddle-bags, which contained all my money and other valuables. I cried out to the young man to save his own life, and to let the horse go to the devil. The fall was more than a mile of precipitous descent above the waters of the lake. Just below the place our boatmen had taken up their station, so that if the horse fell, he would have come precisely on them. I was ahead of the whole company, and we waited to see the horse plunge headlong. It seemed certain that he must go to perdition. During this I said to my young men, Be under no concern, let us save our lives, and give thanks to God for all that happens. I am only distressed for that poor fellow Busbaca, who tied his goblet and his jewels to the value of several thousand of ducats on the horse's saddle-bow, thinking that the safest place." My things are but a few hundred crowns, and I am in no fear whatever, if only I get God's protection. Then Busbaca cried out, I am not sorry for my own loss, but for yours. Why, I said to him, are you sorry for my trifles, and not for all that property of yours? He answered, I will tell you in God's name, in these circumstances and at the point of peril we have reached, truth must be spoken. I know that yours are crowns, and so are in good sooth. But that case in which I said I had so many jewels and other lies is all full of caviar. On hearing this I could not hold from laughing. My young man laughed too, and he began to cry. The horse extricated itself by a great effort when we had given it up for lost. So then, still laughing, we summoned our forces, and bent ourselves to making the ascent. The four German gentlemen, having gained the top before us, sent down some folk who gave us aid. Thus at length we reached our lodging in the wilderness. Here, being wet to the skin, tired out and famished, we were most agreeably entertained. We dried ourselves, took rest, and satisfied our hunger, while certain wild herbs were applied to the wounded horse. They pointed out to us the plant in question, of which the hedges were full, 
and we were told that if the wound was kept continually plugged with its leaves, the beast would not only recover, but would serve us just as if it had sustained no injury. We proceeded to do as they advised. Then, having thanked those gentlemen and feeling ourselves entirely refreshed, we quitted the place, and travelled onwards, thanking God for saving us from such great perils. 97. We reached a town beyond Vesa, where we passed the night, and heard a watchman through all the hours singing very agreeably, for the houses of that city being built of pine wood, it was the watchman's only business to warn folk against fire. Busbaka's nerves had been quite shaken by the day's adventure. Accordingly, each hour when the watchman sang, he called out in his sleep, "'Oh, God, I am drowning!' That was because of the fright he had had, and besides, he had got drunk in the evening, because he would sit boozing with the Germans who were there, and sometimes he cried, "'I am burning!' and sometimes I am drowning, and at other times he thought he was in hell, and tortured with that caviar suspended round his throat. This night was so amusing that it turned all our troubles into laughter. In the morning we rose with very fine weather, and went to dine in a smiling little place called Laka. Here we obtained excellent entertainment, and then engaged guides, who were returning to a town called Zurich. The guide who attended us went along the diked bank of a lake, there was no other road, and the dike itself was covered with water, so that the reckless fellow slipped, and fell together with his horse beneath the water. I, who was but a few steps behind him, stopped my horse, and waited to see the donkey get out of the water. Just as if nothing had happened, he began to sing again, and made signs to me to follow. I broke away upon the right hand, and got through some hedges, making my young men and Busbaka take that way. The guide shouted in German that if the folk of those parts saw me they would put me to death. However, we passed forward and escaped that other storm. So we arrived at Zurich, a marvellous city, bright and polished like a little gem. There we rested a whole day, then left betimes one morning, and reached another fair city called Solotorno. Thence we came to Usana, from Usana to Ginevra, from Ginevra to Lyon, always singing and laughing. At Lyon I rested four days, and had much pleasant intercourse with some of my friends there. I was also repaid what I had spent upon Busbaca. Afterwards I set out upon the road to Paris. This was a delightful journey, except that when we reached Palisa, a band of venturers tried to murder us, and it was only by great courage and address that we got free from them. From that point onwards we travelled to Paris without the least trouble in the world. Always singing and laughing, we arrived safely at our destination. 98. After taking some repose in Paris, I went to visit the painter Rosso, who was in the king's service. I thought to find him one of the sincerest friends I had in the world, seeing that in Rome I had done him the greatest benefits which one man can confer upon another. As these may be described briefly, I will not here omit their mention, in order to expose the shamelessness of such ingratitude. While he was in Rome, then being a man given to backbiting, he spoke so ill of Raffaello da Urbino's works, that the pupils of the latter were quite resolved to murder him. From this peril I saved him by keeping a close watch upon him day and night. Again the evil things said by Rosso against San Gallo, that excellent architect, caused the latter to get work taken from him which he had previously procured for him from Messer Agnolo de Sessi, and after this San Gallo used his influence so strenuously against him that he must have been brought to the verge of starvation, had I not pitied his condition, and lent him some scores of crowns to live upon. So then, not having been repaid, and knowing that he held employment under the king, I went, as I have said, to look him up. I did not merely expect him to discharge his debt, but also to show me favour and to assist in placing me in that great monarch's service. When Rosso set eyes on me, his countenance changed suddenly, and he exclaimed, "'Benvenuto, you have taken this long journey at great charges to your loss.' especially at this present time, when all men's thoughts are occupied with war, and not with the bagatelles of our profession. I replied that I had brought money enough to take me back to Rome, as I had come to Paris, and that this was not the proper return for the pains I had endured for him, and that now I began to believe what Maestro Antonio de Sangallo said of him. When he tried to turn the matter into jest on this exposure of his baseness, I showed him a letter of exchange for five hundred crowns upon Ricciardo del Beni, then the rascal was ashamed, and wanted to detain me almost by force, but I laughed at him, and took my leave in the company of a painter whom I found there. This man was called Squazella. 
He, too, was a Florentine, and I went to lodge in his house, with three horses and three servants, at so much per week. He treated me very well, and was even better paid by me in return. Afterwards I sought audience of the king, through the introduction of his treasurer, Messer Giuliano Buonacorti. I met, however, with considerable delays, owing, as I did not then know, to the strenuous exertions Rosso made against my admission to his majesty. When Messer Giuliano became aware of this, he took me down at once to Fontano Bilio, and brought me into the presence of the king, who granted me a whole hour of very gracious audience. Since he was then on the point of setting out for Lyon, he told Messer Giuliano to take me with him, adding that on the journey we could discuss some works of art his majesty had it in his head to execute. Accordingly I followed the court, and on the way I entered into close relations with the cardinal of Ferrara, who had not at that period obtained the hat. Every evening I used to hold long conversations with the cardinal, in the course of which his lordship advised me to remain at an abbey of his in Lyon, and there to abide at ease until the king returned from this campaign, adding that he was going on to Grenoble, and that I should enjoy every convenience in the abbey. When we reached Lyon I was already ill, and my lad Ascanio had taken a quart in fever. The French in their court were both grown irksome to me, and I counted the hours till I could find myself again in Rome. On seeing my anxiety to return home, the cardinal gave me money sufficient for making him a silver basin and jug. So we took good horses, and set our faces in the direction of Rome, passing the Simplon, and travelling for some while in the company of certain Frenchmen. Ascanio, troubled by his courton, and I by a slow fever which I found it quite impossible to throw off. I had, moreover, got my stomach out of order to such an extent that for the space of four months, as I verily believe, I hardly ate one whole loaf of bread in the week, and great was my longing to reach Italy, being desirous to die there rather than in France. 99. When we had crossed the mountains of the Simplon, we came to a river near a place called Indevedro. It was broad and very deep, spanned by a long, narrow bridge without ramparts. That morning a thick white frost had fallen, and when I reached the bridge, riding before the rest, I recognized how dangerous it was, and bade my servants and young men dismount and lead their horses. So I got across without accident, and rode on, talking with one of the Frenchmen, whose condition was that of a gentleman. The other, who was a scrivener, lagged a little way behind, jeering the French gentleman and me because we had been so frightened by nothing at all as to give ourselves the trouble of walking. I turned round, and seeing him upon the middle of the bridge, begged him to come gently, since the place was very dangerous. The fellow, true to his French nature, cried out in French that I was a man of poor spirit, and that there was no danger whatsoever. While he spoke these words, and urged his horse forward, the animal suddenly slipped over the bridge, and fell, with legs in air, close to a huge rock there was there. Now, God is very often merciful to madmen, so the two beasts, human and equine, plunged together into a deep, wide pool, where both of them went down below the water. On seeing what had happened, I set off running at full speed, scrambled with much difficulty on the rock, and dangling over from it, seized the skirt of the scrivener's gown and pulled him up, for he was still submerged beneath the surface. He had drunk his belly full of water, and was within an ace of being drowned. I then, beholding him out of danger, congratulated the man upon my having been the means of rescuing his life. The fellow to this answered me in French, that I had done nothing, the important things to save were his writings, worth many scores of crowns, and these words he seemed to say in anger, dripping wet and spluttering the while. Thereupon I turned round to our guides, and ordered them to help the brute, adding that I would see them paid. One of them, with great address and trouble, set himself to the business, and picked up all the fellow's writings, so that he lost not one of them. The other guide refused to trouble himself by rendering any assistance. I ought here to say that we had made a purse up, and that I performed the part of paymaster. So when we reached the place I mentioned, and had dined, I drew some coins from the common purse, and gave them to the guide who helped draw him from the water. Thereupon the fellow called out that I might pay them out of my own pocket. He had no intention of giving the man more than what had been agreed on for his services as a guide. Upon this I retorted with insulting language. Then the other guide, who had done nothing, came up and demanded to be rewarded also. I told him that the one who had borne the cross deserved the recompense. He cried out that he would presently show me a cross which would make me repent. I replied that I would light a candle at that cross, 
which should, I hoped, make him be the first to weep his folly. The village we were in lay on the frontier between Venice and the Germans. So the guide ran off to bring the folk together, and came, followed by a crowd, with a boar-spear in his hand. Mounted on my good steed, I lowered the barrel of my arquebus, and turning to my comrades, cried, At the first shot I shall bring that fellow down. Do you likewise your duty, for these are highway robbers, who have used this little incident to contrive our murder. The innkeeper at whose house we had dined called one of the leaders, an imposing old man, and begged him to put a stop to the disorder, saying, This is a most courageous young man. You may cut him to pieces, but he will certainly kill a lot of you, and perhaps will escape your hands after doing all the mischief he is able. So matters calmed down, and the old man, their leader, said to me, Go in peace. You would not have much to boast of against us, even if you had a hundred men to back you. I recognized the truth of his words, and had indeed made up my mind to die among them. Therefore, when no further insults were cast at me, I shook my head and exclaimed, I should certainly have done my utmost to prove I am no statue, but a man of flesh and spirit. Then we resumed our journey, and that evening, at the first lodging we came to, settled our accounts together. There I parted forever from that beast of a Frenchman, remaining on very friendly terms with the other, who was a gentleman. Afterwards I reached Ferrara, with my three horses and no other company. Having dismounted, I went to court in order to pay my reverence to the duke, and gain permission to depart next morning for Laredo. When I had waited until two hours after nightfall, his excellency appeared. I kissed his hands, he received me with much courtesy, and ordered that water should be brought for me to wash my hands before eating. To this compliment I made a pleasant answer. Most excellent lord, it is now more than four months that I have eaten only just enough to keep life together. Knowing, therefore, that I could not enjoy the delicacies of your royal table, I will stay and talk to you while your excellency is supping. In this way we shall both have more pleasure than if I were to sup with you. Accordingly we entered into conversation, and prolonged it for the next three hours. At that time I took my leave, and when I got back to the inn, found a most excellent meal ready, for the duke had sent me the plates from his own banquet, together with some famous wine. Having now fasted two full hours beyond my usual hour for supping, I fell to with hearty appetite, and this was the first time since four months that I felt the power or will to eat. End of chapters 96 through 99《100 through 103 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Brody. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 100 through 103. Leaving Ferrara in the morning, I went to Santa Maria at Loreto, and thence, having performed my devotions, pursued the journey to Rome. There I found my most faithful Felice, to whom I abandoned my old shop with all its furniture and appurtenances, and opened another, much larger and roomier, next to Sugarello, the perfumer. I thought for certain the great King Francis would not have remembered me. Therefore I accepted commissions from several noblemen, and in the meanwhile began the basin and jug ordered by the Cardinal Ferrara. I had a crowd of workmen, and many large affairs on hand in gold and silver. Now the arrangement I had made with that Perugian workman was that he should write down all the monies which had been dispersed on his account, chiefly for clothes and diverse other sundries, and these, together with the costs of travelling, amounted to about seventy crowns. We agreed that he should discharge the debt by monthly payments of three crowns, and this he was well able to do, since he gained more than eight through me. At the end of two months the rascal decamped from my shop, leaving me in the lurch with a mass of business on my hands, and saying that he did not mean to pay me a farthing more. I was resolved to seek redress, but allowed myself to be persuaded to do so by the way of justice. At first I thought of lopping off an arm of his, and assuredly I should have done so if my friends had not told me that it was a mistake, seeing I should lose my money and perhaps roam too, a second time, for as much as blows cannot be measured, and that with the agreement I held of his I could at any moment have him taken up. 
I listened to their advice, though I should have liked to conduct the affair more freely. As a matter of fact, I sued him before the auditor of the camera, and gained by suit. In consequence of that decree, for which I waited several months, I had him thrown in prison. At the same time, I was overwhelmed with large commissions. Among others, I had to supply all the ornaments of gold and jewels for the wife of Signor Girolimo Orsino, father of Signor Paolo, who is now the son-in-law of our Duke Cosimo. These things I had nearly finished, yet others of greatest consequence were always coming in. I employed eight work people and worked day and night together with them, for the sake alike of honour and of gain. While I was engaged in prosecuting my affairs with so much vigour, there arrived a letter sent post haste to me by the Cardinal of Ferrara, which ran as follows: Benvenuto, our dear friend, during these last days the most Christian king here made mention of you. And said that he should like to have you in his service, whereto I answered that you had promised me, whenever I sent for you to serve His Majesty, that you would come at once. His Majesty then answered, "It is my will that provision for his journey, according to his merits, should be sent him," and immediately ordered his admiral to make me out an order for one thousand golden crowns upon the treasurer of the exchequer. The Cardinal de Gadi, who was present at this conversation. Advanced immediately and told His Majesty that it was not necessary to make these dispositions, seeing that he had sent you money enough, and that you were already on the journey. If then, as I think probable, the facts are quite contrary to those assertions of Cardinal Gaddi, reply to me without delay on the receipt of this letter, for I will undertake to gather up the fallen thread, and have the promised money given to you by this magnanimous king. Now let the world take notice, and all the folks that dwell in it. What power malignant stars with adverse fortune exercise upon us human beings! I had not spoken twice in my lifetime to that little simpleton of a cardinal de Gaddi, nor do I think that he meant by this bumptiousness of his to do me any harm, but only through light-headedness and senseless folly to make it seem as though he also held the affairs of artists whom the king was wanting under his own personal supervision, just as the cardinal of Ferrara did. But afterwards he was so stupid as to not tell me anything at all about the matter. Elsewise, it is certain that my wish to shield a silly mannikin from reproach, if only for our country's sake, would have made me find out some excuse to mend the bungling of his foolish self-conceit. Immediately upon the receipt of Cardinal Ferrara's letter, I answered that about Cardinal de Gaddi I knew absolutely nothing, and that even if he had made overtures of that kind to me, I should not have left Italy without informing his most reverend lordship. I also said that I had more to do in Rome than at any previous time, but that if His Most Christian Majesty made sign of wanting me, one word of his, communicated by so great a prince as His Most Reverend Lordship, would suffice to make me set off upon the spot, leaving all other concerns to take their chance. After I had sent my letter, that traitor, the Perugian workman, devised a piece of malice against me. Which succeeded at once, owing to the avarice of Pope Paolo di Farnese, but also far more to that of his bastard, who was then called Duke of Castro. The fellow in question informed one of Signor Pier Luigi's secretaries that, having been with me as workman several years, he was acquainted with all my affairs, on the strength of which he gave his word to Signor Pier Luigi that I was worth more than eighty thousand ducats. And that the greater part of this property consisted in jewels, which jewels belonged to the church, and that I had stolen them in Castel Sant'Angelo during the sack of Rome, and that all they had to do was catch me on the spot with secrecy. It so happened that I had been at work one morning, more than three hours before daybreak, upon the trousseau of the bride I mentioned. Then, while my shop was being opened and swept out, I put my cape on to go abroad and take the air, directing my steps along the Strada Giulia. I turned into Chiavica, and at this corner Crespino the Bargello, with all his constables, made up to me and said, "You are the Pope's prisoner." I answered, "Crespino, you have mistaken your man." "No," said Crespino, "you are the artist Benvenuto, and I know you well. And I have to take you to the castle of Sant'Angelo, where lords go, and men of accomplishments, your peers." Upon that, four of his under officers rushed on me. And would have seized by force a dagger which I wore and some rings I carried on my finger, but Crespino rebuked them. Not a man of you shall touch him. It's quite enough if you perform your duty and see that he does not escape me. 
Then he came up and begged me with words of courtesy to surrender my arms. While I was engaged in doing this, it crossed my mind that exactly on that very spot I had assassinated Pompeo. They took me straightway to the castle and locked me in an upper chamber in the keep. This was the first time that I ever smelled a prison up to the age I then had of thirty-seven years. Signor Pier Luigi, the Pope's son, had well considered the large sum for which I stood accused, so he begged the reversion of it from his most holy father and asked that he might have the money made out to himself. The Pope granted this willingly, adding that he would assist in its recovery. Consequently, after having kept me eight whole days in prison, they sent me up for examination, in order to put an end, if possible, to the affair. I was summoned into one of the great halls of the papal castle, a place of much dignity. My examiners were, first, the governor of Rome, called Messer Benedetto Conversini of Pistoia, who afterwards became bishop of Jersey. Secondly, the procurator fiscal, whose name I have forgotten, and thirdly, the judge in criminal cases, Messer Benedetto di Cagli. These three men began at first to question me in gentle terms, which afterwards they changed to words of considerable harshness and menace, apparently because I said to them, My lords, it is more than half an hour now since you have been pestering me with questions about fables and such things, so that one may truly say you are chattering, or prattling, by chattering I mean talking without reason, by prattling I mean talking nonsense. Therefore I beg you to tell me what it really is you want of me, and to let me hear from your lips reasonable speech, and not jabberings or nonsense. In reply to these words of mine, the governor, who was a Pistoian, could no longer disguise his furious temper, and began, "'You talk very confidently, or rather far too arrogantly, but let me tell you that I will bring your pride down lower than a spaniel by the words of reason you shall hear from me. These will be neither jabberings nor nonsense, as you have it, but shall form a chain of arguments to answer which you will be forced to tax the utmost of your wits.' Then he began to speak as follows. We know for certain that you were in Rome at the time when this unhappy city was subject to the calamity of the sack. At that time you were in this castle of Sant'Angelo, and were employed as a bombardier. Now, since you are a jeweller and goldsmith by trade, Pope Clement, being previously acquainted with you, and having by him no one else of your profession, called you into his secret councils, and made you unset all the jewels of his tiaras, meters, and rings, afterwards having confidence in you, he ordered you to sew them into his clothes. While thus engaged, you sequestered, unknown to his holiness, a portion of them, to the value of eighty thousand crowns. This has been told us by one of your workmen, to whom you disclose the matter in your braggadocio way. Now we tell you frankly that you must find the jewels, all their value, in money. After that, we will release you. When I heard these words, I could not hold from bursting into a great roar of laughter. And having laughed a while, I said, Thanks be to that God on this first occasion, when it pleased his divine majesty to imprison me, that I should not be imprisoned for some folly as the one is usually with young men. If what you say were the truth, I run no risk of having to submit to corporal punishment, since the authority of the law was suspended during that season. Indeed, I could excuse myself by saying that, like a faithful servant, I had kept back treasure to that amount for the sacred and holy apostolic church, waiting till I could restore it to a good pope, or else to those who might require it of me, as, for instance, you might, if this were verily the case. When I had spoken so far, the furious governor would not let me conclude my argument, but exclaimed in a burst of rage, Interpret the affair as you like best, Benvenuto. It is enough for us to have found the property which we had lost. Be quick about it, if you do not want us to use other measures than words. Then they began to rise and leave the chamber, but I stopped them, crying out, My lords, my examination is not over. Bring that to an end, and go then where you choose. They resumed their seats in a very angry temper, making as though they did not mean to listen to a word I said, and at the same time half relieved as though they had discovered all they wanted to know. I then began my speech to this effect. You are to know, my lords, that it is now some twenty years since I first came to Rome, and I have never been sent to prison here or elsewhere. On this that catchpole of a governor called out, And yet you have killed men enough here. I replied, It is you that say it, and not I. 
But if someone came to kill you, priest as you are, you would defend yourself, and if you killed him, the sanctity of the law would hold you justified. Therefore let me continue my defence if you wish to report the case to the Pope, and to judge me fairly. Once more I tell you that I have been a sojourner in this marvellous city Rome for nigh on twenty years, and here I have exercised my art in matters of vast importance. Knowing that this is the seat of Christ, I entertained a reasonable belief that when some temporal prince sought to inflict on me a mortal injury, I might have recourse to this holy chair and to this vicar of Christ, in confidence that he would surely uphold my cause. Ah me! Whither am I now to go? What prince is there who will protect me from this infamous assassination? Was it not your business, before you took me up, to find out what I had done with those eighty thousand ducats? Was it not your duty to inspect the record of the jewels which have been carefully inscribed by this apostolic camera through the last five hundred years? If you had discovered anything missing on that record, then you ought to have seized all my books together with myself. I tell you for a certainty that the registers, on which are written all the jewels of the Pope and the regalia, must be perfectly in order. You will not find there missing a single article of value which belonged to Pope Clement that has not been minutely noted. The one thing of the kind which occurs to me is this. When that poor man, Pope Clement, wanted to make terms with those thieves of the imperial army, who had robbed Rome and insulted the church, a certain Cesare Scatinaro, if I rightly remember his name, came to negotiate with him, and having nearly concluded the agreement, the Pope in his extremity, to show the man some mark of favour, let fall a diamond from his finger, which was worth about four thousand crowns, and when Scatinaro stooped to pick it up, the Pope told him to keep it for his sake. I was present at these transactions, and if the diamond of which I speak be missing, I have told you where it went, but I have the firmest conviction that you will find even this noted upon the register. After this you may blush at your leisure for having done such cruel injustice to a man like me, who has performed so many honourable services for the apostolic chair. I would have you know that, but for me, the morning when the imperial troops entered the Borgio, they would, without let or hindrance, have forced their way into the castle. It was I who, unrewarded for this act, betook myself with vigour to the guns which had been abandoned by the cannoneers and soldiers of the ordnance. I put spirit into my comrade Raffaello de Montelupo, the sculptor, who had also left his post and hid himself all frightened in a corner. Without stirring foot or finger, I woke his courage up, and he and I alone together slew so many of the enemies that the soldiers took another road. I it was who shot at Scatinaro when I saw him talking to Pope Clement without the slightest mark of reverence, nay, with the most revolting insolence, like the Lutheran and infidel he was. Pope Clement upon this had the castle searched to find and hang the man who did it. I it was who wounded the Prince of Orange in the head down there below, the trenches of the castle. Then, too, how many ornaments of silver, gold, and jewels, how many models and coins so beautiful and so esteemed have I not made for the holy church? Is this, then, the presumptuous priestly recompense you give a man who has served and loved you with such loyalty, with such mastery of art? Oh, go and report the whole that I have spoken to the Pope. Go and tell him that his jewels are all in his possession, that I never received from the church anything but wounds and stonings at that epoch of the sack, and that I have never reckoned upon any gain beyond some small remuneration from Pope Paolo, which he had promised me. Now, at last, I know what to think of his holiness, and you his ministers. While I was delivering this speech, they sat and listened in astonishment. Then, exchanging glances one with the other, and making signs of much surprise, they left me. All three went together to report what I had spoken to the Pope. The Pope felt some shame, and gave orders that all the records of the jewels should be diligently searched. When they had ascertained that none were missing, they left me in the castle, without saying a word more about it. Signor Pierluigi felt also that he had acted ill, and to end the affair they set about to contrive my death. End of chapter 100 through 103. Recording by Philippa Brody. Laspecola.blogspot.com. Chapters 104 through 107 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simons, Chapters 104 through 107. 104. During the agitations of this time, which I have just related, King Francis received news of how the Pope was keeping me in prison, and with what injustice. He had sent a certain gentleman of his, named Monsignor du Morlac, as his ambassador to Rome. To him, therefore, he now wrote, claiming me from the Pope as the man of his majesty. The Pope was a person of extraordinary sense and ability, but in this affair of mine he behaved weakly and unintelligently, for he made answer to the king's envoy that his majesty need pay me no attention, since I was a fellow who gave much trouble by fighting. Therefore he advised his majesty to leave me alone, adding that he kept me in prison for homicides and other deviltries which I had played. To this the king sent answer that justice in his realm was excellently maintained, for even as his majesty was wont to shower rewards and favors upon men of parts and virtue, so did he ever chastise the troublesome. His holiness had let me go, not caring for the service of the said Benvenuto, and the king, when he saw him in his realm, most willingly adopted him. Therefore he now asked for him in the quality of his own man. Such a demand was certainly one of the most honorable marks of favor which any man of my sort could desire, yet it proved the source of infinite annoyance and hurt to me. The Pope was roused to such fury by the jealous fear he had, lest I should go and tell the whole world how infamously I had been treated, that he kept revolving ways in which I might be put to death without injury to his own credit. The Castellan of St. Angelo was one of our Florentines, called Messer Giorgio, a knight of the Ugolini family. This worthy man showed me the greatest courtesy, and let me go free about the castle on parole. He was well aware how greatly I had been wronged, and when I wanted to give security for leave to walk about the castle, he replied that, though he could not take that, seeing the Pope set too much importance upon my affair, yet he would frankly trust my word, because he was informed by every one what a worthy man I was. So I passed my parole, and he granted me conveniences for working at my trade. I then, reflecting that the Pope's anger against me must subside, as well because of my innocence as because of the favor shown me by the king, kept my shop in Rome open, while Ascanio, my prentice, came to the castle and brought me things to work at. I could not indeed do much, feeling myself imprisoned so unjustly, yet I made a virtue of necessity, and bore my adverse fortune with as light a heart as I was able. I had secured the attachment of all the guards and many soldiers of the castle. Now the Pope used to come at times to sup there, and on those occasions no watch was kept, but the place stood open like an ordinary palace. Consequently, while the Pope was there, the prisoners used to be shut up with great precautions. None such, however, were taken with me, who had the license to go where I liked, even at those times, about its precincts. Often then those soldiers told me that I ought to escape, and that they would aid and abet me, knowing as they did how greatly I had been wronged. I answered that I had given my parole to the castellan, who was a worthy man, and had done me such kind offices. One very brave and clever soldier used to say to me, My Benvenuto, you must know that a prisoner is not obliged, and cannot be obliged, to keep faith, any more than aught else which befits a free man. Do what I tell you, escape from that rascal of a pope and that bastard his son, for both are bent on having your life by villainy. I had, however, made up my mind rather to lose my life than to break the promise I had given that good man the Castellan. So I bore the extreme discomforts of my situation, and had for my companion of misery a friar of the Palavicina house, who was a very famous preacher. 105. This man had been arrested as a Lutheran. He was an excellent companion, but from the point of view of his religion I found him the biggest scoundrel in the world, to whom all kinds of vices were acceptable. His fine intellectual qualities won my admiration, but I hated his dirty vices, and frankly taxed him with them. This friar kept perpetually reminding me that I was in no wise bound to observe faith with the castellan, since I had become a prisoner. I replied to these arguments that he might be speaking the truth as a friar, but that as a man he spoke the contrary, for every one who called himself a man, and not a monk, was bound to keep his word under all circumstances in which he chanced to be. I, therefore, being a man, and not a monk, was not going to break the simple and loyal word which I had given. Seeing then that he could not sap my honor by the subtle and ingenious sophistries he so eloquently developed, 
the friar hit upon another way of tempting me. He allowed some days to pass, during which he read me the servants of Fra Girolimo Savonarola, and these he expanded with such lucidity and learning that his comment was even finer than the text. I remained in ecstasies of admiration, and there was nothing in the world I would not have done for him, except, as I have said, to break my promised word. When he saw the effect his talents had produced upon my mind, he thought of yet another method. Cautiously he began to ask what means I should have taken, supposing my jailers had locked me up, in order to set the dungeon doors open and effect my flight. I then, who wanted to display the sharpness of my wits to so ingenious a man, replied that I was quite sure of being able to open the most baffling locks and bars, far more those of our prison, to do which would be the same to me as eating a bit of new cheese. In order then to gain my secret, the friar now made light of these assertions, averring that persons who have gained some credit by their abilities are wont to talk big of things which, if they had to put their boasts in action, would speedily discredit them, and much to their dishonour. Himself had heard me speak so far from the truth, that he was inclined to think I should, when pushed to proof, end in a dishonourable failure. Upon this, feeling myself stung to the quick by that devil of a friar, I responded that I always made a practice of promising in words less than I could perform in deeds. What I had said about the keys was the merest trifle. In a few words I could make him understand that the matter was as I had told it. Then, all too heedlessly, I demonstrated the facility with which my assertions could be carried into act. He affected to pay little attention, but all the same he learned my lesson well by heart with keen intelligence. As I have said above, the worthy Castellan let me roam at pleasure over the whole fortress. Not even at night did he lock me in, as was the custom with the other prisoners. Moreover, he allowed me to employ myself as best I liked, with gold or silver, or with wax, according to my whim. So then I laboured several weeks at the basin ordered by Cardinal Ferrara, but the irksomeness of my imprisonment bred in me a disgust for such employment, and I took to modelling in wax some little figures of my fancy, for mere recreation. Of the wax which I used, the friar stole a piece, and with this he proceeded to get false keys made, upon the method I had heedlessly revealed to him. He had chosen for his accomplice a registrar named Luigi, a Paduan, who was in the Castellan's service. When the keys were ordered, the locksmith revealed their plot, and the Castellan, who came at times to see me in my chamber, noticing the wax which I was using, recognized it at once and exclaimed, It is true that this poor fellow Benvenuto has suffered a most grievous wrong. Yet he ought not to have dealt thus with me, for I have ever strained my sense of right to show him kindness. Now I shall keep him straightly under lock and key, and shall take good care to do him no more service." Accordingly, he had me shut up with disagreeable circumstances, among the worst of which were the words flung at me by some of his devoted servants, who were indeed extremely fond of me, but now, on this occasion, cast in my teeth all the kind offices the Castellan had done me. They came, in fact, to calling me ungrateful, light, and disloyal. One of them in particular used these injurious terms more insolently than was decent, whereupon I, being convinced of my innocence, retorted hotly that I had never broken faith and would maintain these words at the peril of my life, and that if he or any of his followers abused me so unjustly, I would fling the lie back in his throat. The man, intolerant of my rebuke, rushed to the castellan's room, and brought me the wax with the model of the keys. No sooner had I seen the wax than I told him that both he and I were in the right, but I begged him to procure for me an audience with the castellan, for I meant to explain frankly how the matter stood, which was of far more consequence than they imagined. The Castellan sent for me at once, and I told him the whole course of events. This made him arrest the friar, who betrayed the registrar, and the latter ran a risk of being hanged. However, the Castellan hushed the affair up, although it had reached the Pope's ears. He saved his registrar from the gallows, and gave me the same freedom as I had before. 106. When I saw how rigorously this affair was prosecuted, I began to think of my own concerns, and said, Supposing another of these storms should rise, and the man should lose confidence in me, I should then be under no obligation to him, and might wish to use my wits a little, which would certainly work their end better than those of that rascally friar. So I began to have new sheets of a coarse fabric brought me, and did not send the dirty ones away. When my servants asked for them, I bade them hold their tongues, saying I had given the sheets to some of those poor soldiers, and if the matter came to knowledge, the wretched fellows ran the risk of the galleys. 
This made my young men and attendants, especially Felice, to keep the secret of the sheets in all loyalty. I meanwhile set myself to emptying a straw mattress, the stuffing of which I burned, having a chimney in my prison. Out of the sheets I cut strips, the third of a cubit in breadth, and when I had made enough in my opinion to clear the great height of the central keep of San Angelo, I told my servants that I had given away what I wanted. They must now bring me others of a finer fabric, and I would always send back the dirty ones. This affair was presently forgotten. Now my workpeople and serving men were obliged to close my shop at the order of the Cardinals Santiquatro and Carnaro, who told me openly that the Pope would not hear of setting me at large, and that the great favours shown me by King Francis had done far more harm than good. It seems that the last words spoken from the King by Monsignor de Morlac had been to this effect, namely, that the Pope ought to hand me over to the ordinary judges of the court. If I had done wrong, he could chastise me, but otherwise it was but reason that he should set me at liberty. This message so irritated the Pope that he made up his mind to keep me a prisoner for life. At the same time the Castellan most certainly did his utmost to assist me. When my enemies perceived that my shop was closed, they lost no opportunity of taunting and reviling those servants and friends of mine who came to visit me in prison. It happened on one occasion that Ascanio, who came twice a day to visit me, asked to have a jacket cut out for him from a blue silk vest of mine I never used. I had only worn it once, on the occasion when I walked in procession. I replied that these were not the times, nor was I in the place to wear such clothes. The young man took my refusal of this miserable vest so ill that he told me he wanted to go home to Tagliacozzo. All in a rage, I answered that he could not please me better than by taking himself off, and he swore with passion he would never show his face to me again. When these words passed between us, we were walking round the keep of the castle. It happened that the castellan was also taking the air there, so just when we met his lordship, Ascanio said, I am going away, farewell for ever. I added, Forever is my wish too, and thus in sooth shall it be. I shall tell the sentinels not to let you pass again. Then, turning to the castellan, I begged him with all my heart to order the guards to keep Ascanio out, adding, This little peasant comes here to add to my great trouble. I entreat you, therefore, my lord, not to let him enter any more. The castellan was much grieved, because he knew him to be a lad of marvellous talents. He was, moreover, so fair a person that every one who once set eyes on him seemed bound to love him beyond measure. The boy went away weeping. That day he had with him a small scimitar, which it was at times his wont to carry hidden beneath his clothes. Leaving the castle then, and having his face wet with tears, he chanced to meet two of my chief enemies, Geronimo the Perugian and a certain Michel, goldsmiths both of them. Michel, being Geronimo's friend and Ascanio's enemy, called out, "'What is Ascanio crying for? Perhaps his father is dead. I mean, that father in the castle.' Ascanio answered on the instant, "'He is alive, but you shall die this minute.' Then, raising his hand, he struck two blows with the scimitar, both at the fellow's head. The first felled him to the earth, the second lopped three fingers off his right hand, though it was aimed at his head. He lay there like a dead man. The matter was at once reported to the Pope, who cried in great fury, "'Since the king wants him to be tried, go and give him three days to prepare his defence.' So they came and executed the commission which the Pope had given them. The excellent Castellan went off upon the spot to his holiness, and informed him that I was no accomplice in the matter, and that I had sent Ascanio about his business. So ably did he plead my case that he saved my life from this impending tempest. Ascanio, meanwhile, escaped to Tagliacozzo, to his home there, whence he wrote begging a thousand times my pardon, and acknowledging his wrong in adding troubles to my grave disaster, but protesting that if, through God's grace, I came out from the prison, he meant never to abandon me. I let him understand that he must mind his art, and that if God set me at large again I would certainly recall him. 107. The castellan was subject to a certain sickness, which came upon him every year and deprived him of his wits. The sign of its approach was that he kept continually talking, or rather jabbering, to no purpose. These humours took a different shape each year. One time he thought he was an oil jar, another time he thought he was a frog, and hopped about as frogs do, another time he thought he was dead, and then they had to bury him. Not a year passed but he got some such hypochondriac notions into his head. At this season he imagined he was a bat, and when he went abroad to take the air, he used to scream like bats in a high, thin tone, 
and then he would flap his hands and body as though he were about to fly. The doctors, when they saw the fit coming on him, and his old servants, gave him all the distractions they could think of, and since they had noticed that he derived much pleasure from my conversation, they were always fetching me to keep him company. At times the poor man detained me for four or five stricken hours without ever letting me cease talking. He used to keep me at his table, eating opposite to him, and never stopped chatting and making me chat, but during those discourses I contrived to make a good meal. He, poor man, could neither eat nor sleep, so that at last he wore me out. I was at the end of my strength, and sometimes, when I looked at him, I noticed that his eyeballs were rolling in a frightful manner, one looking one way and the other in another. He took it into his head to ask me whether I had ever had a fancy to fly. I answered that it had always been my ambition to do those things which offered the greatest difficulties to men, and that I had done them. As to flying, the god of nature had gifted me with a body well suited for running and leaping, far beyond the common average, and that with the talents I possessed for manual art, I felt sure I had the courage to try flying. He then inquired what methods I should use, to which I answered that, taking into consideration all flying creatures, and wishing to imitate by art what they derived from nature, none was so apt a model as the bat. No sooner had the poor man heard the name bat, which recalled the humour he was suffering under, than he cried at the top of his voice, He says true, he says true, the bat's the thing, the bat's the thing. Then he turned to me and said, Benvenuto, if one gave you the opportunity, should you have the heart to fly? I said if he would set me at liberty, I felt quite up to flying down to Prati, after making myself a pair of wings out of waxed linen. Thereupon he replied, I too should be prepared to take flight, but since the Pope has bidden me guard you as though you were his own eyes, and I know you are a clever devil who would certainly escape, I shall now have you locked up with a hundred keys in order to prevent you slipping through my fingers. I then began to implore him, and remind him that I might have fled but on account of the word which I had given him I would never have betrayed his trust. Therefore I begged him for the love of God, and by the kindness he had always shown me, not to add greater evils to the misery of my present situation. While I was pouring out these entreaties, he gave strict orders to have me bound and taken and locked up in prison. On seeing that it could not be helped, I told him before all his servants, Lock me well up, and keep a good watch on me, for I shall certainly contrive to escape." so they took and confined me with the utmost care. End of chapters 104 through 107。Chapters 108 through 111 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Eddington Simons, Chapters 108 through 111. Chapter 108. I then began to deliberate upon the best way of making my escape. No sooner had I been locked in than I went about exploring my prison and when I thought I had discovered how to get out of it, I pondered the means of descending from the lofty keep, for so the great round central tower is called. I took those new sheets of mine, which, as I have said already, I had cut in strips and sewn together. Then I reckoned up the quantity which would be sufficient for my purpose. Having made this estimate and put all things in order, I looked out a pair of pincers, which I had abstracted from a Savoyard, belonging to the guard of the castle. This man superintended the casks and cisterns. He also amused himself with carpentering. Now he possessed several pairs of pincers, among which was one, both big and heavy. I then, thinking it would suit my purpose, took it and hid it in my straw mattress. The time had now come for me to use it, so I began to try the nails, which kept the hinges of my door in place. The door was double, and the clinching of the nails could not be seen, so that when I attempted to draw one out, I met with the greatest trouble. In the end, however, I succeeded. When I had drawn the first nail, I besought me how to prevent its being noticed. For this purpose I mixed some rust, 
which I had scraped from old iron, with a little wax, obtaining exactly the same color as the heads of long nails which I had extracted. Then I set myself to counterfeit these heads and place them on the holdfasts. For each nail I extracted, I made a counterfeit in wax. I left the hinges attached to their doorposts at top and bottom by means of some of some nails that I had drawn. But I took care to cut these and replace them lightly, so that they only just supported the irons in the hinges. All this I performed with the greatest difficulty, because the castellan kept dreaming every night that I had escaped, which made him send from time to time to inspect my prison. The man who came had the title and behavior of a catchpole. He was called Bozza, and used always to bring with him another of the same sort, named Giovanni, and nicknamed Pedignone. The latter was a soldier, and Bozza a serving man. Giovanni never entered my prison without saying something offensive to me. He came from the district of Prato, and had been an apothecary in the town there. Every evening he minutely examined the holdfasts of the hinges on the whole chamber, and I used to say, Keep a good watch over me, for I am resolved by all means to escape. These words bred a great enmity between him and me, so that I was obliged to use precautions to conceal my tools, that is to say, my pincers, and a great big poniard and other appurtenances. All these I put away together in my mattress, where I also kept the strips of linen I had made. When day broke, I used immediately to sweep my room out, and though I am by nature a lover of cleanliness, at that time I kept myself unusually spick and span. After sweeping up, I made my bed as daintily as I could, laying flowers upon it, which a Savoyard used to bring me nearly every morning. He had the care of the cistern and the casks, and also amused himself with carpentering. It was from him I stole the pincers, which I used in order to draw out the nails from the holdfasts of the hinges. Chapter 109 Well, to return to the subject of my bed. When Bozza and Pedignone came, I always told them to give it a wide berth, so as not to dirty and spoil it for me. Now and then, just to irritate me, they would touch it lightly, upon which I cried, Ah, dirty cowards, I'll lay my hand on one of your swords there, and will do you a mischief that will make you wonder. Do you think you are fit to touch the bed of a man like me? When I chastise you, I shall not heed my own life, for I am certain to take yours. Let me alone, then, with my troubles and my tribulations, and don't give me more annoyance than I have already. If not, I shall make you see what a desperate man is able to do. These words they reported to the castellan, who gave them express orders never to go near my bed, and when they came to me, to come without swords, but for the rest to keep a watchful guard upon me. Having thus secured my bed from meddlers, I felt as though the main point was gained, for there lay all things needful to my venture. It happened on the evening of a certain feast day that the castellan was seriously indisposed. His humors grew extravagant. He kept repeating that he was a bat, and if they heard that Benvenuto had flown away, they must let him go to catch me up, since he could fly by night most certainly as well or better than myself. For it was thus he argued. Benvenuto is a counterfeit bat, but I am a real one, and since he is committed to my care, leave me to act, I shall be sure to catch him. He had passed several nights in this frenzy, and had worn out all his servants, whereof I received full information through diverse channels, but especially from the Savoyard, who was my friend at heart. On the evening of the feast day, then, I made my mind to escape come what might, and first I prayed most devoutly to God, imploring His Divine Majesty, to protect and succor me in that so perilous adventure. Afterwards I set to work at all the things I needed, and labored the whole of the night. It was two hours before daybreak, 
when at last I removed those hinges with the greatest toil. But the wooden panel itself, and the bolt too, offered such resistance, that I could not open the door. So I had to cut into the wood. Yet in the end I got it open, and shouldering the strips of linen, which I had rolled up like bundles of flax upon two sticks, I went forth and directed my steps towards the latrines of the keep. Spying from within two tiles upon the roof, I was able at once to clamber up with ease. I wore a white doublet with a pair of white hose and a pair of half-boots, into which I had stuck the poniard I have mentioned. After scaling to the roof, I took one end of my linen roll and attached it to a piece of antique tile which was built into the fortress wall. It happened to jut out scarcely four fingers. In order to fix the band, I gave it the form of a stirrup. When I had attached it to that piece of tile, I turned to God and said, Lord God, give aid to my good cause. You know that it is good. You see that I am aiding myself. Then I let myself go gently by degrees, supporting myself with the sinews of my arms, until I touched the ground. There was no moonshine, but the light of a fair open heaven. When I stood upon my feet on solid earth, I looked up at the vast height which I had descended with such spirit, and went gladly away, thinking I was free. But this was not the case, for the castellan on that side of the fortress had built two lofty walls, the space between which he used for stable and henyard. The place was barred with thick iron bolts outside. I was terribly disgusted to find there was no exit from this trap. But while I paced up and down debating what to do, I stumbled on a long pole which was covered up with straw. Not without great trouble I succeeded in placing it against the wall, and then swarmed up it by the force of my arms, until I reached the top. But since the wall ended in the sharp ridge, I had not strength enough to drag the pole up after me. Accordingly, I made my mind up to use a portion of the second roll of linen which I had there. The other was left hanging from the keep of the castle. So I cut a piece off, tied it to the pole, and clambered down the wall, enduring the utmost toil and fatigue. I was quite exhausted and had moreover flayed the inside of my hands, which bled freely. This compelled me to rest a while, and I bathed my hands in my own urine. When I saw that my strength was recovered, I advanced quickly toward the last rampart, which faces toward Prati. There I put my bundle of linen lines down upon the ground, meaning to fasten them round a battlement, and descend the lesser as I had the greater height. But no sooner had I placed the linen, that I became aware behind me of a sentinel, who was going the rounds. Seeing my designs interrupted, and my life in peril, I resolved to face the guard. This fellow, when he noticed my bold front, and that I was marching on him with weapon in hand, quickened his pace and gave me a wide berth. I had left my lines some little way behind, so I turned with hasty steps to regain them. And though I came within sight of another sentinel, he seemed as though he did not choose to take notice of me. Having found my lines, and attached them to the battlement, I let myself go. On the descent whether it was that I thought I had really come to earth, and relaxed my grasp to jump, or whether my hands were so tired that they could not keep their hold, at any rate I fell, struck my head in falling, and lay stunned, for more than an hour and a half, so far as I could judge. It was just upon daybreak, when the fresh breeze, which blows an hour before the sun, revived me. Yet I did not immediately recover my senses, for I thought my head had been cut off, and fancied that I was in purgatory. With time, little by little, my faculties returned, and I perceived that I was outside the castle, and in a flash remembered all my adventures. I was aware of the wound in my head, before I knew my leg was broken. For I put my hands up, and withdrew them, covered with blood. 
Then I searched the spot well, and judged and ascertained that I had sustained no injury of consequence there. But when I wanted to stand up, I discovered that my right leg was broken three inches above the heel. Not even this dismayed me. I drew forth my poniard with its scabbard. The latter had a metal point ending in a large ball, which had caused the fracture of my leg. For the bone, coming into violent contact with the ball, and not being able to bend, had snapped at that point. I threw the sheath away, and with the poniard cut a piece of the linen which I had left. Then I bound my leg up as well as I could, and crawled on all fours, with the poniard in my hand, towards the city gate. When I reached it I found it shut, but I noticed a stone just beneath the door, which did not appear to be very firmly fixed. This I attempted to dislodge, after setting my hands to it, and feeling it move, it easily gave away, and I drew it out. Through the gap thus made, I crept into the town. CHAPTER 110 I had crawled more than five hundred paces from the place where I fell to the gate by which I entered. No sooner had I got inside than some mastiff dogs set upon me and bit me badly. When they returned to the attack and worried me, I drew my poniard and wounded one of them so sharply that he howled aloud, and all the dogs, according to their nature, ran after him. I meanwhile made the best way I could on all fours, toward the church of the Trespontina. On arriving at the opening of the street, which leads to San Agnolo, I turned off in the direction of San Piero, and now the dawn had risen over me, and I felt myself in danger. When therefore I chanced to meet a water-carrier, driving his donkey, laden with full buckets, I called the fellow and begged him to carry me upon his back to the terrace by the steps of San Piero, adding, I am an unfortunate young man, who, while escaping from a window in a love adventure, have fallen and broken my leg. The place from which I made my exit is one of great importance, and if I am discovered, I run risk of being cut to pieces. So for heaven's sake lift me quickly, and I will give you a crown of gold." Saying this, I clapped my hand to my purse, where I had a good quantity. He took me up at once, hitched me on his back, and carried me to the raised terrace by the steps of San Piero. There I bade him leave me, saying he must run back to his donkey. I resumed my march, crawling always on all fours, and making for the palace of the Duchess, wife of Duke Ottavio, and daughter of the Emperor. She was his natural child, and had been married to Duke Alessandro. I chose her house for the refuge, because I was quite certain that many of my friends, who had come with that great princess from Florence, were tarrying there. Also because she had taken me into favor through something which the castellan had said in my behalf. Wishing to be of service to me, he told the Pope that I had saved the city more than a thousand crowns of damage, caused by heavy rain, on the occasion when the Duchess made her entrance into Rome. He related how he was in despair, and how I put heart into him, and went on to describe how I had pointed several large pieces of artillery in the direction where the clouds were thickest, and whence a deluge of water was already pouring. Then, when I began to fire, the rain stopped, and at the fourth discharge the sun shone out, and so I was the sole cause of the festival succeeding, to the joy of everybody. On hearing this narration, the Duchess said, That Benvenuto is one of the artists of merit, who enjoyed the goodwill of my late husband, Duke Alessandro, and I shall always hold them in mind, if an opportunity comes, of doing such men service. She also talked of me to Duke Ottavio. For these reasons I meant to go straight to the house of Her Excellency, which was a very fine palace, situated in Borgio Vecchio. I should have been quite safe from recapture by the Pope if I could have stayed there, 
but my exploits up to this point had been too marvellous for a human being, and God was unwilling to encourage my vainglory. Accordingly, for my own good, he chastised me a second time, worse even than the first. The cause of this was that while I was crawling on all fours up those steps, a servant of Cardinal Cornaro recognized me. His master was then lodging in the palace, so the servant ran up to his room and woke him, crying, Most Reverend Monsignor, your friend Benvenuto is down there. He has escaped from the castle, and is crawling on all fours, streaming with blood. To all appearances he has broken a leg, and we don't know whether he is going. The cardinal exclaimed at once, Run and carry him upon your back into my room here. When I arrived, he told me to be under no apprehension, and sent for the first physicians of Rome to take my case in hand. Among them was Maestro Giacomo of Perugia, a most excellent and able surgeon. He set the bone with dexterity, then bound the limb up, and bled me with his own hand. It happened that my veins were swollen far beyond their usual size, and he too wished to make a pretty wide incision. Accordingly, the blood sprang forth so copiously, and spurted with such force into his face, that he had to abandon the operation. He regarded this a very bad omen, and could hardly be prevailed upon to undertake my cure. Indeed, he often expressed a wish to leave me, remembering that he ran no little risk of punishment for having treated my case, or rather for having proceeded to end with it. The cardinal had me placed in a secret chamber, and went off immediately to beg me from the Pope. CHAPTER 111 During this while all Rome was in an uproar, for they had observed the bands of linen fastened to the great keep of the castle, and folk were running in crowds to behold so extraordinary a thing. The castellan had gone off into one of his worst fits of frenzy. In spite of all his servants, he insisted upon taking his flight also from the tower, saying that no one could recapture me except himself, if he were to fly after me. Messer Roberto Pucci, the father of Messer Pandolfo, having heard of the great event, went in person to inspect the place. Afterwards he came to the palace, where he met with Cardinal Cornaro, who told him exactly what had happened, and how I was lodged in one of his own chambers, and already in the doctor's hands. These two worthy men went together, and threw themselves upon their knees before the Pope. But he, before they could get a word out, cried aloud, I know all what you want of me. Messer Roberto Pucci then began, Most blessed father, we beg you for heaven's grace to give us up that unfortunate man. Surely his great talents entitled him to exceptional treatment. Moreover, he has displayed such audacity, blent with so much ingenuity, that his exploit might seem superhuman. We know not for what crimes your holiness has kept him so long in prison. However, if those crimes are too exorbitant, your holiness is wise and holy, and may your will be done unquestioned. Still, if they are such as can be condoned, we entreat you to pardon him for our sake. The Pope, when he heard this, felt shame and answered, I have kept him in prison at the request of some of my people, since he is a little too violent in his behavior. But recognizing his talents, and wishing to keep him near our person, we had intended to treat him so well that he should have no reason to return to France. I am very sorry to hear of this bad accident, tell him to mind his health, and when he is recovered, we will make it up to him for all his troubles. Those two excellent men returned and told me the good news they were bringing from the Pope. Meanwhile, the nobility of Rome, young, old, and all sorts, came to visit me. The castellan, out of his mind as he was, had himself carried to the Pope, and when he was in the presence of his holiness, began to cry out, and to say that if he did not send me back to prison, he would do him a great wrong. He escaped under peril which he gave me, 
Woe is me that he has flown away when he promised not to fly. The Pope said, laughing, Go, go, for I will give him back to you without fail. The Castellan then added, speaking to the Pope, Send the governor to him, to find out who helped him to escape, for if it is one of my men, I will hang him from the battlement whence Benvenuto leaped. On his departure the Pope called the governor, and said, smiling, That is a brave fellow, and his exploit is something marvellous. All the same, when I was a young man, I also descended from the fortress at that very spot. In so saying, the Pope spoke the truth, for he had been imprisoned in the castle for forging a brief at the time when he was abbreviated de parco majoris. Pope Alexander kept him confined for some length of time, and afterwards, his offence being of too ugly a nature, had resolved on cutting off his head. He postponed the execution, however, till after Corpus Domini, and Farnese, getting wind of the Pope's will, summoned Pietro Cevaluzzi with a lot of horses, and managed to corrupt some of the castle guards with money. Accordingly, upon the day of Corpus Domini, while the Pope was going in procession, Farnese got into a basket, and was let down by a rope to the ground. At that time the outer walls had not been built around the castle, only the great central tower existed, so that he had not the same enormous difficulty that I met with in escaping. Moreover, he had been in prison justly, and I against all equity. What he wanted was to brag before the governor, of having in his youth been spirited and brave, and it did not occur to him that he was calling attention to his own huge rogueries. He said then, Go and tell him to reveal his accomplice without apprehension to you. Be the man who he may be, since I have pardoned him, and this you may assure him without reservation. End of chapters 108 through 111《Chapters 112 through 116 of The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simons. Chapter 112 through 116. Chapter 112. So the governor came to see me. Two days before he had been made bishop of Jesse, and when he entered he said, Friend Benvenuto, although my office is wont to frighten men, I come to set your mind at rest, and to do this I have full authority from his holiness' own lips who told me how he also escaped from St. Angelo, but had many aids and much company, else he would not have been able to accomplish it. I swear by the sacraments which I carry on my person, for I was consecrated bishop two days since, that the Pope has set you free and pardoned you, and is very sorry for your accident. Attend to your health, and take all things for the best, for your imprisonment, which you certainly underwent without a shadow of guilt, will have been, of for your perpetual welfare. Henceforward you will tread down poverty, and will have to go back to France, wearing out your life in this place and in that. Tell me then frankly how the matter went, and who rendered you assistance. Afterwards take comfort, repose, and recover. I began at the beginning— and related the whole story exactly as it had happened, giving him the most minute countersigns, down to the water-carrier who bore me on his back. When the governor had heard the whole, he said, Of a surety these are two great exploits for one man alone. No one but you could have performed them. So he made me reach my hand forth, and said, Be of good courage, and comfort your heart for by this hand which I am holding you are free, and if you live shall live in happiness. 
while thus conversing with me he had kept a whole heap of great lords and noblemen waiting who were come to visit me saying one to the other let us go to see this man who works miracles so when he departed they stayed by me and one made me offers of kindness and another made me presents while i was being entertained this way the governor returned to the pope and reported all that i had said as chance would have it signor pier luigi the pope's son happened to be present and all the company gave signs of great astonishment his holiness remarked of a truth this is a marvellous exploit then pier luigi began to speak as follows most blessed father if you set that man free he will do something still more marvellous because he has by far too bold a spirit i will tell you another story about him which you do not know that benvenuto of yours before he was imprisoned came towards with a gentleman of cardinal santa fiore about some trifle which the latter had said to him now benvenuto's retort was so swaggeringly insolent that it amounted to throwing down a cartel the gentleman referred the matter to the cardinal who said that if he once laid hands on benvenuto he would soon clear his head of such folly when the fellow heard this he got a little fowling piece of his ready with which he is accustomed to hit a penny in the middle accordingly one day when the cardinal was looking out of a window benvenuto's shop being under the place of the cardinal he took his gun and pointed it upon the cardinal the cardinal however had been warned and presently withdrew benvenuto in order that his intention might escape notice aimed at a pigeon which was brooding high up in a hole of the palace and hit it exactly in the head a feat one would have thought incredible now let your holiness do what you think best about him i have discharged my duty by saying what i have it might even come into his head imagining that he had been wrongly imprisoned to fire upon your holiness indeed he is too truculent by far too confident in his own powers when he killed pompeo he gave him two stabs with a poniard in the throat in the midst of ten men who were guarding him then he escaped to their great shame and yet they were no inconsiderable persons chapter one hundred and thirteen while these words were being spoken the gentleman of santa fiore with whom i had that quarrel was present and confirmed to the pope what had been spoken by his son the pope swelled with rage but said nothing i shall now proceed to give my own version of the affair truly and honestly this gentleman came to me one day and showed me a little gold ring which had been discolored by quicksilver saying at the same time polish up this ring for me and be quick about it i was engaged at the moment upon jewel work of gold and gems of great importance besides i did not care to be ordered about so haughtily by a man i had never seen or spoken to so i replied that i did not happen to have by me the proper tool for cleaning up this ring and that he had better go to another goldsmith without further provocation he retorted that i was a donkey whereupon i said that he was not speaking the truth that i was a better man than he in every respect but that if he kept on irritating me i would give him harder kicks than any donkey could he related the matter to the cardinal and painted me as black as the devil in hell two days afterward i shot a wild pigeon in a cleft high up behind the palace the bird was brooding in that cleft and i had often seen a goldsmith named giovan francesco della tacca from milan fire at it but he never hit it on the day when i shot it the pigeon scarcely showed its head being suspicious because it had been so often fired at now this giovan francesco and i were rivals in shooting wildfowl and some gentlemen of my acquaintance who happened to be at my shop called my attention saying up there is giovan francesco della tacca's pigeon 
at which he has so often fired. Look now, the poor creature is so frightened that it hardly ventures to put its head out. I raised my eyes and said, That morsel of its head is quite enough for me to shoot it by. If it only stays till I can point my gun. The gentleman protested that even the man who invented firearms could not hit it. I replied, I bet a bottle of that excellent Greek wine, Palombo, the host keeps, that if it keeps quiet long enough for me to point my good bar cardo, so I used to call my gun, I will hit it in that portion of its head which it is showing. So I aimed my gun, elevating my arms, and using no other rest, and did what I promised, without thinking of the cardinal or any other person. On the contrary, I held the cardinal for my very good patron. Let the world, then, take notice, when fortune has the will to ruin a man, how many diverse ways she takes. The Pope, swelling with rage and grumbling, remained revolving what his son had told him. Chapter 114 Two days afterwards, the Cardinal Cornaro went to beg a bishopric, from the Pope for a gentleman of his, called Messer Andrea Santano. The Pope in truth had promised him a bishopric, and this being now vacant, the Cardinal reminded him of his word. The Pope acknowledged his obligation, but said that he too wanted a favour from his most reverend lordship, which was that he would give up Benvenuto to him. On this the Cardinal replied, Oh! If your holiness has pardoned him and set him free at my disposal, what will the world say of you and me? The Pope answered, I want Benvenuto, you want the bishopric. Let the world say what it chooses. The good cardinal entreated his holiness to give him the bishopric, and for the rest to think the matter over, and then to act according as his holiness decided. The Pope feeling a certain amount of shame at so wickedly breaking his word, took what seemed a middle course. I will send for Benvenuto, and in order to gratify the whim I have, will put him in those rooms which open on my private garden. There he can attend to his recovery, and I will not prevent any of his friends from coming to visit him. Moreover, I will defray his expenses until his caprice of mine has left me. The cardinal came home and sent the candidate for his this bishopric on the spot to inform me that the Pope was resolved to have me back, but that he meant to keep me in a ground-floor room in his private garden, where I could receive the visits of my friends, as I had done in his own house. I implored this Messer Andrea to ask the cardinal not to give me up to the pope, but to let me act on my own account. I would have myself wrapped up in a mattress, and carried to a safe place outside Rome. For if he gave me up to the pope, he would certainly be sending me to death. It is believed that when the cardinal heard my petition, he was not ill-disposed to grant it. But Messer Andrea, wanting to secure the bishopric, denounced me to the Pope, who sent at once and had me lodged in the ground-floor chamber of his private garden. The Cardinal sent me word not to eat the food provided for me by the Pope. He would supply me with provisions. Meanwhile I was to keep my spirits up, for he would work in my cause till I was set free. Matters being thus arranged, I received daily visits and generous offers from many great lords and gentlemen. Food came from the Pope, which I refused to touch, only eating that which came from Cardinal Cornaro, and thus I remained a while. I had among my friends a young Greek of the age of twenty-five years. He was extremely active in all physical exercises, and the best swordsman in Rome, rather poor-spirited, however, but loyal to the backbone honest and ready to believe what people told him. He had heard it said to that the Pope made known his intention of compensating me for all I had gone through. It is true that the Pope began by saying so, 
but he ended by saying quite the opposite. I then determined to confide in the young Greek, and said to him, Dearest brother, they are plotting my ruin, so now the time has come to help me. Do they imagine, when they heap those extraordinary favours on me, that I am not aware they are done to betray me? The worthy young man answered, My benvenuto, they say in Rome, that the Pope has bestowed on you an office, with an income of five hundred crowns. I beseech you, therefore, not to let those suspicions deprive you of so great a windfall. All the same, I begged him with clasped hands to aid me in escaping from that place, saying I knew well that the Pope of the sort, though he could do me much good if he chose, was really studying secretly, and to save appearances how he might best destroy me. Therefore we must be quick, and try to save me from his clutches. If my friend would get me out of that place by the means I meant to tell him, I should always regard him as the saviour of my life, and when occasion came, would lay it down for him with gladness. The poor young man shed tears and cried, Oh, my dear brother, though you are bringing destruction on your head, I cannot but fulfil your wishes. So explain your plan, and I will do whatever you may order. I'll bait much against my will. Accordingly, we came to an agreement, and I disclosed to him the details of my scheme, which was certain to have succeeded without difficulty. When I hoped that he was coming to execute it, he came and told me that for my own good he meant to disobey me, being convinced of the truth of what he had heard from men close to the Pope's person, who understood the real state of my affairs. Having nothing else to reply upon, I remained in despair and misery. This passed on the day of Corpus Domini, 1539. Chapter 115 After my conversation with the Greek, the whole day wore away, and at night there came abundant provisions from the kitchen of the Pope. The Cardinal Corranaro also sent good store of viands from his kitchen and some friends of mine being present when they arrived, I made them stay to supper, and enjoyed their society, keeping my leg in splints beneath the bedclothes. An hour after nightfall they left me, and two of my servants, having made me comfortable for the night, went to sleep in the antechamber. I had a dog, black as a mulberry, one of those hairy ones, who followed me admirably when I went out shooting, and never left my side. During the night he lay beneath my bed, and I had to call out at least three times to my servant to turn him out, because he howled so fearfully. When the servants entered, the dog flew at them and tried to bite them. They were frightened, and thought he must be mad, because he went on howling. In this way we passed the first four hours of the night. At the stroke of four, the Bargello came into my room with a band of constables. Then the dog sprang forth and flew at them with such fury, tearing their capes and hose, that in their fright they fancied he was mad. But the Bargello, like an experienced person, told them, It is the nature of good dogs to divine and foretell the mischance coming on their masters. Two of you take sticks and beat the dog off, while the other strap Benvenuto on this chair. Then carry him to the place you wot off. It was, as I have said, the night after Corpus Domini, and about four o'clock. The officers carried me, well shut up and covered, and four of them went in front, making the few passengers, who were still abroad, get out of the way. So they bore me to Torre di Nona, such is the name of the place, and put me in the condemned cell. I was left upon a wretched mattress, under the care of a guard, who kept all night mourning over my bad luck, and saying to me, Alas, poor Benvenuto, what have you done to those great folk? I could now form a very good opinion of what was going to happen to me, 
partly by the place in which I found myself, and also by what the man had told me. During a portion of that night I kept racking my brains, what the cause could be, why God thought fit to try me so, and not being able to discover it, I was violently agitated in my soul. The guard did the best he could to comfort me, but I begged him for the love of God to stop talking, seeing I should be better able to compose myself alone in quiet. He promised to do as I asked, and then I turned my whole heart to God, devoutly entreating him to deign to make me into his kingdom. I had it is true, murmured against my lot, because it seemed to me that, so far as human laws go, my departure from the world in this way would be too unjust. It is true also that I had committed homicides, but his vicar had called me from my native city, and pardoned me by the authority he had from him and from the laws. And what I had done had all been done in defence of the body which his majesty had lent me. So I could not admit that I deserved the death according to the dispensation, under which man dwells here. But it seemed that what was happening to me was the same as what happens to unlucky people in the street, when a stone falls from some great height upon their head and kills them. This we see clearly to be the influence of the stars, not indeed that the stars conspire to do as good or evil, but the effect results from their conjunctions, to which we are subordinated. At the same time I know that I am possessed of free will, and if I could exert the face of a saint, I am sure that the angels of heaven would bear me from this dungeon, and relieve me of all my afflictions, yet inasmuch as God has not deemed me worthy of such miracles. I conclude that those celestial influences must be wreaking their malignity upon me. In this long struggle of the soul I spent some time. Then I found comfort, and fell presently asleep. CHAPTER 116 When the day dawned, the guard woke me up and said, O oh, unfortunate but worthy man, you have no more time to go on sleeping, for one is waiting here to give you evil news. I answered, the sooner I escape from this earthly prison, the happier shall I be, especially as I am sure my soul is saved, and that I am going to an undeserved death. Christ, the glorious and divine, elects me to the company of his disciples and friends, who, like himself, were condemned to die unjustly. I too am sentenced to an unjust death, and I thank God with humility for this sign of grace." Why does not the man come forward who has to pronounce my doom? The guard replied, He is too grieved for you, and sheds tears. Then I called him by his name of Messer Benedetto da Cagli, and cried, Come forward, Messer Benedetto, my friend, for now I am resolved and in good frame of mind. Far greater glory is it for me to die unjustly, than if I had deserved this fate. Come forward, I beg, and let me have a priest, in order that I may speak a couple of words with him. I do not indeed stand in need of this, for I have already made my heart's confession to my Lord God, yet I should like to observe the ordinances of our Holy Mother Church. For though she has done me this abominable wrong, I pardon her with all my soul. So come, friend Messer Benedetto, and dispatch my business before I lose control over my better instincts. After I had uttered these words, the worthy man told the guard to lock the door, because nothing could be done without his presence. He then repaired to the house of Signor Pier Luigi's wife, who happened to be in company with the Duchess, of whom I spoke above. Presenting himself before them both, he spoke as follows. My most illustrious mistress, I entreat you for the love of God to tell the Pope that he must send someone else to pronounce sentence upon Benvenuto 
and perform my office. I renounce the task, and am quite decided not to carry it through. Then, sighing, he departed with the strongest signs of inward sorrow. The Duchess, who was present, frowned and said, So this is the fine justice dealt out here in Rome by God's vicar. The Duke, my late husband, particularly esteemed this man for his good qualities and eminent abilities. He was unwilling to let him return to Rome, and would gladly have kept him close to his own person. Upon this she retired, muttering words of indignation and displeasure. Signor Pier Luigi's wife, who was called Signora Gerolima, betook herself to the Pope, and threw herself upon her knees before him, in the presence of several cardinals. She pleaded my cause so warmly that she woke the Pope to shame, whereupon he said, For your sake we will leave him quiet, yet you must know that we had no ill will against him. These words he spoke because of the cardinals who were around him, and had listened to the eloquence of that brave-spirited lady. Meanwhile I abode in extreme discomfort, and my heart kept thumping against my ribs. Not less was the discomfort of the men appointed to discharge the evil business of my execution. But when the hour for dinner was already past, they betook themselves to their several affairs, and my meal was also served me. This filled me with a glad astonishment, and I exclaimed, For once, Truth has been stronger than the malice of the stars. I pray God, therefore, that if it be his pleasure, he will save me from this fearful peril. Then I fell to eating, with the same stout heart for my salvation, as I had previously prepared for my perdition. I dined well, and afterwards remained without seeing or hearing any one, until an hour after nightfall. At that time the Bargello arrived with a large part of his guard, and had me replaced in the chair which brought me on the previous evening to the prison. He spoke very kindly to me, bidding me be under no apprehension, and bade his constables take good care not to strike against my broken leg, but to treat me as though I were the apple of their eye. The men obeyed, and brought me to the castle, whence I had escaped. Then, when we had mounted to the keep, they left me shut up in a dungeon, opening upon a little court there is there. End of chapters 112 through 116this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simons. Chapters 117 through 121. Chapter 117. The Castellan, meanwhile ill and afflicted as he was, had himself transported to my prison, and exclaimed, "'You see that I have recaptured you.' "'Yes,' said I, "'but you see that I escaped, as I told you I would. And if I had not been sold by a Venetian cardinal, under papal guarantee, for the price of a bishopric, the Pope a Roman and a Farnese, and both of them have scratched with impious hands the face of the most sacred laws,' you would not have recovered me. But now that they have opened this vile way of dealing, do you the worst you can in your turn. I care for nothing in the world. The wretched man began shouting at the top of his voice, Ah, woe is me, woe is me! It is all the same to this fellow, whether he lives or dies, and behold, he is more fiery than when he was in health. Put him down there below the garden, and do not speak to me of him again, for he is the destined cause of my death. So I was taken into a gloomy dungeon below the level of a garden, 
which swam with water, and was full of big spiders and many venomous worms. They flung me a wretched mattress of coarse hemp, gave me no supper, and locked four doors upon me. In that condition I abode until the nineteenth hour of the following day. Then I received food, and I requested my jailers to give me some of my books to read. None of them spoke a word, but they referred my prayer to the unfortunate Castellan, who had made inquiries concerning what I said. Next morning they brought me an Italian Bible, which belonged to me, and a copy of the Chronicles of Giovanni Villani. When I asked for certain other of my books, I was told that I could have no more, and that I had got too many already. Thus, then, I continued to exist in misery upon that rotten mattress, which in three days soaked up water like a sponge. I could hardly stir because of my broken leg, and when I had to get out of bed to obey a call of nature, I crawled on all fours with extreme distress, in order not to fall the place I slept in. For one hour and a half each day I got a little glimmering of light, which penetrated that unhappy cavern through a very narrow aperture. Only for so short a space of time could I read. The rest of the day and night I abode in darkness, enduring my lot, nor ever without meditations upon God and on our human frailty. I thought it certain that a few more days would put an end of my unlucky life in that sad place and in that miserable manner. Nevertheless, as well as I was able, I comforted my soul by calling to mind how much more painful it would have been, on passing from this life, to have suffered that unimaginable horror of the hangman's knife. Now being as I was, I should depart with the unedance of sleepiness, which robbed death of half its former terrors. Little by little I felt my vital forces waning, until at last my vigorous temperament had become adapted to that purgatory. When I felt it quite acclimatized, I resolved to put up with all those indescribable discomforts, so long as it held out. CHAPTER 118 I began the Bible from the commencement, reading and reflecting on it so devoutly, and finding in it such deep treasures of delight, that if I had been able, I should have done naught else but study it. However, light was wanting, and the thought of all my troubles kept recurring and gnawing at me in the darkness, until I often made my mind up to put an end somehow to my own life. They did not allow me a knife, however, and so it was no easy matter to commit suicide. Once, notwithstanding, I took and propped a wooden pole I found there, in position like a trap. I meant to make it topple over on my head, and it would certainly have dashed my brains out. But when I had arranged the whole machine, and was approaching to put it in motion, just at the moment of my setting my hand to it, I was seized by an invisible power and flung four cubits from the spot, in such a terror that I lay half dead. Like that I remained, from dawn until the nineteenth hour, when they brought me food. The jailers must have visited my cell several times without my taking notice of them, for when at last I heard them, Captain Sandrino Monaldi had entered, and I heard him saying, Ah, unhappy man! Behold the end! to which so rare a genius has come. Roused by these words, I opened my eyes, and caught sight of priests, with long gowns on their backs, who were saying, Oh, you told us he was dead. Botza replied, Dead I found him, and therefore I told you so. Then they lifted me from where I lay, and after shaking up the mattress, which was now as soppy as a dish of macaroni, they flung it outside the dungeon. The castellan, when these things were reported to him, sent me another mattress. Thereafter, when I searched my memory to find what could have diverted me from that design of suicide, I came to the conclusion that it must have been some power divine and my good guardian angel. Chapter 119 
During the following night there appeared to me in dreams a marvellous being, in the form of the most lovely youth, who cried, as though he wanted to reprove me, Knowest thou who lends thee that body, which thou wouldst have spoiled before its time? I seemed to answer that I recognized all things pertaining to me as gifts from the God of nature. So then, he said, thou hast contempt for his handiwork. Through this thy will to spoil it. Commit thyself unto his guidance, and lose not hope in his great goodness. Much more, he added, in words of marvellous efficacy, and thousands part of which I cannot now remember. I began to consider that the angel of my vision spoke the truth, so I cast my eyes around the prison, and saw some scraps of rotten brick, with the fragments of which, rubbing one against the other, I composed a paste. Then, creeping on all fours, as I was compelled to go, I crawled up to an angle of my dungeon door, and gnaved a splinter from it with my teeth. Having achieved this feat, I waited till the light came on my prison. That was from the hour of twenty and a half to twenty-one and a half. When it arrived, I began to write, the best I could, on some blank pages in my Bible, and rebuked the regions of my intellectual self, for being too impatient to endure this life. They replied to my body with excuses drawn from all that they had suffered, and the body gave them hope of better fortune. To this effect, then, by way of dialogue, I wrote as follows. Benvenuto in the body. Afflicted regions of my soul, ah, cruel ye, have ye such hate of life? The spirits of his soul. If heaven against you roll, who stands for us, who saves us in the strife, let us, oh, let us go toward better life. Benvenuto. Nay, go not yet a while. Ye shall be happier and lighter far. Heaven gives this hope than ye were ever yet. The Spirits We will remain some little while, if only by great God you promised are, such grace that no worse woes on us be set. After this I recovered strength, and when I had heartened up myself, I continued reading in the Bible, and my eyes became so used to that darkness that I could now read for three hours instead of the bare hour and a half. I was able to employ before. With profound astonishment, I dwelt upon the force of God's Spirit in those men of great simplicity, who believed so fervently that he would bring all their heart's desire to pass. I then proceeded to reckon in my own case, too, on God's assistance, both because of his divine power and mercy, and also because of my own innocence, and at all hours, Sometimes in prayer, and sometimes in communion with God, I abode in those high thoughts of Him. There flowed into my soul so powerful a delight from these reflections upon God, that I took no further thought for all the anguish I had suffered, but rather spent the day in singing psalms and diverse other compositions on the theme of His divinity. I was greatly troubled, however, by one particular annoyance. My nails had grown so long that I could not touch my body without wounding it. I could not dress myself, but what they turned inside or out, to my great torment. Moreover, my teeth began to perish in my mouth. I became aware of this, because the dead teeth, being pushed on by the living ones, my gums were gradually perforated, and the points of the roots pierced through the tops of their cases. When I was aware of this, I used to pull one out, as though it were a weapon from a scabbard, without any pain or loss of blood. Very many of them did I lose in this way. Nevertheless, I accommodated myself to these new troubles also. At times I sang, at times I prayed, and at times I wrote by means of the paste of brick dust, I have described above. At this time I began composing a capitolo in praise of my prison, relating in it all the accidents which had befallen me. 
This poem I meant to insert in its proper place. Note. Capitolo is the technical name for a copy of verses in terza rima on a chosen theme. Poems of this kind, mostly burlesque or satirical, were very popular in Cellini's age. They used to be written on trifling or obscene subjects in a mock heroic style. Barony stamped the character of high art upon the species, which had long been in use among the unlettered vulgar. End of the note. Chapter 120 The good Castellan used frequently to send messengers to find out secretly what I was doing. So it happened on the last day of July that I was rejoicing greatly by myself alone, while I bethought me of the festival they keep in Rome upon the 1st of August. And I was saying to myself, In former years I kept the feast among the pleasures and the frailties of the world. This year I shall keep it in communion with God. Oh, how far more happy am I thus than I was then! The persons who heard me speak these words reported them to the castellan. He was greatly annoyed and exclaimed, Ah, God, that fellow lives and triumphs in his infinite distress, while I lack all things in the midst of comfort, and am dying only on account of him. Go quickly and fling him into the deepest of the subterranean dungeons, where the preacher Foyano was starved to death. Perhaps when he finds himself in such ill plight, he will begin to droop his crest. Captain Sandrino Monaldi came at once into my prison, with about twenty of the castellan's servants. They found me on my knees, and I did not turn at their approach, but went on paying my orisons before a god, the Father, surrounded with angels, and a Christ, arising victorious from the grave, which I had sketched upon the wall, with a little piece of charcoal I had found covered up with earth. This was after I had lain four months upon my back in bed with my leg broken, and had so often dreamed that angels came and ministered to me, that at the end of those four months the limb became as sound as though it never had been fractured. So then these fellows entered, all in armor, as fearful of me as though I were a poison-breathing dragon. The captain spoke as follows. You must be aware that there are many of us here, and our entrance has made a tumult in this place, yet you do not turn round. When I heard these words, I was well able to conceive what greater harm might happen to me. But being used and hardened to misfortune, I said to them, And to this God who supports me, to him in heaven I have turned my soul, my contemplation, and all my vital spirits. To you I have turned precisely what belongs to you. What there is of good in me you are not worthy to behold, nor can you touch it. Do then to that which is under your control all the evil you are able. The captain in some alarm, and not knowing what I might be on the point of doing, said to four of his tallest fellows, Put all your arms aside. When they had done so, he added, Now upon the instant leap on him and secure him well. Do you think he is the devil, that so many of us should be afraid of him? Hold him tight now, that he may not escape you. Seized by them with force and roughly handled, and anticipating something far worse than what afterwards happened, I lifted my eyes to Christ and said, O oh, just God, thou paidest all our debts, upon that high-raised cross of thine. Wherefore, then, must my innocence be made to pay the depths of whom I do not even know? Nevertheless, thy will be done. Meanwhile the men were carrying me away with a great lighted torch, and I thought that they were about to throw me down the oblate of Samabo. This was the name given to a fearful place, which had swallowed many men alive, for when they are cast into it, they fall to the bottom of a deep pit in the foundation of the castle. This did not, however, happen to me. Wherefore I thought that I was made a very good bargain when they placed me in that hideous dungeon I have spoken of, where Fra Foyano died of hunger, 
and left me there without doing me further injury. When I was alone, I began to sing a De Profundis Clamave and Miserere, and In Te Domine Speravi. During the whole of that first day of August, I kept festival with God, my heart rejoicing ever in the strength of hope and faith. On the second day, they drew me from that hole, and took me back again to the prison where I had drawn those representations of God. On arriving there, the sight of them filled me with such sweetness and such gladness that I wept abundantly. On every day that followed, the castellan sent to know what I was doing and saying. The Pope, who had heard the whole history, and I must add that the doctors had already given the castellan over, spoke as follows. Before my castellan dies, I will let him put that Benvenuto to death in any way he likes, for he is the cause of his death, and so the good man shall not die unrevenged. On hearing these words from the mouth of Duke Pier Luigi, the castellan replied, So then, the Pope has given me Benvenuto, and wishes me to take my vengeance on him. Dismiss the matter from your mind, and leave me to act. If the heart of the Pope was ill-disposed against me, that of the castellan was now at the commencement savage and cruel and extreme. At this juncture, the invisible being who had diverted me from my intention of suicide came to me, being still invisible, but with a clear voice, and shook me and made me rise and said to me, Ah me, my Benvenuto, quick, quick, betake thyself to God with thy accustomed prayers, and cry out loudly, loudly. In a sudden consternation I fell upon my knees, and recited several of my prayers in a loud voice. After this I said, Qui habitat in adjutorio? Then I communed a space with God, and in an instant the same clear and open voice said to me, Go to rest, and have no further fear. The meaning of this was, that the castellan, after giving the most cruel orders for my death, suddenly countermanded them, and said, Is not this Benvenuto the man, whom I have so warmly defended, whom I know of a surety to be innocent, and who has been so greatly wronged? Oh, how will God have mercy on me and my sins, if I do not pardon those who have done me the greatest injuries? Oh, why should I injure a man, both worthy and innocent, who has only done me services and honour. Go to, instead of killing him, I give him life and liberty, and in my will I'll have it written, that none shall demand of him the heavy debt for his expenses here, which he would elsewise have to pay. This the Pope heard, and took it very ill indeed. Chapter 121 I meanwhile continued to pray as usual, and to write my capitolo, and every night I was visited with the gladdest and most pleasant dreams that could be possibly imagined. It seemed to me, while dreaming, that I was always in the visible company of that being, whose voice and touch, while he was still invisible, I had so often felt. To him I made but one request, and this I urged most earnestly, namely, that he would bring me where I could behold the sun. I told him that this was my sole desire I had, and that if I could but see the sun once only, I should die contented. All the disagreeable circumstances of my prison had become, as it were, to me friendly and companionable. Not one of them gave me annoyance. Nevertheless, I ought to say that the castellan's parasites, who were waiting for him to hang me from the battlement, whence I had made my escape, when they saw that he had changed his mind to the exact opposite of what he previously threatened, were unable to endure the disappointment. Accordingly, they kept continually trying to inspire me with the fear of imminent death by means of various terrifying hints. But as I have already said, I had become so well acquainted with troubles of this sort that I was incapable of fear and nothing any longer could disturb me. Only I had that one great longing, 
to behold the sphere of the sun, if only in a dream. Thus then, while I spent many hours a day in a prayer with deep emotion of the spirit toward Christ, I used always to say, Ah, oh, very Son of God, I praise thee by thy birth, by thy death upon the cross, and by thy glorious resurrection, that thou wilt deign to let me see the sun, if not otherwise, at least in dreams. But if thou wilt grant me to behold it with these mortal eyes of mine, I engage myself to come and visit thee at thy holy sepulchre. This vow, and these my greatest prayers to God, I made upon the 2nd of October, in the year 1539. Upon the following morning, which was the 3rd of October, I woke at daybreak, perhaps an hour before the rising of the sun. Dragging myself from the miserable lair in which I lay, I put some clothes on, for it had begun to be cold. Then I prayed more devoutly than ever I had done in the past, fervently imploring Christ that he would at least grant me the favor of knowing by divine inspiration what sin I was so sorely expiating. And since his divine majesty had not deemed me worthy of beholding the sun even in a dream, I besought him to let me know the cause of my punishment. End of chapters 117 through 121「Chapters 122 through 126 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simons. Chapters 122 through 126. Chapter 122. I had barely uttered these words when the invisible being, like a whirlwind, caught me up and bore me away into a large room, where he made himself visible to my eyes in human form, appearing like a young man whose beard is just growing, with a face of indescribable beauty, but austere, not wanton. He bade me look around the room and said, The crowd of men who ceased in this place are all those who up to this day have been born and afterwards have died upon the earth. Thereupon I asked him why he brought me hither, and he answered, Come with me, and thou shalt soon behold. In my hand I had a poniard, and upon my back a coat of mail, and so he led me through that vast hall pointing out the people, who were walking by innumerable thousands up and down, this way and that. He led me onward, and went forth in front of me, through a little low door, into a place, which looked like a narrow street, and when he drew me after him into the street, at the moment of leaving the hall, behold, I was disarmed and clothed in a white shirt, with nothing on my head, and I was walking on the right hand of my companion." Finding myself in this condition, I was seized with wonder, because I did not recognize the street, and when I lifted my eyes, I discerned that the splendor of the sun was striking on a wall, as it were a house-front, just above my head. Then I said, O oh my friend, what must I do, in order to be able to ascend so high, that I may gaze upon the sphere of the sun himself? He pointed out some huge stairs, which were on my right hand, and said to me, Go up thither by thyself. Quitting his side, I ascended the stairs backwards, and gradually began to come within the region of the sunlight. Then I hastened my steps and went on, always walking backwards, as I have described, until I discovered the whole sphere of the sun. The strength of his rays, as is their wont, first made me close my eyes, but becoming aware of my misdoing, I opened them wide, and gazing steadfastly at the sun, exclaimed, O oh, my son, for whom I have passionately yearned, 
Albeit your race may blind me, I do not wish to look on anything again but this. So I stayed a while, with my eyes fixed steadily on him, and after a brief space I beheld in one moment the whole might of those great burning rays fling themselves upon the left side of the sun, so that the orb remained quite clear without its rays, and I was able to contemplate it with vast delight. It seemed to me something marvellous that the rays should be removed in that manner. Then I reflected what a divine grace it was which God had granted me that morning, and cried aloud, O wonderful thy power, O glorious thy virtue, how far greater is the grace which thou art granting me than that which I expected. The sun without his rays appeared to me to be a bath of the purest molten gold, neither more nor less. While I stood contemplating this wondrous thing, I noticed that the middle of the sphere began to swell, and the swollen surface grew, and suddenly a Christ, upon the cross, formed itself out of the same substance as the sun. He bore the aspect of divine benignity, with such fair grace, that the mind of man could not conceive the thousandth part of it. And while I gazed in ecstasy, I shouted, A miracle, a miracle, O God, O clemency divine, O immeasurable goodness, what is it thou hast deigned this day to show me? While I was gazing and exclaiming thus, the Christ moved toward that part where his rays were settled, and the middle of the sun once more bulged out as it had done before. The boss expanded and suddenly transformed itself into the shape of a most beautiful Madonna, who appeared to be sitting enthroned on high, holding her child in her arms, with an attitude of the greatest charm and a smile upon her face. On each side of her was an angel, whose beauty far surpasses man's imagination. I also saw within the rondure of the sun, upon the right hand, a figure robed like a priest. This turned its back to me, and kept its face directed to the Madonna and the Christ. All these things I beheld, actual, clear, and vivid, and kept returning thanks to the glory of God, as loud as I was able. The marvellous apparition remained before me little more than half a quarter of an hour, then it dissolved, and I was carried back to my dark lair. I began at once to shout aloud, The virtue of God has deigned to show me all his glory, the which perchance no mortal eye has ever seen before. Therefore I know surely that I am free and fortunate, and in the grace of God. But you miscreants shall be miscreants still, accursed, and in the wrath of God. Mark this, for I am certain of it, that on the day of all saints, the day upon which I was born in 1500, on the 1st of November, at four hours after nightfall, on that day which is coming you will be forced to lead me from this gloomy dungeon. Less than this you will not be able to do, because I have seen it with these eyes of mine, and in that throne of God. The priest who kept his face turned to God and his back to me, that priest was St. Peter, pleading my cause, for the shame he felt that such full wrongs should be done to Christians in his own house. You may go and tell it to whom you like, for none on earth has the power to do me harm henceforward and tell that Lord who keeps me here, that if he will give me wax or paper, and the means of portraying this glory of God, which was revealed to me, most assuredly shall I convince him of that, which now perhaps he holds in doubt. Chapter 123 The physicians gave the castellan no hope of his recovery, yet he remained with the clear intellect, and the humours which used to afflict him every year had passed away. He devoted himself entirely to the care of his soul, and his conscience seemed to smite him, because he felt that I had suffered and was suffering a grievous wrong. The Pope received information from him of the extraordinary things which I related, in answer to which His Holiness sent word, as one who had no faith either in God or aught beside, that I was mad, 
and that he must do his best to mend his health. When the castellan received this message, he sent to cheer me up, and furnished me with writing materials and wax, and certain little wooden instruments employed in working wax, adding many words of courtesy, which were reported by one of his servants, who bore me good will. This man was totally the opposite of that rascally gang who had wished to see me hanged. I took the paper and the wax, and began to work, and while I was working I wrote the following sonnet, addressed to the castellan. If I, my lord, could show to you the truth of the eternal light to me by heaven, in this low life revealed you sure had given more heed to mine than to a monarch's sooth. Ah, could the pastor of Christ's flock in Ruth believe how God the soul with sight has shriven, of glory unto which no white hath striven, ere he escaped earth's cave of care and cause. The gates of justice holy and austere would roll asunder and rude impious rage, fall chained with shrieks that should assail the skies. Had I but light, ah me, my art should rear a monument of heaven's high equipage, nor should my misery bear so grim a guise. Chapter 124 On the following day, when the servant of the castellan, who was my friend, brought me my food, I gave him this sonnet, copied out in writing. Without informing the other ill-disposed servants, who were my enemies, he handed it to the castellan. At that time this worthy man would gladly have granted me my liberty, because he fancied that the great wrong done to me was a main cause of his death. He took the sonnet, and having read it more than once, exclaimed, These are neither the words nor the thoughts of a madman, but rather of a sound and worthy fellow. Without delay he ordered his secretary to take it to the Pope, and place it in his own hands, adding a request for my deliverance. While the secretary was on his way with my sonnet to the Pope, the castellan sent me lights for day and night, together with all the conveniences one could wish for in that place. The result of this was that I began to recover from my physical depression, which had reached a very serious degree. The Pope read the sonnet several times. Then he sent word to the castellan that he meant presently to do what would be pleasing to him. Certainly the Pope had no unwillingness to release me then. But Signor Pier Luigi, his son, as it were in the Pope's despite, kept me there by force. The death of the castellan was drawing near, and while I was engaged in drawing and modelling that miracle which I had seen, upon the morning of All Saints' Day he sent his nephew, Piero Ogolini, to show me certain jewels. No sooner had I set eyes on them that I exclaimed, This is the countersign of my deliverance. Then the young man, who was not a person of much intelligence, began to say, Never think of that, Benvenuto. I replied, Take your gems away, for I am so treated here that I have no light to see by, except what this murky cavern gives, and that is not enough to test the quality of precious stones. But as regards my deliverance from this dungeon, the day will not end before you come to fetch me out. It shall and must be so, and you will not be able to prevent it. The man departed and had me locked in, but after he had remained away two hours by the clock, he returned without armed men, bringing only a couple of lads to assist my movements. So after this fashion he conducted me to the spacious rooms which I had previously occupied, that is to say, in 1538, where I obtained all the conveniences I asked for. Chapter 125 After the lapse of the few days, the castellan, who now believed that I was at large and free, succumbed to his disease and departed this life. In his room remained his brother, Messer Antonio Ugolini, who had informed the deceased governor that I was duly released. From what I learned, this Messer Antonio received commission from the Pope to let me occupy that commodious prison 
until he had decided what to do with me. Messer Durante of Brescia, whom I have previously mentioned, engaged the soldier, formerly druggist of Prato, to administer some deadly liquor in my food. The poison was to work slowly, producing its effect at the end of four or five months. They resolved on mixing pounded diamond with my victuals. Now the diamond is not a poison in any true sense of the word, but its incomparable hardness enables it, unlike ordinary stones, to retain very acute angles. When every other stone is pounded, that extreme sharpness of edge is lost, their fragments becoming blunt and rounded. The diamond alone preserves its trenchant qualities, wherefore, if it chances to enter the stomach together with food, the peristaltic motion, needful to digestion, brings it into contact with the coats of the stomach and the bowels, where it sticks, and by the action of fresh food forcing it farther inwards, after some time perforates the organs. This eventually causes death. Any other sort of stone or glass, mingled with the food, has not the power to attach itself, but passes onward with the victuals. Now Messer Durante entrusted a diamond of trifling value to one of the guards, and it is said that a certain Leone, a goldsmith of Arezzo, my great enemy, was commissioned to pound it. The man happened to be very poor, and the diamond was worth perhaps some scores of crowns. He told the guard that the dust he gave him back was the diamond in question, properly ground down. The morning when I took it, they mixed it with all I had to eat. It was a Friday, and I had it in salad, sauce, and pottage. That morning I ate heartily, for I had fasted on the previous evening, and this day was a festival. It is true that I felt the victuals scrunch beneath my teeth, but I was not thinking about knaveries of this sort. When I had finished, some scraps of salad remained upon my plate, and certain very fine and glittering splinters caught my eyes among those remnants. I collected them, and took them to the window, which let a flood of light into the room, and while I was examining them, I remembered that the food I ate that morning had scrunched more than usual. On applying my senses strictly to the matter, the verdict of my eyesight was that there were certainly fragments of pounded diamond, Upon this I gave myself up without doubt as dead, and in my sorrow had recourse with pious heart to holy prayers. I had resolved the question, and thought that I was doomed. For the space of the whole hour I prayed fervently to God, returning thanks to Him for so merciful a death. Since my stars had sentenced me to die, I thought it not bad bargain to escape from life so easily. I was resigned, and blessed the world and all the years which I had passed in it. Now I was returning to a better kingdom, with the grace of God, the which I thought I had most certainly acquired. While I stood resolving these thoughts in my mind, I held in my hand some flimsy particles of the reputed diamond, which of a truth I firmly believed to be such. Now hope! is immortal in the human breast. Therefore I felt myself, as it were, lured onward by a gleam of idle expectation. Accordingly I took up a little knife and a few of those particles, and placed them on an iron bar of my prison. Then I brought the knife's point with a slow strong grinding pressure to bear upon the stone, and felt it crumble. Examining the substance with my eyes, I saw that it was so. In a moment new hope took possession of my soul, and I exclaimed, Here I do not find my true foe, Messer Durante, but a piece of bad, soft stone, which cannot do me any harm whatever. Previously I had been resolved to remain quiet and to die in peace. Now I revolved other plans but first I rendered thanks to God, and blessed poverty. For though poverty is oftentimes the cause of bringing men to death, 
on this occasion it had been the very cause of my salvation. I mean in this way. Mr. Durante, my enemy, or whoever it was, gave a diamond to Leone to pound for me of the worth of more than a hundred crowns. Poverty induced him to keep this for himself, and to pound for me a greenish burial of the value of two carlins, thinking perhaps, because it was also a stone, that it would work the same effect as the diamond. CHAPTER 126 At this time the Bishop of Pavia, brother of the Count of San Secondo, and commonly called Monsignor de Rossi of Parma, happened to be imprisoned in the castle for some troublesome affairs at Pavia. Knowing him to be my friend, I thrust my head out of the hole in my cell, and called him with a loud voice, crying that those thieves had given me a pounded diamond with the intention of killing me. I also sent some of the splinters which I had preserved by the hand of one of his servants for him to see. I did not disclose my discovery that the stone was not a diamond, but told him that they had most assuredly poisoned me after the death of that most worthy man, the Castellan. During the short space of time I had to live, I begged him to allow me one loaf a day from his own stores, seeing that I had resolved to eat nothing which came from them. To this request he answered that he would supply me with victuals. Messer Antonio, who was certainly not cognizant of the plot against my life, stirred up a great noise, and demanded to see the pounded stone, being also persuaded that it was a diamond. But on reflection that the Pope was probably at the bottom of the affair, he passed it over lightly, after giving his attention to the incident. Henceforth I ate the victuals sent me by the bishop, and continued writing my capitolo on the prison, into which I inserted daily all the new events which happened to me, point by point. But Messer Antonio also sent me food, and he did this by the hand of that Giovanni of Prato, the drugist, then soldier in the castle, whom I have previously mentioned. He was a deadly foe of mine, and was the man who had administered the powdered diamond. So I told him that I would partake of nothing he brought me, unless he tasted it before my eyes. The man replied that popes have their meat tasted. I answered, Noblemen are bound to taste the meat for popes. In like measure you, soldier, druggist, peasant from Prato, are bound to taste the meat for a Florentine of my station. He retorted with coarse words, which I was not slow to pay back in kind. Now Messer Antonio felt a certain shame for his behavior. He had it also in his mind to make me pay the costs which the late Castellan, poor man, remitted in my favor. So he hunted out another of his servants, who was my friend, and sent me food by this man's hands. The meat was tasted for me now with good grace, and no need for altercation. The servant in question told me, that the Pope was being festered every day by Monsignor de Morluc, who kept asking for my extradition on the part of the French king. The Pope, however, showed little disposition to give me up, and Cardinal Farnese, formerly my friend and patron, had declared that I ought not to reckon on ensuing from that prison for some length of time. I replied that I should get out in spite of them all, the excellent young fellow besought me to keep quiet, and not to let such words of mine be heard, for they might do me some grave injury. Having firm confidence in God, it was my duty to await, his mercy remaining in the meanwhile tranquil. I answered that the power and goodness of God are not bound to stand in awe before the malign forces of iniquity. End of chapters 122 through 126
Chapter One Hundred Twenty Seven of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume One, translated by John Eddington Simons, Chapter One Hundred Twenty Seven. A few days had passed when the Cardinal of Ferrara arrived in Rome. He went to pay his respects to the Pope, and the Pope detained him up to supper time. Now the Pope was a man of great talent for affairs, and he wanted to talk at his ease with the Cardinal about French politics. Everybody knows that folk, when they are feasting together, say things which they would otherwise retain. This therefore happened. The great King Francis was most frank and liberal in all his dealings, and the Cardinal was well acquainted with his temper. Therefore the latter could indulge the Pope beyond his boldest expectations. This raised His Holiness to a high pitch of merriment and gladness, all the more because he was accustomed to drink freely once a week, and went indeed to vomit after his indulgence. When therefore the Cardinal observed that the Pope was well disposed and ripe to grant favours, he begged for me at the King's demand, pressing the matter hotly, and proving that His Majesty had it much at heart. Upon this the Pope laughed aloud. He felt the moment for his vomit at hand. The excessive quantity of wine which he had drunk was also operating, so he said, on the spot, this instant, you shall take him to your house. Then, having given express orders to this purpose, he rose from the table. The cardinal immediately sent for me, before Signor Pierluigi could get wind of the affair, for it was certain that he would not have allowed me to be loosed from prison. The Pope's mandatory came together with two great gentlemen of the cardinals, and when four o'clock of the night was passed, they removed me from my prison, and brought me into the presence of the cardinal, who received me with indescribable kindness. I was well lodged, and left to enjoy the comforts of my situation. Messer Antonio, the old castellan's brother, and his successor in the office, insisted on extracting from me the costs for food and other fees and perquisities claimed by sheriffs and such fry paying no heed to his predecessor's will in my behalf. This affair cost me several scores of crowns, but I paid them, because the cardinal told me to be well upon my guard if I wanted to preserve my life, adding that had he not extracted me that evening from the prison, I should never have got out. Indeed, he had already been informed that the Pope greatly regretted having let me go. This Capitolo I write to Luca Martin, addressing him in it as will appear. Whoso would know the power of God's dominion, and how a man resembles that high good, must lie in prison, in my firm opinion. On grievous thoughts and cares of home must brood, oppressed with carking pains in flesh and bone, far from his native land, full many a road. If you would fain by worthy deeds be known, Seek to be prisoned without cause, lie long, And find no friend to listen to your moan. See that men rob you of your all by wrong, And perils to your life be used with force, Hopeless of help by brutal foes and strong. Be driven at length to some mad, desperate course, Burst from your dungeon, leap the castle wall, Recaptured, find the prison ten times worse. Now listen, Luca, to the best of all. Your leg's been broken, you've been bought and sold, your dungeon's dripping, you've no cloak or shawl. Never one friendly word, your victuals cold, are brought with sorry news by some base groom, of Prato soldier, now druggist of old. Mark well how glory steeps her sons in gloom. You have no seat to sit on, save the stool, yet were you active from your mother's womb, the knave who serves has orders strict and cool, 
To list no word you utter, give you no. Scarcely to ope the door, such is their rule. These toys has glory for her nursling wrought. No paper, pens, ink, fire, or tools of steel, To exercise the quick brain steaming thought. A luck that I so little can reveal, Fancy one hundred for each separate ill, Full space and place I've left for prison wheel. But now my firmer purpose to fulfil, And sing the dungeon's praise with honour due, For this angelic tongues were scant of skill. Here never languish honest men and true, Except by placement's fraud, misgovernment, Jealousies, anger, or some spiteful crew. To tell the truth, whereon my mind is bent, Here man knows God, nor ever stints to pray, Feeling his soul with hell's fierce anguish rent. Let one be famed as bad as mortal may, Send him in jail to sorry years to pine, He'll come forth holy, wise, beloved away. Here soul, flesh, closes their substance gross refine, Each bulky load grows light like grossamere, Celestial thrones before purge eyeballs shine. I'll tell thee a great marvel, friend, give ear. The fancy took me on one day to write, Learn now what shifts one may be put to hear. My cell I search, prick brows and hair upright, Then turn me toward a cranny in the door, And with my teeth a splinter disunite. Next find I piece of brick upon the floor, Crumble apart thereof to powder small, And from a paste by strangling water o'er. Then, then came poesy, sphery call, Into my carcass by the way me thought, Whence bread goes forth, there was none else at all. Now to return unto my primal thought, Who wills to know what weal awaits him must, First learn the ill that God for him has wrought. The jail contains all arts in act and thrust. Should you but hanker after surgeon's skill, T'will draw the spoiled blood from your veins a dust. Next there is something in itself that will Make you right eloquent, a bold brave spark, Big with high soaring thought for good and ill. Blessed is the man who lies in dungeon dark, Languishing many a month, then takes his flight, Of war, truth, peace he knows and tells the mark. Needs be that all things turned his delight, The jail has crammed his brains so full of wit, They'll dance no more is to upset the white. Perchance thought urge, Sing how thy life did flit, Nor is it true the jail can teach thee lore, To fill thy breast and heart with strength of it. Nay, for myself I'll ever praise it more, Yet would I like one law past, That the man whose acts deserve It should not scape this score. Whoso hath gotten the poor folk in ban, I'd make him learn those lessons of the jail, For then he'd know all a good ruler can. He'd act like men who weighed by reason's scale, Nor dare to swerve from truth and right aside, Nor would confusion in the realm prevail. While I was bound in prison to abide, Poison of priests, friars, soldiers I could see, But those who best deserved it least I spied. Ah, could you know what rage came o'er me, When for such rogues the jail relaxed her hold? This makes one weep that one was born to be. I'll add no more, now I am become fine gold, Such gold as none flings lightly to the wind, Fit for the best work I shall ever behold. Another point has passed into my mind, Which I have not told thee, Luca, where I wrote, Was in the book of one our kith and kind. There down the margins I was wont to note, Each torment grims that crushed me like a vice, The paste my hurrying thoughts could hardly float. To make an O, I dipped the splinter thrice In that sick mud, worse woe could scarcely grind, Spirits in hell debarred from paradise. Seeing I'm not the first by fraud confined, This I'll omit, and once more seek the cell, Wherein I rack for rage both heart and mind. I praise it more than other tongues will tell, 
and for advice to such as do not know, swear that without it none can labor well. Yet, oh, for one like him I learn but now, who'd cry to me as by Bethesda's shore, Take thy clothes, Benvenuto, rise, and go. Credo I sing, salve regina's poor, and pater nosters, alms I then bestow. Morn after morn on blink folk, lame and poor. Ah me, how many a time my cheek must grow, blanched by those lilies. Shall I then forswear, Florence and France, through them for evermore? If to the hospital I come, and fair, find the annunciata limbed, I'll fly, else shall I show myself a brute beast there. These words flout not her worshipped sanctity, nor those her lilies glorious, holy, pure, the which illumine earth and heaven high. But for I find at every coin obscure, base lilies which spread hooks where flowers should blow, needs must I fear, lest these to rhine lore. To think how many walk like me in woe, born what, how slave to serve that hateful sign, souls lively, graceful, like to God's beloved. I saw that lethal heraldry decline, from heaven like lightning among people wane, then on the stone I saw strange lustre shine. The castle's bell must break ere I was strain, thence issued, and these things, who speaketh true, in heaven on earth, to me made wondrous plain. Next I beheld a bier of sombre hue, adorned with broken lilies, crosses tears, and on their beds a lost woe-stricken crew. I saw the death, who racks our souls with fears, this man and that she menaced, while she cried, I clip the folk who harm thee with these shears. That worthy one, then on my brow wrote wide, with Peter's pen, words, which, for he bade shun, to speak them thrice, within my breast I hide. Him I beheld who drives and checks the sun, clad with its splendors mid his court on high, seld seen by mortal eyes, if ever by one. Then did a solitary sparrow cry, loud from the keep, hearing which note I said, he tells that I shall live, and you must die. I sang and wrote my hard case head by head, asking from God pardon and aid in need, for now I felt mine eyes outworn and dead. Never lion, tiger, wolf, or bear knew greed, hungrier than that man felt for human blood, nor viper with more venomous fang did feed. The cruel chief was he of robber's brood, Worst of the worst among a gang of knaves. Hiss, I'll speak soft, lest I be understood. Say, have ye seen catchpoles, the famished slaves, In act a poor man's homestead to distrain, Smashing down Christ's Madonnas with their staves? So on the first of August did that train Dislodge me to a tomb more foul, more cold. November damns and dooms each rogue to pain. I at mine ears a trumpet had which told, Truth, and each word to them I did repeat, Reckless, if by grief's load from me were rolled. They, when they saw their final hope retreat, Gave me a diamond pounded, no fair ring, Deeming that I must die if I should eat. That villain churl whose office it was to bring, My food, I bade thirst first, But meanwhile thought, not here I find my foe durant a sting. Yet erst my mind unto high God I brought, beseeching him to pardon all my sin, and spoke a miserere sorrow fraught. Then when I gained some respite from that din of troubles, and had given my soul to God, contended better realms and stayed to win, I saw along the path which saints have trod, from heaven descending, glad with glorious palm, an angel, clear he cried, upon earth sod, live longer thou, through him who heard thy psalm, those foes shall perish, each and all in strife, while thou remainest happy, free and calm, 
blessed by our sire in heaven on earth for life. End of chapter 102